nationwide audience. In addition, C-SPAN 2 is underwritten in part by the following. Imagine a world where crops and the environment get equal protection. DuPont, we make the things that make a difference and are proud to support television that makes a difference. Up next, join us for coverage of a hearing, which is part of a series of investigations held by the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing. Congressman Tom Lantos of California chairs the panel, which hears testimony on alleged abuses in administrating federal housing contracts at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will please come to order. As we continue our series of hearings on the scandals at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, our focus today will be on how need and merit gave way to political connections, influence peddling, cronyism, and blatant favoritism in HUD's administration of the moderate rehabilitation program. Our witnesses today will be Mr. William Taylor, a Jacksonville, Florida consultant, and Ms. Linda Murphy, the Washington, D.C. attorney. Mr. Taylor, a politically well-connected individual from Florida, was paid $130,000 in consulting fees, plus a 10% equity interest in one project for his work in connection with four moderate rehabilitation projects in Florida, Georgia, and Texas. A Florida developer who paid Mr. Taylor $35,000 to get an extension of time to finish construction on 109 units at a homeless shelter and for help on an administrative matter told subcommittee investigators, quote, he thought Taylor's fees were outrageous and, quote, Taylor is holding us up, end quote. But he didn't know how else to do it. He believed that he needed a political lubricant to grease the wheels, and with Mr. Taylor's assistance, the extension was granted. The administrative matter was resolved, and the project was funded. We intend to examine what services Mr. Taylor performed to earn these fees and whom he contacted at HUD. Ms. Murphy, a former attorney advisor at HUD and a close friend of Deborah Dean, also appears to have prospered as a result of connections at HUD. A California developer recently told subcommittee staff that while working on a project in the San Francisco area, he was told that if he wanted mud rehab units, the person to contact was Linda Murphy. The developer subsequently met with Ms. Murphy in her law office here in Washington, D.C. At that meeting, Ms. Murphy said that she could help him get the units for a fee of $1,200 per unit. The developer asked if it was legal. Ms. Murphy replied that it was and showed him a legal memo from HUD to that effect. It literally boggles the mind that during the prior administration of HUD, through its legal department, it gave official approval to this type of fee for units consulting arrangements. This is the fourth questionable HUD legal opinion that we have come upon. First, there was HUD General Counsel John Knapp's oral opinion that when Congress did away with the distribution pattern based on population, also known as the fair share requirement, the objective criteria for evaluating mud rehab applications were eliminated. Then there was the HUD legal opinion given to Assistant Secretary Barksdale that under the coinsurance program, he could not prevent a company called DRG from closing on the Colonial House Project, a $47 million project described by one HUD official at the time 
as active insanity. One would think that if active insanity is about to be perpetrated, there is some mechanism from stopping this from happening. This was followed by the HUD legal opinion that mod rehab funds can be considered as private capital for purposes of an urban development action grant application. How HUD funds, public funds, can be considered as private capital defies logic. It seems that if you want a well-reasoned, logical, easily understandable legal opinion, you go to Judge Wapner. If you want an off-the-wall legal opinion that defies logic and common sense, that is full of gobbledygook, you go to HUD. In its legal opinion, the HUD General Counsel's office reasons that since consultant fees are not recognizable costs, and since HUD does not regulate the amount of or term of contracts between a prospective Section 8 property owner and his consultant, the owner is free to enter into any agreement that he desires with his consultant. That makes no sense. When HUD Secretary Jack Kemp testified before our subcommittee earlier this month, he agreed with me that dollars are interchangeable. The only reason the developer pays a fee to the so-called consultant is that without the consultant, he couldn't get the project off the ground. In other words, the dollars being paid by developers to consultants ultimately come from the taxpayer. This avalanche of bizarre legal opinions has prompted our decision to recall Mr. Knapp, former general counsel, to testify at our hearing on Monday, July 31. Our next hearing will take place on Friday, July 28, when witnesses appearing before the subcommittee will be Mr. Lance Wilson, former executive assistant to HUD Secretary Pierce, and Joseph Monticello, former administrator of HUD's New York Regional Office. The chair would also like to indicate that on August 2nd, the subcommittee begins a new set of hearings on another subject. This subcommittee has jurisdiction in the field of oversight, not only with respect to HUD, but also with respect to the Department of Labor. Some 76 million American workers are covered by $1.6 trillion in private pension funds, which are regulated by federal law. Lax reviews of private plan accounting and reporting on the fiscal security of these funds by the U.S. Department of Labor's Pension and Welfare Benefits Administration will be the subject of our hearing on August the 2nd. Over the last 15 years, the federal government has applied standards for private pension plans to ensure their sound administration, to protect against corporate misuse of funds and fraud, and to protect pensioners by ensuring against private fund losses. These standards are all included in the Employment, Retirement, and Income Security Act of 1974, commonly known as ERISA. Most employees expect their company pensions to keep a promise. The promise is an income during retirement based on employee and or corporate contributions to a pension plan and good faith management of funds earmarked for pensions. According to the Department of Labor's Inspector General, pension funds may be in jeopardy because of poor oversight of the system. Our hearing will focus on the scope of the problem of private pension plan audits and reports, and particularly the capability of the Department of Labor to effectively oversee ERISA. This morning, we will have uh, two witnesses, uh, and before I call on them, I'd like to uh, call on uh, my distinguished colleagues, Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Chairman Lantos. The Chairman has covered in great detail, I think, very effectively, the problem with personnel defects and certainly with the structure within the program. And in trying to understand why developers felt a need for consultants regarding this program, we've heard consultants and developers give us different reasons. However, there's a basic difference between a consultant who offers real service 
on the basis of sound expertise in housing and knowledge of HUD programs, and someone who's merely selling political um, expertise or political access. I think that's the key word. Problems with this HUD program, no means exception. In a July article, Reader's Digest, I would like to quote from that, Mr. Chairman, said, during the early decades, the federal housing program was comparatively well run. But then in 68 came the Housing Urban Development Act, which established a goal of 26 million new and rehabilitated housing units in just 10 years. Now, I would like to associate myself with that goal. I think it's important we have a well-run HUD. There's no doubt that we have a shortage of housing for low and medium income uh, individuals. Our problem has been threefold. Poor personnel selection of inexperience and lack of maturity, or in years, or at least uh, in terms of knowledge of the housing program and housing needs. The structure of the program will remove governor items like fair share, which worked. And when did we have a fair share, it then became first come, first serve. And thirdly, an aggressive IG program. What the articles now coming out of the press plainly point up is that we've had lots of warning. And I know we've had some discussion, uh, not too heated, but I maintain that there have really has been a couple of decades of neglect and decay, not particularly in management as such, at the high level, but maybe management at regional levels or even state levels, but particularly a lack of attention to detail and follow through. The vehicles at one time were legally established by rules and regulations within HUD have now been done away with, and it's run rampant. To end the statement, I'd like to quote one of our own people, according to Joe Newman, who was uh, was top investigator for House Committee on Government Ops. The interest on the money tied up in these bad mortgages now cost the government at least a quarter of a million dollars a day. Total is that we have $3.3 billion worth of projects on almost 3,000 projects from coast to coast, and they have simply not been managed. And when you have a lack of real oversight, and lack of attention to IG detail, and IG pointing, you're going to have scandal. And we're now inheriting, unfortunately, I think the peak of that in these hearings today. So I'm pleased to be associated with hearings and hope that we can dig into the whole spectrum with the idea that out of this committee, and I know the chairman's already introduced one magnificent bill with which I'm a co-sponsor, we can have legislation will correct or force the corrections on these programs. And with Jack Kemp at the leadership of the uh, HUD, I don't have any doubt that it will be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by expressing my general agreement with the sentiments expressed by the ranking minority member. I think that he outlines exactly what our task is, which is to improve the administration of these programs so we can better serve the purposes. I agree with him that we have gotten a lot of very encouraging signs from Secretary Kemp, and I've said that on several occasions. Unfortunately, I have now been forced to conclude, most recently by reading a letter which the Inspector General shared with us in the Justice Department, that elsewhere in the Bush administration we are not getting the same kind of serious commitment to cleaning this mess up that we're getting from Secretary Kemp. In the first place, we have people who, in my judgment, have been shown by these hearings to have misbehaved in a serious way, still being the recipients of important appointments. Mr. Fred Bush, whose testimony, I believe, betrayed a highly casual approach to ethics and who testified in ways that I doubt were found credible by a statistically significant percentage of the people who heard him. Uh, his nomination as ambassador to Luxembourg is still pending. The president apparently still thinks that we should send Fred Bush to Luxembourg. I hope the Senate will have other ideas. Hunter Cushing, who pled self-incrimination tried to cover it up with a wholly phony suggestion that he didn't have enough time when in fact he has been treated far more generously with regard to time than any other witness, I believe, before this subcommittee. The subcommittee staff at the direction of the chairman has leaned over backwards to deal with him. Uh, he has voluntarily absented himself temporarily from an important position at the Commerce Department. We've gotten no sign from the president that he thinks it's inappropriate that a man who can't discuss his previous activities as a loan administrator unless he incriminate himself should continue in this administration is a loan administrator. And now most disturbingly, we have an indication, the second one, that the Justice Department intends to ignore the possibility of criminal action. In the first place, I understand that the chairman of this subcommittee, who I believe has done a superb job 
in running this investigation in a fair and impartial manner, sought to meet with the Justice Department and was rejected. Now we have a copy of a letter which Mr. Adams, to his credit, shared with us late last week in which they announced that they are not going to prosecute Mr. Demery, and that's not a decision with which I quarrel. I have no specific information one way or the other. But they go on to say, and this is what bothers me, to Mr. Adams, should you come to obtain information not contained in your report implicating any HUD official in possible criminal violations, we would be happy to review that information. What we're getting here is a passivity on the part of the Justice Department. This is hardly the kind of prosecutorial determination I would expect. It's signed by the Chief of the Public Integrity Section. What he says is, oh, if any of you catch a crook, you come in here, and uh, then we will prosecute. It is the minimalist approach to law enforcement. You people go out and do something. So they declined to meet with the chairman of the subcommittee. My impression, my understanding from the staff is that the Justice Department has not asked to look at any of our material, has not asked for the help which this first-rate staff could have given them. They say to the Inspector General, hey, if anything turns up, you call me. Uh, th this is Hazard County law enforcement that we're getting. Yes? Uh, I would like to associate myself very strongly on the side of the gentleman with his comment, particularly regarding the discourteous, and I think the stupidity shot in not meeting with the chairman of this committee. I consider myself an active member of this committee and a supporter of what we're doing. And, if, and I'm sure what the gentleman is saying is absolutely correct. If it is correct as stated, I'll be happy to, uh, I know well, that. Well, I, I appreciate that. Because I remember the minority feels the same way, we feel outraged. I, at the I think, you, obviously, we have some disagreements. On the core of this, we have been in agreement on what should happen. And my understanding is that the chairman, and it seemed to me, frankly, appropriate for someone other than him to bring it up, and I didn't talk to him about this beforehand, because I did not want to, to deal with that. He made a good faith offer to meet with the Attorney General and was told that he, nobody in the Justice Department was going to talk to him uh, or avail themselves of the staff. Now, that's outrageous, particularly when we are dealing with a chairman who has shown himself, along, I think, with the rest of us, to have been uh, wholly responsible. He's probably a little more responsible than some of the rest of us, but he's the one who asked. That's okay. Beyond that, we have HUD saying, with all that they've heard, they don't even find an investigative lead. Understand what this letter says. Hey, Mr. Adams, if you find any crooks, give me a call. We have had members of the previous administration contradict each other under oath. So we've got conflicts in sworn testimony, an indication that there is perjury by somebody. We have had two high officials of the previous administration, one of whom has received a new appointment in this administration, plead self-incrimination as a reason for not testifying about their official activities. Again, one would think that was a hint that there might be illegal activities. Finally, it seems to me we have gotten very clear evidence that laws were broken. My understanding is that there are statutes against rigging bids. Now, the law says that if you are a local housing authority and you get these moderate rehabilitation units, you are supposed to put them out for an open competitive process, not necessarily by price, but there is supposed to be some kind of open process. Witness after witness has come in here, and it has been very clear that the fix was in. That a bidding process that was supposed to be open was, in fact, with a preordained result. Now, that seems very much to me like a conspiracy to rid bigs. And I don't mean to say that the local authorities ought to be prosecuted because they were the victims. But we've seen this in other cases of public corruption where zealous prosecutors, even interested prosecutors, go to the victim and say, cooperate with us, tell us who did this to you, and we will prosecute them. It seems to me that local housing authorities in many parts of this country were the victims of a form of extortion. Now, we've got this on the record. They were told, if you will promise to give me the units, I'll get you the units. On the face of it, that seems to me to have some elements of violation of federal law. So when the Justice Department ignores conflicts in sworn testimony, ignores the plea of self-incrimination as a reason not to testify in a valid legislative inquiry, ignores obvious evidence admission that bids were rigged, and refuses to meet with the chairman of this subcommittee when he offers to meet with them, and refuses to take advantage of this staff and the information it's got, then we have a Justice Department that is failing miserably to do its job. There is a degree of politicization that seems to me apparent here that I very much regret. And I want to contrast that to Secretary Kemp. Secretary Kemp seems to me to be acting in a vigorous and reasonable way. The tragedy is that the Justice Department is not. 
And it is not enough when people do bad things that the penalty be that they be told not to do bad things anymore. There has got to be a system of disincentives. For the Justice Department to send this kind of letter, call me if you find anything wrong. They don't plan to investigate as nearly as we can tell. They are refusing to do any investigation. They stiff the Inspector General. I think Attorney General Thornburg has to explain why the department over which he now presides is so passive and so silent and so apparently unwilling to investigate what seems to me to have been serious corruption. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As usual, I wasn't prepared to make an opening statement, but in view of Mr. Frank's comments, I'm, I'm going to do so. I think it's an extremely unfair charge that Mr. Frank uh, levels at the Department of Justice today. Uh, I at least knew nothing of the Chairman's request uh, to meet with the Attorney General or officials of the Department of Justice. And uh, it's a little bit difficult for us to evaluate whether or not it is an, uh, an improper denial of a request if we don't know anything about it. Now, perhaps members uh, uh, of, of the Chairman's party know all about this, but at least it's very difficult for me to be able to evaluate uh, why the Attorney General would not want to meet. Obviously, the Department of Justice and the FBI don't disclose pending investigations, and uh, therefore the fact that we may not know that there's an investigation pending doesn't necessarily mean it's not happening. There's one area in which I think um, this committee may be perhaps accused of a little passivity. We were, we were advised some time ago that the FBI and the Department of Justice are both looking into a situation in Camden, New Jersey, but the committee doesn't want to look into that apparently. So here's a situation where we're advised uh, and the Secretary Kemp confirmed his understanding that not only his Inspector General, but also the Attorney General uh, or the Department of Justice and the FBI were looking into the Camden, New Jersey situation. I'm not sure we can accuse the uh, Department of Justice of passivity in that particular case. And finally, with respect to the, the conspiracy to rig bids uh, allegation, I can recall specifically asking the Inspector General whether as a result of the way that the fair share program or, or the, the fact that fair share had been uh, um, uh, put on the shelf and, and these programs were now uh, being uh, uh, handed out in another manner, uh, whether the way that those programs were approved uh, violated any law or regulation. The Inspector General said in his view they did not. Now, I don't know whether they do or not. If Mr. Frank thinks that it's extortion uh, or the conspiracy to rig bids uh, is somehow a violation of law, then um, uh, perhaps he'd ought to take that to the Department of Justice and let those lawyers evaluate it. But I'm not prepared to say, what, since the Inspector General has said there's not a violation of law, that the Department of Justice is somehow lax or passive in not prosecuting somebody. So I think before we accuse people of violating the law, we'd better know whereof we speak, and before we accuse the Department of Justice of passivity, we'd better know all of the facts. I'd be happy to yield. First, I want to make it clear that uh, I was not, the Chairman was not unfairly telling some people and not others. The reason I know about the discussion between the Chairman and the Attorney General is that I asked them, uh, and I asked the staff. I wondered where the Justice Department has been, so I want to make it clear. It was not that the Chairman voluntarily chose to share material with some but not others. Last week, it seemed to me that the Justice Department was conspicuously absent, so I asked the Staff Director and uh, was informed of this. I would also add that the Inspector General has uh, no control over potential perjury. We have had clear conflicts in sworn testimony, so it's not simply up to the Inspector General. And finally, I would say, yeah, the gentleman says that I, I acted as if somehow a conspiracy to, to uh, uh, do bidding in, 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 a, in a fake fashion was a violation of federal law. I'm sure it is. I do not believe that you can, when the federal law says federal money is supposed to be given out subject to a bidding process, fix the bids in advance and not violate the federal law. And that's what I think ought to be looked into. The Justice, the, the, I would say that the uh, IG's report, you remember, did not go into that in as great detail as these hearings. These hearings have clearly brought out information that uh, the Inspector General didn't have. And uh, the Justice Department is acting like it doesn't have it either. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, we specifically, I specifically asked the Inspector General if there was a violation of law or regulation, because it didn't look right, it wasn't right, it was something that everybody on this committee uh, thought should not be the case. But he advised us that he saw no violation of law. So all I'm saying is that I think it's a little bit um, beyond uh, uh, propriety for us to be accusing the Department of Justice of failing to prosecute somebody for something they ought to be prosecuted for when the Inspector General, General said Yield. there's no violation of General law. General I didn't say, I was not criticizing them for failing to prosecute. I am criticizing them for failing to investigate. The letter they sent and everything else 
says great passivity. I don't know whether they should prosecute or not, but when you've got sworn testimony in conflict, when you have this business with the bids, uh, then it's something to investigate. My criticism is that they don't appear to be even investigating this, and I would just say to the gentleman, when he says that uh, the FBI and the Justice Department doesn't let us know if they're investigating, that's unless they're investigating a Democrat. When they're investigating a Democrat, we know. It's leaked all over the lot. Uh, so we sometimes know selectively from them who they're investigating. Congressman Shays. I have no statement. Congressman Schumer. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess, uh, you know, the, the point that all of us would like to be assured on is simply that the Justice Department is pursuing any potential types of wrongdoing as vigorously as they pursue so many other different types of activities. They should obviously not be coming here and saying uh, what they're doing and who specifically they're investigating. When they did that to uh, Bill Gray, many of us on both sides of the aisle were, were appalled. I think what Mr. Frank is saying, and certainly what I'm saying is, all, all I guess this committee and any member of Congress, as the American public as well wants, is some kind of assurance that they're not going to leave a stone unturned. And thus far, um, in ways that they could perfectly emit such signals and vibrations, they haven't. And uh, at least speaking for this member, Mr. Chairman, that's what I would be looking for, just some kind of general assurance that in, in word and in deed, that justice is pursuing every potential point of wrongdoing to the, to, with, the, with the zeal that they are known for pursuing so many other kinds of activities. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, before introducing our first witness, Chairman would like to express his strong appreciation to Ms. Andrea Nelson and Ms. Celia Boddington, the staff uh, persons responsible for most of the background work for today's hearing. They have done an outstanding job. Our first witness is Mr. William Taylor of Jacksonville, Florida. Mr. Taylor. Taylor, please raise your right hand. You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. The chair would like to indicate that Mr. Taylor is appearing on a voluntary basis. We appreciate your presence, Mr. Taylor. You may uh, submit any written statement. We haven't received any yet, or you may choose to proceed in any way you prefer. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I don't have a prepared statement. I am here at uh, your invitation. I just want to let you know that I'm delighted to have the opportunity uh, to be of help if I can. I. Uh, Almost didn't get here, though. The letter that you, your office sent to me happens to be dated July 24th, 1989. And it goes on to say, Mr. Taylor, on July 24th at 930 in room 2247, uh, we'd like to have you there to testify. But for the attempts that I made, when I didn't hear from um, the committee after having had the initial conversation, um, the, uh, I wouldn't be here through no fault of my own. And I just want to say that uh, in spite of the letter, I'm delighted to be here. Well, we are delighted to have you, Mr. Taylor. For the record, the chair would like to indicate the following series of contacts with you. You first received a telephone call on July 7 from Ms. Boddington of this staff. Uh, you indicated that uh, your preference for appearance is July the 24th, which is today. 
but if necessary, you could be here on July the f uh, 14th. This was a fairly lengthy conversation. Do you recall that, Ms. Taylor? Absolutely, sir. Okay. So we are holding the hearing at the date you requested. On the same day, you talked to uh, the chief of staff of the subcommittee, and uh, in your conversation with him, you agreed to appear on July 24. Is that correct? Yes, sir. On July 18, Ms. Boddington of the subcommittee staff uh, called your office to find out the fax number, uh, and we received that. And on July 19, um, Ms. Boddington received a call from minority staff uh, uh, indicating you haven't yet gotten the letter, and uh, the letter was faxed to you, as I understand it, uh, within the hour. That was uh, the 19th, I believe. That is but, correct. So you. That is correct? That portion, the last statement is correct, sir. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, on July 20th, uh, at your request, we again faxed the letter to you. So uh, on July 20th, Ms. Boddington called and left a message, message for you. Same day, Ms. Nelson spoke to you. Is that correct? On July 20th at 5 o'clock, Ms. Andrea Nelson oh, spoke Oh, Andrea to you. Nelson, yes. Yes. Um, and on July 21, we received uh, facts from you indicating that you will be here on Monday. So we had about as many written, oral, telephonic, and other communications with you as we probably had with any witness. But we are delighted to welcome you with, with great cordiality. And I'm, I'm glad we, we, we clarified this. I would like to, if I might, please correct the record. Uh, I don't know. You mentioned that on, I think you said the 19th, that a fax was sent to me at my office. I don't know where or what fax number uh, that was sent to, sir, uh, but it was not sent to my number. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was talking to the uh, staff the next day, when I called again, mm -hmm. I gave them my fax number, and no one had at the, had asked me prior uh, for my fax number, and uh, mm -hmm. so I'm unable to comment. Well, let me help you, Mr. Taylor, because we are we're really wasting a lot of time about uh, this matter. But uh, you have chosen to raise it. The chair wants to give you ample opportunity to express yourself. Uh, your very able secretary provided your fax number on the 19th of July, and we used that fax number to, to issue the invitation to you. On the 20th, you provided the fax number, and apparently uh, it, it was the same number, and apparently that fax arrived. So in any event, it's we not could not be more pleased to welcome you than we are. Next time, Mr. Chairman, maybe you can send another copy. Secretary Pierce, that you can pick up. Now, if we may get to the substance of why we wanted you to be here. Thank you. Ms. Taylor, for the record, indicate to us all of your HUD-related activities. Well, I, from your staff, uh, they indicated that they were interested in those uh, activities that deal with Section 8 mod rehab, and they mentioned specifically uh, Chatham Apartments in Savannah, Georgia. They mentioned specifically uh, a second uh, effort in Savannah, Georgia at the Chatham Apartments. <coughs> they mentioned uh, Angelina Hotel in Lufkin, Texas. And they mentioned um, uh, Liberty Street. Um, it's Liberty Center for the Homeless. It's on Liberty Street. I beg right. your pardon. Uh, correct. Liberty Center on Liberty Street in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, uh, for the record, in addition to these four projects, you were engaged in other HUD-related activities? Oh, my, yes. Uh, when you will have an opportunity, you will submit to the committee in writing a list of those? <laughs> I think perhaps I'd like to make a statement and then Please. ask you to, uh, at that point, give me whatever instructions you would like. Very good. In 1982, I was retained by the city of Jacksonville 
to uh, be their Washington representative. I was employed on a part-time basis um, to work with their, primarily with their own local HUD office, which was in very, very serious uh, trouble. I might mention that Jacksonville, Florida has a Democrat administration, and some of my Republican friends didn't quite understand uh, all the logic behind why I, as the Republican, former Republican state chairman, would be interested in trying to do something to help a bunch of Democrats. And, um, excuse me, did I interrupt you, sir? Um, so I was employed. I came to Jackson, I came to Washington and um, uh, with my mayor. And, uh, For the record, by the way, when did you serve as state Republican chairman, Ms. Taylor? Uh, from December of 1974 until 80, of, uh, April of 1980. 80. And you are, uh, then you became Nas Republican National Committee man, or were you? I became there? National Committee man in 1984. In 84, and you are currently in I'm currently the National Committee man, yes, sir. Thank you very much. So my mayor and I came to, and, and, the, and the director of HUD in Jacksonville, we came, we came up here uh, for the purpose of meeting some people to talk about the serious plight of the Jacksonville Housing Authority. It seems like um, back in 1970, I thought, I thought you were going to expand on why, why you were going to help a bunch of Democrats. Uh, you sort of I'm, left I'm us trying to, You're coming to I'm that. trying to get okay. to it. I sure didn't do it for the money because the first contract I offered uh, was in the amount of $4,500, and I think I helped the city obtain something like a million dollars uh, on the first trip that we came up here. Um, this was Band-Aid money that was needed to keep their housing authority from having to turn over the keys to the federal HUD. It seems like that when Jacksonville made its transition from consolidated government, I mean from um, its old form of government to consolidated government, HUD asked them for some information. And in the transition, some information fell between the cracks and they failed to get their appropriate allocation of what we call the PFS funds, which has to do with the maintenance and, uh, that they get per unit uh, to um, take care of their units. And they also failed to get an appropriate uh, increase in nobody. Uh, they let at the time through, I, I don't know whose fault, but they didn't appeal to federal HUD uh, in the time frame. I came on board. They were almost broke. They asked me if I could do anything about it. I said, I don't know, but I'll try. So I came up here and we found out that, and were able to successfully, after a year and a half to two years, we not only got that original million dollars, we got almost five more million dollars retroactively back to 1974 or 1975, and we got an adjustment for the future in their PS PFS formula of 20%. Well, Mayor Godball thought I was pretty hot stuff. He was a delighted, and he bragged about his Republican lobbyist or consultant or his man in Washington all over the place. As a matter of fact, I don't think we ever had a press conference when <laughs> Something nice wasn't said about me. And uh, I, uh, I'm happy to say that my attempts to uh, work with federal HUD resulted in my having to contact a lot of people. Uh, I might say, for the record, I never met Secretary Pierce, my recollection, until 1974 when he came to Jacksonville uh, 1984, I'm sorry, 1984 in Jacksonville during the campaign. And uh, I don't think that uh, I ever dealt with his office per se during the entire period of time that uh, Lance Wilson, his executive assistant, was there. And it was only later on that 
I had any contact at all with his office. Mr. Chairman, I, I, Mr. Kyle. Uh, may I ask what Please. year he was employed uh, by the city of uh, Jacksonville? I didn't catch that. Mr. Taylor. I was, it started out either in 1982 or 1983. Uh, it, uh, as I said, it was small contracts. At that time, they had a lobbyist up here that was hung over from the uh, previous administration. And uh, he, uh, well, literally, he was a carryover. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lutins, don't we, make We got laugh. your point, Mr. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> you get me tickled now, it's going to be. I think we're going to have fun this morning, so just relax <laughs> and enjoy it. Just relax and enjoy it. Um, is, is your opening statement. Uh, Concluded, Ms. Taylor, or are there further things you'd like to? I was just trying to answer the question yes. about about the city of Jacksonville, how I got into this thing, and right. the only other thing that I can say, as a result of some of the nice publicity that uh, the mayor gave me, and the fact that uh, he uh, had no objection for me putting his name on um, my recommendations when other people would approach me, um, this is how I sort of backed in uh, to the business of lobbying or being a Washington consultant, it seems like lobbying has a connotation that most people don't like. But back when I was chairman of the party, and I think it's only fair to say, I used to do a lot of things for free, just like you gentlemen are called on a lot of times to do something for free, but like you, I also wanted a little bit of something from it sometime, like a political contribution, and so I used to help, um, I used to help a lot of people um, get things done in Washington. And I had no hesitancy in uh, putting in my resume when I would call on somebody uh, to uh, and talk to them about representing them. I said, yeah. I did enough of it for free. I don't know why I can't get paid for it. And uh, that's the first time, by the way, I ever made any money in politics. Somebody asked me one time, says, Taylor, is there any money in politics? I said, yes, sir. A ton of it. Mine. Uh, Ms. Taylor, during the course of 1988, uh, what was your fee as a lobbyist for Jacksonville? Uh, $82,000. $82, $82,000. And was this the time period during which you were accused of conflict of interest and then fined $5,000? Can you explain those circumstances to us? Mr. Chairman, in the first place, I've never been fined a nickel. I'm sorry? I said in the first place, I have never been fined a nickel. Have you uh, requested uh, a correction uh, from the newspaper which ran this story saying, Ex lobbyist find five thousand dollars in interest conflict. Yes, sir. And have they uh, retracted their statement? Yes, sir. And and what are the facts? Can you explain it to us? I was adjudicated not guilty. There was no fine. They dropped one misdemeanor charge dealing with lobbying before the uh, city council without having been registered. And the other so-called conflict of interest uh, was, uh, was dropped in, uh, in return for a plea. And uh, what was that plea, Mr. Taylor? Uh, the plea was that. Um, was it a no low contender a plea? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. No contest. No contest. So you did not contest the charges? I did it. As my attorney wrote the newspaper after that horrendous article, that uh, we felt that on the basis of what happened, um, the uh, time and effort, the expense, and so forth to take the thing any further, I paid a $5,000 court cost. And that was it. Is it accurate that the mayor did not renew your contract after news of the investigation broke? 
the city of Jacksonville, uh, this is a very sensitive um, area, and, and I don't want to publicly get into an argument because you're really asking me something now that I would rather discuss with you in private uh, because um, I have some um, I have some feelings on this subject, sir, that I just don't think would uh, serve my best purpose by uh, getting into them here. The matter has been disposed of, and I no longer represent the city of Jacksonville, and I would respectfully ask the chair to uh, leave it at that in public, if you would. Uh, Congressman Frank. If, if you give a second, I just want to clear up. Surely. Um, what was the finding? Was it, you said there was no guilty finding? Yes, sir. Well, you pled no contest. Is that correct? This was in exchange for a plea, yes. You pled no contest? I accepted a no contest plea, yes, sir. Well, you didn't accept it. You have to plead it. I mean, well, whatever the, bailiff whatever the legal. It. You whatever, pled it. Whatever okay. the legal. I, I, yeah. You pled no contest to the charge, and the judge made no finding? There was not a finding of guilty? I mean, no contest Absolutely. plea? Absolutely. I was adjudicated not guilty. You pled no contest, and the judge found you not guilty. And the case was sealed. And this is another part of why I find it very difficult to uh, go into it here, because this case has been sealed uh, by the court. At whose, at whose motion was it sealed? I presume by my attorney. And uh, I find that it's very difficult for me to talk about this thing here, because uh, it's not a part of the record. And, the, and the, what's in the paper, um, we can produce a letter uh, to support completely. And by the way, in the paper, I think that article there came out on the 16th or 17th? Third. Third. Then about uh, the February 9th. February 9th, the, the correction. Beg your pardon? February 9th. February 9th. And that was a real cork of a, of a, of a retraction in the lower left-hand corner of the, of the second page. Uh, it's, uh, but it came as a result of a letter that my attorney wrote. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I just came up, Mr. Chairman, we might just put the correction on the record. Because of incorrect information from the state attorney's office, the story misidentified $5,000 that Republican National Committeeman Bill Taylor paid for investigation and prosecution costs after pleading no contest to a misdemeanor charge. Also, as part of the plea agreement, Taylor agreed only not to seek employment with the city in connection with his past contract as a lobbyist. He can still seek city employment or city contracts in other areas. So they say it was not a fine, the $5,000 you paid. It was to cover investigation and prosecution costs. It's too bad it wasn't the Justice Department. They didn't have any costs. You would have saved a lot of money. It's also too bad it wasn't on the front page like that other article was. Well, let's, let's move on. We, we, we have to deal with this issue because it's relevant to what we are exploring. Uh, I understand, Mr. Taylor, that in 1987, you were paid $25,000 to secure mod rehab units for the Chatham Apartments in Savannah, Georgia. Is that correct? In 1987, sir? Yes, sir. Was that 50 units? Yes. That's correct, sir. If that's, I'll accept the date. Thank you. Do you accept the amount, sir? You were paid $25,000 for Yes, that? sir. Plus. Uh, expenses. Plus exp approximately what were the expenses on that, sir? As I recall it, it was 3000 Small amount. Very good. What did, you, uh, what did you do to earn that fee, Mr. Taylor? Well, it goes back actually to the previous application at uh, Chatham Apartments uh, of 147 units. Uh, we applied originally for 234 units, mm -hmm. and uh, we were awarded 150. And through some type of attrition, or it was explained to me, that the funding, amount of funding, uh, was only sufficient for 147 units, so 147 units is what we actually wound up um, getting. Yes. At the time, we were told that to take the 147, that's all there was at the time, that down the road, 
uh, if it became um, uh, a regional reason to uh, reapply, if there were going to be additional units, and all these things were going along because of uh, the Congress uh, and, the, and the administration, um, never knew from year to year what was going to happen and uh, to reapply at some point. We did. And we applied under the original 234 uh, unit application. And uh, we were told that uh, this was going to be pipeline, which meant that this was a supplement to the original application and that um, it would come down uh, to Atlanta. It would be uh, earmarked for the Chatham Apartments. Well, it turned out that that was not the case. Uh, it turned out that uh, something happened between here and there, and the Housing Authority uh, <coughs> took the position that those units had to be advertised, those units had to be dealt with as if it was a new allocation having no other um, connection with any prior consideration. And uh, so we went, we, uh, we had to go through the, the entire process all over again as we did in the original 147. Did you meet with Deborah Dean in connection with this project, Ms. Taylor? I met with Deborah Dean so many times in my process of talking for the city of Jacksonville, sir. I have no knowledge of whether I talked to her specifically. My guess is I probably did, and I've talked to her on the telephone about this specifically. Uh, I've talked to her about numbers of, of other things, but I, I'm going to have to say yes. What other officials did you meet at HUD in connection with this project? Again, it gets all confused in my mind. I went back and within the short time frame that uh, I had for trying to review the sketchy notes that I have, it's, it's very difficult because I met with. Well, let me help with, your. Uh, let me help your DeMar memory. Lays. I, you know, I'd met with. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let me help your memory, and I'll send down this letter to you. I have a letter in my hand, uh, dated March 26, 1987. It's a short letter. I read the letter. Debbie, here is the letter that you asked for from Savannah. Thank you. Bill Taylor, and it's on the stationery of the Republican National Committee, William Bill Taylor, member for Florida. Um, and it was received in the immediate office of the Secretary of HUD the following day, March 27, 9.44 a.m. Do you recall this uh, one-line letter you sent to uh, Ms. Dean? I don't remember it specifically. Could the staff provide the letter to Mr. Taylor? I don't deny it. Thank you. Sure. That's my name. That's my signature. Okay. Well, clearly this very cryptic missive refers to a conversation you had with Ms. Dean concerning the project in Savannah. Now that you have the letter in your hand, does it refresh your memory as to as to your conversation with with Miss Dean? As to the letter that it refers to, as to the letter it refers to, and as to the conversation, let me read the letter again. Debbie, here is the letter that you asked for from Savannah. Thank you, Bill Taylor. I commend you, by the way, for the brevity of the letter. Washington uh, uh, writes very long letters in, in bureaucratic uh, terms, so you are, you you are, are so pointing right. the way. You, are so. you know, I'd be much better. I don't deny that this is my letter. Uh, I don't deny. I, I do have no recollection of the, uh, of the conversation. I would be a lot better off if I had a copy of the letter. That was uh, that was attached to this, and I might be able to understand it a little bit better. But well, we would like to have the copy of the letter too. We don't have the copy of the letter, but surmising from this uh, cryptic sentence, it's not unreasonable to assume that you went to Debbie Dean 
and you said, uh, I want 50 more units for the Chatham Apartments, and she must have said to you, well, I'm going to give it to you, Bill, but I need a letter from, um, from the housing people. Isn't that reasonable? Certainly. The only Do thing you I think that is what happened? Sir, I'd be absolutely uh, out of my mind if I started speculating about what that is because I, I have nothing. Now, I wouldn't, let, me, let me add this. Whether it was this or not, uh, from time to time, she did ask me for copies of information that was being provided um, by HUD uh, that uh, it would be sent to her uh, copies directly for her information. Uh, now, if this happens to be one of those occasions, so be it. If it's not, so be it. I have no knowledge, and, and I'm unable to assist uh, any further on that. Help me on one other thing, Ms. Taylor. Gladly. Uh, I have the highest regard for both of our great political parties. But I believe it is appropriate for people in high political position when they function not in their political capacity but in their private business capacity not to abuse the umbrella of either the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. Would you agree with that? If I could get the Congress to do it, I'd do it too. Could you expand on that? I follow the lead of the, of, of the Congress. Uh, I find I get letters, all kinds of things on congressional uh, stationery, and I find nothing wrong with letting people know who I am by using my National Committee stationery. I'm very proud of the fact. Well, let me help you differentiate between your receiving a letter from my distinguished colleague, uh, Congressman Kyle from Arizona, uh, on his on his on his <laughs> on, on his letterhead, uh, he he functions as a member of Congress. He was elected to that post as as were all of us. That is our job. So if we use a congressional letterhead, presumably we are functioning in the capacity that we happen to have during that two-year period. You, as a private individual, wear a variety of hats. You have a letterhead called Bill Taylor and Associates Incorporated, Corporate and Governmental Relations. It's a very handsome letterhead. You also have another letterhead called Republican National Committee. Now, when you are dealing with political party business, it is perfectly proper for you to use your letterhead, Republican National Committee, of which you are the member for Florida. But when you are dealing with obtaining units from HUD, I would think it would be more appropriate for you to use your business letterhead and not your political letterhead. Would you agree with that? Obviously, I don't. That's your opinion or my opinion, Well, sir. explain to me why you don't. Number one, I'm not quite as well known, perhaps, as you are or that some of these other people are. And uh, frankly, I, there's only two members, from, well, there are three members from Florida. And uh, for instance, I understand from the newspaper, I wrote Secretary Pierce a letter, and I used my National Committee stationery. I did, because I like for Mr. Pierce to know uh, that Bill Taylor uh, is the National Committee man from Florida. Why? to get preferential treatment? Or, or, or why do you want him to know it in connection with a project, for instance, the Liberty Center from the Homeless, which is one of the McKinney Project uh, 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 homeless uh, housing project? Is it relevant that the people who, who, who promote the project are national committee men of one political party or the other? or whether they are not involved with either political party. Isn't the issue, Mr. Taylor, that you were promoting in, with respect to the Liberty Center a project helping the homeless? Wasn't that the issue? 
not your political connections? Shouldn't that have been the issue? Perhaps it should, sir. Well, I'm asking you. I obviously, as I answered a moment ago, sir, maybe I made a mistake. I did it, and I've done it before. I've even written to the White House on behalf of nominations of people. I have written to uh, various agencies of the government. I've even written to my congressman using my National Committee stationery. I've written even to my senator using National Committee stationery. And now with regards to the SRO program, you know, there is a little housing policy here that occurs to me that if there was ever a program that was in bad shape when it was passed by, I presume, somewhere in the Congress, from this SRO program was a bad idea. Because number one, it came down without having had sufficient study, and there were no rules or regulations promulgated It was thrown at HUD. It had an effective date, if I recollect. What is the relevance of that to my question, Ms. Taylor? I'm because you, you mentioned, you mentioned. Uh, uh, I am asking a very simple question. I'd like you to, to address yourself to that very simple question, giving you a lot of latitude, a lot of leeway. But I don't want you to avoid answering my question. Did I avoid Let answering me, your question? Yes, you did. Let me Would rephrase you restate it. it please? Let me rephrase it. Many people in our society. <laughs> You among them wear a variety of hats. One of the hats you wear is that of being a housing consultant. Is that correct? No, sir. It's not correct. I am a Washington consultant. You are a Washington I consultant. I deal across the board in Washington representing clients before transportation, commerce, interior, uh, immigration. Okay. Many issues. Yes. One of them is housing. Housing. <clears throat> okay. When you are dealing with a housing matter with HUD, do you think it would be more ethical and more proper to use your business stationery, Bill Taylor and Associates, rather than a political letterhead? No, sir. No, sir. Explain to me why not. Very difficult. I, th I thought I addressed that. Well, let me tell you what my explanation oh, would be. My explanation is that if uh, you use a political stationery, you are sending a message that it is a national committee man who is writing this letter. You're right. And that is precisely what political influence peddling means. You are not then dealing with the merits of your project, but you are telegraphing a political message. And your political message is received. I have, and I'm going to send it down to you, the handwritten notes of, uh, of Deborah Dean. Uh, she starts out with X number of units, 2,140 <coughs> units. And a week after, sometime after receiving your letter, she allocates 50 units to your project. Why did you not approach the Assistant Secretary for Housing? Why did you approach Deborah Dean on this? Uh, sir, th that, that statement is predicated, if I understood what you said, you said, why did I approach Deborah Dean on this subject? That's right. She was and not, not the, the assistant official. That's right. Well, sir, uh, I don't know that that would be factual. Uh, of course it's factual. She was not in a line authority. She had no line responsibility but for you, housing. The, the, the observation that you made, if I heard you correctly, sir, 
was that I didn't contact the Assistant Secretary, that I did only contact Deborah Dean. Did I understand your question? Your testimony is that you contacted both. What I asked you was, sir, did You are I not understand? asking the questions. I'm asking the I was trying to clarify the question, sir. Well, let me tell you what the question is. All right, sir. Did you contact Deborah Dean in connection with this project? Yes, sir. Yes. Did she have any responsibility for this project? Or did the assistant secretary have responsibility for I this project? I think both of them. Uh, as a matter of fact, at that no, time. No, she had no responsibility for this project. It was the assistant secretary for housing who was the responsible agent. You went to Deborah Dean because you knew she was a political fixer. That's why you went to her, not because she had responsibility for allocating these units. Isn't that true, Mr. Taylor? No, sir. Well, why did you go to her? Because as I understood it at the time, there was a three-person committee that was charged with this responsibility, and the secretary was one of them. Deborah Dean, I never talked to the secretary about this or any other project. Deborah Dean was generally delegated as his representative along with, as I understood it, the housing commissioner at the time, and in some instances, I believe the undersecretary uh, served on the committee, and in other instances, I believe the general counsel served on the committee. So it was a sort of a three-person uh, arrangement. And uh, so, but I also knew that my experience in dealing with any of these agencies with the federal government, I rarely can get in to see the secretary. I'm pretty lucky to be able to get in to see an assistant secretary, and I very frequently find myself dealing with uh, very senior staffers. As a matter of fact, if I found I had any success at all in this business, it was because I did deal with the professionals, the career people. That's how we in the city of Jacksonville were able to do so much, because we did work with the staff. We worked through the process. We knew when things were going to happen, not only from the Federal Register, but we had a pretty good idea of what they wanted in the way of information, because there's a, there's a, a knack that everybody recognizes is the way you approach things, how you write things, the, the verbiage that you use. Uh, these are the things that um, or how you get results. It's like your gentleman dealing with your staff. You rely very f heavily. Miss Dean was neither career nor professional. She was a political appointee. She was only a small portion of the contact too, sir. But you go back to my st earlier statement, sir. If you recall, we requested the additional units on the original application and it was supposed to have been pipeline. Miss Dean did tell me that it was pipeline. Something happened between the time it left Washington and the time that it got to Atlanta, because when it got to Atlanta, it was not uh, pipeline. And therefore, when we started the process uh, on down in Savannah, eventually, uh, they treated it as exactly if it was a, a new 50 uncommitted, uh, un, you know, free use and they bid them. They put them out for bid. That was the proper procedure, Mr. Absolutely. Taylor. That was the proper procedure. Absolutely. You expected them to go automatically to the Chatham Apartments. But the pipeline also was perfectly legal. That has been employed um, many, many times. It was only the fact that somewhere it didn't get in the instructions out of HUD Central uh, to the region is to the reason why it did. And we never were able to come back and get it resurrected, as it was originally um, inferred to us that it would be. You know, reading your correspondence with Ms. Dean, it seems you have had a fairly close relationship. As a matter of fact, you are offering in one letter to help her uh, get the job of assistant secretary. This is a letter. I'm sending it down to you. I have, I, re I have re recalled the letter. I don't need it. You recall the letter? Sure. Yes called on to do it all the time. Yes, you say, I also want to wish you the very best as you proceed through this maze toward your appointment as Assistant Secretary. Don't let them get you down, and I know that you'll succeed. You're extremely qualified, and we are very proud of the job you have done. 
If there is anything that you feel that I can do to assist you, just let me know. Um, in retrospect, you have no qualms about that. I mean every word of it then, mm -hmm. I mean every word of it today. What was your reaction when she was turned down by the Senate? Fun and games as usual, I guess, just like John Tower or, you know, some of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a couple of questions about the Liberty Center for the Homeless Project in Jacksonville. All right. Uh, did you think it was appropriate to charge $35,000 in fees for a project for the homeless? Yes, sir. Explain that to me. The homeless are the poorest members of our society. And they, are, they are all over the streets of Washington and other cities. And, uh, and I, I suspect it, it takes a very high degree of cynicism to profit on their misfortune. Uh, these units were available for homeless all over the country. And I would think you would want to see the units for a homeless project go to the most needy homeless and that you would not want to profit from that project. Now tell me why you disagree with that, Ms. Taylor. I was about to get to it a little bit ago when you said I was off the subject. If you'll go back and recall what I said was that when the SRO or the McKinney Act was funded for these um, homeless projects. The funding authority came in, I believe, effective January. They had the each HUD had 30 days to get all that money, whatever amount of money it was, committed. Uh, that was, I believe, also an election year. And uh, there are a lot of people were were very anxious about the, getting something done on the record for the homeless. When it got to HUD, they didn't have any rules and regulations on how to go about doing this thing. So they did the best that they could. They took some Section 8 mod rehab regulations and they started trying to bend them and mold them and shape them and alter them and put them into uh, some type of shape so that they could go out. In Jacksonville, Jacksonville City HUD, uh, they applied for 80 units. Jacksonville City HUD applied for 80 units. When the time came down for the period to end and to get rid of them, they still had some more units left. And they asked Jacksonville if they could use any more and so Jacksonville said well sure so they sent them down more to bring the total I think to 108 the regulations were still in the process of being confused we worked on it at length uh, trying to find out make sense trying to work with Mr. Demery trying to work with his assistant Chris Oliver trying to find out what it was that we had to do because there was a completion date for the developer, whoever that might be. Uh, my recollection is June the 1st or July 1st. And so as we got into it, and uh, I believe uh, Mr. Harris uh, expressed some interest in it, it was uh, that we had no one else, as, again, as I recall it, but going, the HUD took care of this, going through the process of selecting whoever the developer was going to be. And we had so many problems. Number one, there was a labor standards thing that came up. That meant that if the building was over a certain height, that uh, they had to pay a certain hourly rate. If it was under a certain height, they, they got by with other, with another rate. Uh, there were zoning problems that we had. In all, in all candor, there wasn't a city councilman in Jacksonville that had any interest in 
uh, having the homeless project in his in his district. And uh, so we, we had we had a substantial number of problems. So you, when you say to me, why would this man pay me thirty five thousand uh, dollars? It was for the multitude of work that had been done and the multitude of work that it looked like had to be done. And also in dealing with the extensions that we subsequently were able to negotiate uh, so that he would not be penalized and the project wouldn't go down. Ms. Taylor, were you on retainer to the city of Jacksonville during this period? Yes, sir. So your job was on behalf of the city of Jacksonville to obtain units for the homeless, is that correct? Yes, sir. So in a sense, you were double dipping? No, sir. Well, let me tell you what it looks like to me. You correct me where I'm wrong. You are on retainer for the city of Jacksonville and among the many projects you have to deal with, you have to deal with hot projects, and one of the hot projects is a project for the homeless. And Jacksonville gets uh, 109 units, and uh, there are delays in proceeding with the project, so the only thing you really need is a little extension of time to finish this project for the homeless. And even though you are simultaneously on the payroll of the city of Jacksonville, you charge the developer $35,000 so that he can get an extension of time to finish this 109-unit homeless project. And he is terribly embarrassed by it all. He considers your fees to have been outrageous. And he is stating to our investigator, I'm quoting, that you, you were holding him up but he didn't know how else to do it. Uh, in retrospect, you still have no qualms about milking this project for the homeless twice. Once, by getting a consulting fee from the city of Jacksonville, and second, by getting a consulting fee on the same matter from the developer. I see nothing in conflict there, sir. The reason being, that my job with the city of Jacksonville was to assist in direct getting the, the units directed there. The, the problems that the developer had had nothing to do with the Jacksonville's problem uh, or with the getting them there. That was what my responsibility to the city of Jacksonville was, was to get as much of the bacon, so to speak, there as um, as I possibly could. Uh, but had you, not, had you not gotten the time extension, you would have lost the bacon, wouldn't you have? So you had a responsibility to the city of Jacksonville to get the extension. And you didn't, didn't perform on that responsibility. You went to the developer for milking the developer two, two for another $35,000, all of it on a homeless project. In the first place, sir, uh, I would have to respectfully disagree. Uh, I didn't go to the developer. The developer came to me. Why? Because of my good name and because of my good reputation. Maybe because he thought you could fix the problem. That could be. You'd yeah. have to ask him. Well, we did. And he expressed outrage to us at the exorbitant fee you charged on a homeless project. He says you held him up but he had no other way to go. That's his testimony. Sir, with respect, I've been in the business of selling for a long time, and whether it was insurance or whether it was my services uh, in this or other ways, and it's not infrequently that um, somebody will tell me, Taylor, you're charging too much. Um, I can buy it someplace else cheaper. Uh, they do that, as a matter of fact, quite frequently. And in the business of my being a, a, a Washington consultant, I have people tell me, I've had people to tell me that um, what I was asking was beyond their ability. They didn't have that much interest in it. And all of us being big boys, I understand that. Uh, I don't know what 
You know, I'm reminded, sir, of a former member of Congress who had a client that came to him for $10,000. He said, I need a comma inserted in a bill. And between like orange and juice. And the um, guy says, can you handle it? Sure. So he goes to a friend who happens to be the chairman of the committee, and they get that little comma put in there, and the guy gets his $10,000 as a consultant. Now, I don't know anything about whether that comma was... Who, who was that member of Congress? I would respectfully... <laughs> he's not a member now, sir. I would hope not. Uh, I didn't say... I said a former member. Former member. But I don't know whether that comma is the overcharge for it or the undercharge for it. But I dare say that for the $10,000, somebody must have thought he got a pretty fair deal. Mm -hmm. Now, in this particular case that you're talking about, in all candor, this developer probably, in dealing with uh, the process, and, and I don't know how much uh, prior experience he had had in dealing in areas of this type. But I dare say that he, in retrospect, thinks that there was a whole lot of things that were tied to this 109 units of SRO that he wished he had never heard of. He probably wished that they had never been granted to the city of Jacksonville or he had expressed any interest in them because they haven't done anything but cost him money to this date and hadn't been for his associate in the deep pockets of his associates. Uh, it would have been gone a long time ago and there wouldn't be anything. If it hadn't been for some of the experiences that he had in meeting the zoning regulations, if it, it's, they required him to do things that the McKinney Act and the SRO program as directed by HUD didn't require him to do. So he's got a lot of money in this thing. And I'm sure that mine, along with a lot of others, he feels that he has been uh, had. And that's a part of what I've been trying to say about this housing policy, uh, there are mistakes made. There are reasons for having people like me and others who can come up here. I don't know, sir, if you've ever been over to HUD building or not, but I, I can have. tell you that's a big building, it's and a, there are lots, and there are lots of people over there. Yeah. I'll never forget the experience. I was looking for one man one time. And lo and behold, he was in the office next to me, and I never did find him until after he was gone. He was, it was and I tell you, just finding your way around in that place, no poor soul that doesn't know his way around this place can find up from down over there. And lots of times I spent the hours walking the halls just trying to locate the person who had something to do with a particular program. I earned my money. Let me ask you a little bit about Angelina House in Lufkin, Texas. Um, what was your fee? Excuse me, sir. May I? Please. In retrospect, go back. I overlook one thing. Please. In Chatham Apartments, uh, uh, I neglected to add one thing. We had congressional support from Senator Nunn, from Senator Mattingly, from Con uh, Congressman Lindsey Thomas, the mayor of um, Savannah, and, uh, and I think another former congressman was also a consultant that was brought in uh, on this project. So this, this, this project was not without substantial support. And I might also mention that Savannah had never had a housing project, uh, a Section 8 mod rehab program before. They didn't have any mechanism set up for handling this thing. And one of the reasons that we had a good developer who had some experience, and he went in there between he and Atlanta, they did a lot of the work that the housing authority is supposed to do. And the same thing also applies in, um, in Texas. Now, can, can, you, uh, you asked me a question about Angelina. Uh, uh, Lufkin, Texas, Lufkin, the Angelina Texas. project. Yes, sir. What was your fee there? Uh, $15,000, and we eventually agreed to, and I would be a participant, a limited partner to the degree of 
So you receive $15,000 as a consulting fee and a 10% equity in the project. For which I've received nothing. I'm sorry? That 10% has generated me no income whatsoever. But you still own 10% of the project? Yes, sir. So you own 10% of the project? If it ever is uh, sold or right. syndicated or yeah. something like that, I would receive something. Ten, ten. What is the value of the project? I honestly don't know. Well, give us, a ball, give us a ballpark. 86 units. 86 units? Please. Yes. When you say the value, are you talking about the whole building with the um, with the subsidy and everything? Mm -hmm. The real estate. I'd be guessing. Well, I, I, that's all I'm asking you. We are not going to hold you to the precision. Four million, maybe. Four million. So, this project generated fifteen thousand dollars in consulting fee and an equity interest ballpark of $400,000 for you. What did you do for this approximately $415,000, Mr. Taylor? Well, number one, I... By the way, let's begin this. Give me a ballpark figure of the number of hours you put in on the Lufkin, Texas project. And I know you'll be guessing, and we will be happy to accept your guess. Well, considering the uh, time that we spent uh uh, with the developer uh, in when you in say Texas. we when you say we you mean you the royal we yes sir yeah it's I it's really I uh -uh, I'm we you are we my company Bill Taylor and Associates Inc we mm -hmm. who were your associates in this in the in the Lufkin Texas project from well that's company. the name of my firm sir I understand that and so I had no one else no other if you're asking so, would I so have it other? was a it was a one person operation if you in that particular case. I had one person, that was Bill Taylor. Bill Taylor. So why don't we, for the sake of simplicity... Because I was incorporated, sir, and that's the reason I used okay. it that way. Okay, okay. So let me rephrase it. How much time did Mr. Taylor devote to the Lufkin project? <laughs> including the trips to Texas, including the trips to Washington. All of it. Probably a hundred hours. A hundred hours. And you received about four hundred and fifteen thousand dollars in value for that. I hope one day to receive that. Well, I do too. Hmm? That's about, you know, Paul Manafort testified that he's working at a thousand dollars an hour. People thought that's excessive. But you do four times as well as Mr. Manafort did. That on the record. Mr. Chairman, I, I would respectfully request that you do your calculation, do your arithmetic over again insofar as I'm well, concerned. Well, tell me how to do it over again. You just testified. $15,000 is, uh, is the amount of money that I have received. And then equity, which you estimate to be worth four hundred thousand dollars, isn't that true, Miss Taylor? And and some obligations. Uh, what obligations? Because I'm one of the guarantors um, in the partnership. What 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 are those obligations? I'm one of the signers of ten percent of the um, of the obligation to the bank. What has that obligation cost you so far? Nothing. Nothing. Do you expect it to cost you funds in the future? No, sir. No, sir. So that's a pleasant obligation. I mean, I wish all of my obligations would be such that they cost me nothing past, present, or future. I Those agree. are good obligations. And I hope they stay that way. Well, I sure do. So the record will show that you received $415,000 in funds and equity for what you claim, and the chair is happy to accept that claim, about 100 hours of work. What is your comment on this? 
Ms. Taylor, you are a man of the world. You, you, you understand the problem of the homeless. You understand the problem of low-income housing. How do you think people react to a statement from an individual who has attained a lot of success that with about 100 hours of work, he got $415,000 worth of benefits. You I mean, what was so unique about it? I mean, you are not composing like Beethoven composed. I mean, you are, we are not dealing with the Sistine Chapel that you created. You used just a little bit of political influence, which was very successful. I mean, these are not, not the products of, a, of an Albert Einstein or, or a Ludwig von Beethoven or a Leonardo da Vinci, you just went to Debbie and put a little pressure on her. I mean, you know, you, we have to be serious about this. We are talking about a housing crisis in this country. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of people homeless, and you are sitting here cynically telling us that with 100 hours of flying to Texas and going to HUD, you got $415,000 in benefits. And you see nothing wrong with it. Mr. Not since James Watt have we had a witness of such cynicism. So try to explain how you view this activity in retrospect, at least. Mr. Chairman, I'm unsure of the dates. But I think the record will support that Debbie Dean had nothing to do with this. I think this preceded her period, uh, my knowledge of Good, Debbie but Dean. whom did you deal with at HUD with respect to Lufkin? I dealt with uh, Mr. Barksdale's office. Okay. I dealt with his assistant. Okay. I dealt with Senator Tower's office. I dealt with uh, Representative uh, Charlie Wilson's office. Uh, I dealt with... Uh, you know, these respected members of Congress can be approached by the city. They don't need you. Sir. Th they don't need you, and I am getting sick and tired of your listing respected members of Congress who respond to their constituents and the communities in their districts. They don't need you as an interlocutor. Again, sir, I would have to... Congressman Shays. I would... Uh, <laughs> Oh, is that the completed list of the people you dealt with? Did you ever deal with Lance Wilson? No, sir. Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. My feeling, in, in, and I really have lost the... Um, maybe it'll come back to me. I, 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 I've okay. lost it momentarily. Congressman Lukens. Mr. Taylor, I'd like to go back and amplify a couple of points that the chairman's already uh, covered. I mean, he always covered it uh, in great detail. The double dipping that was referred to for the SRO projects in Savannah. No, no not Savannah, sir. S SRO program was in Jacksonville. Okay, let's start with that. That, that was the program on which the chairman al alluded to the prospect of uh, an appearance of double dipping, which you're receiving a... Excuse me, I'm not quite able to hear you, sir. In which you were receiving a salary of 35,000, was it? 82,000? 82,000. So you were at full salary at that time from Jacksonville City. And you saw your job, and your job was legally responsible for acquiring housing units, particularly MHR, for the city of Jacksonville. Is that correct? Yes. How long did you work for the city of Jacksonville? As I indicated earlier, I think my first contract was either in late 82 or early in 83 through uh, October of 1988. So basically four and a half, five years. Yes, sir. During that time, you acquired many projects for Jacksonville. Is that correct? Yes, sir. About how many projects? Now, projects, meaning... Uh, Not total numbers of units. Mod rehab? All kinds of projects. All kinds of projects? We won't discuss 
mod rehab as far as I know so far, and the SRO, but all kinds of projects. 10, 12, 5, 50? 50 projects. It's as good a guess as any. Might have been 100. You were paid 82000 from the beginning, the first year? Oh, no. My first contract was, uh, I think it was $36,000, and I was one of five. And uh, the next year, they increased, they eliminated everybody else and gave me the, the full contract for 60000 And then the next year, they renewed my contract for six. No, so I was increased to seventy-two thousand. And the next year, it was retained at seventy-two. And the next year, it was eighty-eight. Clear point eighty-two. Minor, clear point minor point. You were a registered lobbyist for Jacksonville, not a consultant, or you were a consultant during this time. I was a consultant. So you were never a rog registered lobbyist. No, sir. Not for the purposes of uh, lobbying on the hill. No, sir. How much total income has HUD generated for you in return for your professional services? Excuse me? How much have you made off HUD as a consultant to Jacksonville? Uh, you, you, in this one instance, you're receiving a salary from Jacksonville, but you also uh, got money from a developer. 35000 Yes. Was that the only time that kind of yes, double sir. salary ever occurred? Yes, sir. Why did it occur in that particular instance? I, I'm really uh, foggy about that. Why was that project so different? Uh, from all the other projects you apparently handled for the city of Jacksonville. Well, Mr. Lukens, the only thing I can comment on is when the developer found himself to be in trouble and not knowing where to go, uh, he came to me and asked me uh, if I could be of any assistance to him. And uh, I told him, yes, I thought perhaps I could. What did he want done? We. Uh, some way or another ar arrived at the services that, <clears throat> that he wanted provided. How did you arrive at the sum of money that he would pay you? I guess by g horn around and just sort of join it out and uh, but the we reached, I'm sorry. And we just reached uh, an agreeable level. We, was but based on the number of hours that we thought it was going to take, you know, that's the way I work, either by the hour, by the job, uh, by the week, by the year. Uh, it, it was just dependent upon uh, what he wanted, you know, how long, how you wanted to do it. But he not was, by the unit. No. So how many units were involved in that SO project that you, for which you received, I believe, thirty-five thousand dollars? It turned out to be one hundred nine. <laughs> At the time we were we were talking, I think we were only looking. I can't remember if, if the number had already been increased from 80 to 109, or if that occurred later on. I'm not really sure about that. Uh, the gentleman apparently, in communication with uh, members of staff or members of the committee, has complained that that was too high an amount, and he felt, you know, uh, that it that it was simply too much money to pay. Did he voice that objection to you at the time they negotiated the amount? No, sir. Did you have any arguments during the process of the project that would have led to his uh, sudden disenchantment with the amount of money, or was he? Did he never at all mention to you that thirty-five thousand very high for that? Quite to the contrary, um, he was uh, very agreeable, and he had associates. He had uh, two other people that one other person that I'm aware of uh, that um, um, concurred in it. Uh, and uh, he said that um, it was the services that I provided for him uh, over the period of time, which included uh, zoning, which included trying to obtain some um, furniture for him th through GSA. May I interrupt you? Sure. Would you not have done that anyway in return for your city salary for a project that had been let? I understand through the auspices of the Jacksonville uh, Housing Authority. Uh, would you not have done that for any other developer? I wasn't called. I worked for the city, and when it came down to what the developer wanted, that was another matter. Well, we in Congress, as I know you know, Mr. Taylor, hear a lot about double dipping. 
and takes on a new perspective in this regard. And I'd just like to zoom in on it if I can. What was different about this project that made you feel comfortable receiving a salary from the city of Jacksonville to obtain the project in the city of Jacksonville for their housing area authority? And then turning around and asking for an additional salary from a developer who received the project for which you had received blanket authority for Jacksonville City. Was that not a, did you not see that as conflict of interest? Could you hit that point again for me? I don't understand your thinking on receiving, on separating the two salaries. Sir, the thinking may not be uh, agreed upon by everyone. Uh, my particular uh, thinking at the time, and, and I've experienced it time and time again, perception to me is a very re remarkable thing. And uh, if uh, this developer perceived, as sometimes lawyers are perceived to be able to go to court and get something done, and they're retained and they may lose a case or they may win it. Uh, it was perceived by this person, I presume, that um, I was worth it. And Pardon that me. I could, I would give him his value received and he told me that he, and he paid me right on time. I'm not, a, I'm not questioning Mr. General. I think that perhaps uh, he did perceive that. I think perhaps you did deliver per your agreement. And uh, I think you're probably worth the money in that sense. What I'm asking is not his perception, but I'd like to have your perception of the difference in this project and in your approach to the fact that while you're on the city payroll to get the projects on block, on Moss, or all these projects for Jacksonville, you could, for which you apparently did a very good job. But at that time, would you not have assisted, and did you not assist other developers in doing the things that you apparently did for this specific developer, SRO for 35000 In other words, there's something different about this project for which you received, quote, a double salary, at least another salary, uh, as opposed to the 50 other projects that you, you referred to where you were just doing your job for Jacksonville at 82000 a year. I don't understand your thinking, not his perception of your value, but maybe your perception of your value. As best I could answer your question, sir, when the city of Jacksonville or the, the Jacksonville HUD director asked me to provide a service or to do something, I did it. Uh, if a developer called me in to do something else, uh, that was between the developer and me, and it didn't have anything in my mind to do with uh, my, re my obligation or responsibility to the city of Jacksonville. Now, that you can say uh, maybe the city should have done it, uh, maybe Federal HUD should have done it. I, I really can't speak to that. But when he came to me and hired me to do it, uh, I was available. I, I can accept that, except for the fact that the city's not asking you to assist this developer, are they, specifically on his problem? It's beyond that. You've done your job. You've delivered the, black, the block projects. Right. Now, the developer comes to you for the first time, apparently, out of these 50-some projects you delivered to the city of Jacksonville and asks you for additional assistance. Okay. There may be a, there is a question as to whether or not that's appropriate to be paid for those additional services. And, and you have already had a, dis you know, a discussion regarding this with the chairman. What I'm trying to say is, what made this project so different and so valuable to this developer as opposed to all the other projects you handle where ostensibly and apparently and obviously they would have also asked you to do a little extra to help their projects get underway? As best I can answer that, Mr. Lukens, it has to do with the horrible condition that the SRO program arrived in Jacksonville in, and uh, this developer received it uh, under the gun. Uh, he had all kinds of problems that uh, were unrealized. He had problems that he was vaguely aware of. Uh, his um, he was getting deeper and deeper into the expense uh, through the zoning process, through everything else. And he was, frankly, he was, he was panicked. All right, and simply put, as far as you know, this project arrived in the Jacksonville 
housing office in the worst shape administratively to be successful that you know of. Absolutely. Project. Secondly, there obviously was a time frame. He was in a hurry and he was 30 back. days. 30. He could have lost. He was at risk for a lot of money. Yes, sir. Okay, so he hired you out of desperation, really, in trying to get the problem resolved. That's my assumption. That's what I understood. You did not see this as a natural extension of the job and the duties for which the city of Jacksonville was already paying. You, you've, you've said this, but I need to bang away on that point, Mr. Taylor, to understand the difference between this and the others. There must have been some other project that was not in, was not tidied up, was not ready to go, where you also assisted the, the developer for nothing. That, that's what I'm getting at. This one seems to be different. I'm trying to understand in my mind why it was different enough that you would take this other salary. In the first place, in all the, uh, all the programs that Jacksonville HUD received, uh, their offices, which are a top-notch organization, handled them in a routine fashion and disposed of the units under the rules and guidelines uh, as were outlined to them. And the, uh, uh, they had no need generally for very much, but when they asked me uh, to help them clarify a problem, whether it was in, uh, and there were always problems coming up on, on any of these things, whether it was a UDAG or whether it was uh, uh, an SRO or a Section 8 mod rehab or whatever it was, there were always problems coming up that had to, rely, had to require help. When they needed it, the HUD, Jacksonville HUD needed it, but this they one came was to different, me. Mr. It Taylor. was different, yes, sir. It was just worse. It was absolutely worse. The, the most deplorable. I think that I'll not get any better success on having this, you know, cleared in my mind. So I'm going to move on to a couple I'm of things that I mind. You mentioned that the project, I think, for 50 uh, homes in, in Savannah, was that for 50? The second go round was for 50. Well, okay, that was the so-called pipeline. Yes, sir. Project. But it turned out not to be pipeline. Sir? It turned out not to be pipeline. Turned out not to be pipeline. In your testimony, I'm confused because you also said this was the first MHR project that Savannah had received. And if it had been the first, I, I was a little confused as how it could have been a pipeline or follow-on project. Would you clarify that, please? MHR? Well, I'm confused. I remember you saying in your testimony, I wrote it down, that this was the first MHR. Mod rehab, that's what you're saying. Mod rehab, okay. yes, I'm sorry. And yet, if it's the first one, it, uh, it seems to me that it could not have been a follow-on or a pipeline project. You, you missed that earlier part of the 147. There were 147. I certainly did. There were 147 uh, that came first out of the 234 applied for. And the 50 was the addition that was requested under the original application for 234. So this was legitimately supposed to have been a mod hab or MHR follow-on or pipeline project, and therefore should the administrative uh, support should have been more automatic than if it had been the first one, which always takes a lot more time. Yes, sir, and if I'd have had all that help from Deborah Dean, I <laughs> said I've been alleged to have had, I, I might have gotten a, a, a pipeline, but I didn't. I just want to clear that because I did not understand it. It appeared, right. appeared to me that the testimony was conflicting. On to Lufkin and the 100-hour project. Yes, sir. I think, I don't know I'm the only member that it's in quandary mentally about the $4 million, let's just say it is $4 million, it turns out to be less or more. We don't know. I understand that. The obligation you carry is, is a, a note you signed as one of 10 on a note for the $4 million? A note of one well, I'm of... I'm asking what kind of obligation it's, you it's, have. Yes, you I have, I have a, a, a note that um, we're signed on, yes, sir. Well, the chairman said it's a pretty nice obligation because you stated that you don't ever anticipate it costing you anything. Walk me through the financial motivation for taking a piece of the project. Granted that you're just at this stage, you had a $15,000 consultant fee, wiped it off. You're now one of the investors. How many investors are there? To the best of my recollection, uh, one, two, three, uh, four. Four. Do they all have equal? Obligation? Are they equally obligated, or is, it, or is one of them a major investor? One, one person is the general 
partner and he has the control and a general partner does not necessarily have to have more than the other but in this case he has more interest more at stake he has all but to my understanding have, all but 30 percent have you actually put up any money in the project yes sir what how much money did you put into the project i on the basis of the way that we calculated it um and taking the interest in lieu of um, uh, uh, any fee, uh, I think it would have been, I think, I'm, I'm trying to recall that I think the, that I was looking for a fee of twenty-five to $30,000, and uh, we compromised on the basis of 15000 and 10% uh, is the way I recall it. All right. we'll, we'll you. For you a I want to be sure your testimony is accurate for your own sake, sure. Mr. Taylor. You, in fact, did not invest any cash in this project. Is that correct? I have a, I have a small amount of cash in it, yes, sir. Approximately how much? Just ballpark. I'm not going to hold you to it. Is it? It's under $100. I'm sorry? It's under $100. It's under $100. OK. Well, let's stipulate that it is $100. So you have invested in cash approximately $100. Then you received a consulting fee of $15,000 and 10% of the value of the project. You own a 10% you have a 10% equity position. Is that correct? Yes. So your arrangement basically was to put down $100 or less in cash, get $15,000 as a consulting fee. Somebody more cynical than me would say that you got a consulting fee of $14,900. Would that be an accurate way of phrasing it? since dollars are fungible. Since, uh, and this is a part of, sir, mm. with your permission, uh, this obligation that I have is a part of the reason why I was saying a while ago that I haven't realized this profit, nor have I realized the loss, and should this project go down, and I don't expect it to go down, uh, I'm, I'm still responsible for my portion of the obligation. And so I guess both of them are unrealized. Both my cost and the profit is, is the, the relationship that I would make on the basis of the ex conversation dealing with things Would you other characterize than the project as a pretty safe deal? We hope so. You hope so. But I just wanted to establish the fact that with the exception of the less than $100 in cash, you, in fact, are not an investor in that project as that term is ordinarily understood. You received, as compensation for your influence peddling, $15,000 as a fee and a 10% equity interest, which you now value at approximately $400,000. Are these accurate statements? Yes, sir. Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> My line of questions, let me go a little bit further because he's asked a couple things I would have wanted to know. And I think the committee wants to know. I, I want now to try and further spe specify the amount of value that you believe you put into the project. For example, if your fee were to have been 30000 and they paid you 15000 that 15000 would have been considered your equity investment into a project worth what at that time? Was it worth four million at that time? I mean, what kind of uh, Mr. Lucas, I, I'm trying I, to get a handle on how, what that 15000 represented compared to what everybody else put in. Do you follow me? One person obviously put up cash. The, the big I, I, I don't, I, don't I, I would have to say four million because I, I, I think it was worth that then and I think it's worth that now. But that's my guess. It has no relationship to the fact. And I'm trying to relate that Mr. Taylor, the amount of money that others might have put up to see what, you know, what value you purchased for the 15000 equity investment, what value you receive in return for it. Someone else putting up, say, 
half a million or, or another 15,000 or 40,000? I guess that is a question which you cannot answer. The only thing that occurs to me, we call it sweat equity because there were two other people that had a position in it very similar to mine who also got 10 percent uh, and uh, they were employees of the developer and uh, so you were not the only one receiving this kind of benefit uh, in terms of equity investment the two right. others also had the same deal yes sir quote quote yes sir but they were not paid fifteen thousand dollars as a as a matter of fact they were on regular so, salary with the developer all right let me kind of wrap up at this stage and I guess something that uh, we cannot appreciate and maybe uh, we don't we don't have to maybe it should not not mind should be mis uh, considered. But is there a degree of difficulty to these um, projects that, that make some so valuable apparently and others not even worth uh, dealing with? In other words, hundreds of projects have gone through apparently the system without the benefit of consultants. And we're of course facing a major problem here in terms of a huge and growing uh, scandal, if you will, within HUD as to the number of consultants used, the amount of money they receive for doing things that some of us don't do and have never done and don't, perhaps don't understand. So, wrap it up. This uh, project in which you now have 10% of a $4 million potential profit or uh, I suppose a, a significantly less but uh, equally uh, large amount of of loss if it should fail, which no one thinks it's going to fail. Was that a difficult project to put together? Turned out to be that it was. As a matter of fact, it was an old hotel. Let me ask you. I'm not interested in the technical part so much as I am in the administrative difficulty. In other words, you were hired basically to walk through HUD and to, I hate to say grease the skids, but that's primarily what we're talking about. Uh, the project was not, would you think it would have gone without your assistance? Were you the key element? Was it dying on the vine until you came along? No, I wouldn't call it dying on the vine when I was brought in because I was brought in rather rather early. Uh, but uh, whether or not it would have it would have gone, I've always taken the position that there are lots of people that can do what I do, uh, either more quickly or given enough time can do it in a long time. So I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that my services are unique, although I like to think they are. Um, but the um, the project in uh, in uh, Angelina uh, required a great deal of time because we were dealing with an un unusual or unique situation in what they call out there. They didn't have a, a housing authority. They had what they call the Deep East Housing Authority, and that was an area that was rather big in East Texas. And um, they, they weren't very well informed. They had also never received um, a mod rehab uh, project. And um, they were in great need of assistance, that, uh, the type of assistance that my developer uh, had and expertise. And uh, building a, and rehabbing a hotel, he learned never to do another hotel. Well, let me just wrap it up then in this regard. You are paid as a consultant, and you apparently do it well. Otherwise, your repeat business would not be there, and your, uh, the amount of money you make would not be there. Do you feel that you're paid to walk things through HUD in Washington, D.C., or is a large part of your effort directed at local housing or regional housing areas? Is, is the work up in Washington, is it out you know, where the houses actually are built? Would you repeat that, Mr. Lukens? What are you paid for? Your work in D.C. or your work out on the site? You know, helping to walk it through, say, the Atlanta Regional Center or the local housing authority. Are you really paid to walk things through HUD? I am paid to, for both, actually, to for what I do in Washington and for what I am paid to do uh, subsequently. Is one more time-consuming and difficult than the other? That's really what I'm getting at. In your opinion. Uh, much more difficult in the afterglow, uh, in the dealing with what goes on afterwards, because there's always negotiations, there are changes, there are uh, difference in 
or it may be a zoning matter, it may be a financing matter, it may be a labor matter, it may be, uh, it could be a number of things. So, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Taylor, what you're saying in essence is, as far as you're concerned, obtaining the project is only about 50% of the work. Yes, sir. The, your obstacles usually come after that. And you Invariably. think that's what, and that's what you believe that you're paid for as much as for the obtaining of the... And as a matter of fact, I, I almost overlooked... Is that a yes or... Yes, sir. And as a matter of fact, in the case of the Chatham Apartments, uh, the, the, we experienced over a three-year period uh, so many problems, my developer came back and compensated me an extra $5,000 because he felt that I had uh, gone above and beyond. Well, I thank you, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, a couple of things that are left over here. You said you had an obligation on, on your Lena house. You, you, you were signed 10% of the obligation. I miss exactly how much is the obligation and to whom? To a bank in Jacksonville, Florida. How much? <coughs> What's the debt? That's the question that I don't know, sir. I, right off the top of my head, I'd be happy to furnish it to you if you leave. Did you know at the time that you undertook it? I hope so, yes, sir. But you don't know what it's uh, the obligation is. Angelina recall. House, that's where you got uh, what you said was sweat equity in effect. I mean, yes, it's um, the most upscale okay. sweat equity I think I've ever encountered. In fact, it, and that came, that's the one where you dealt with Mr. Barksdale and got, you, you were influential in getting the approvals for the uh, units? I said I dealt with Mr. Barksdale's office. Uh, he, I, I think I made that in the context that it was prior to Debbie Dean, and I... I said, I didn't ask you about Debbie Dean. So you, your major role in Angelina House, did you have to do a lot of negotiating with the uh, city of Lufkin? Not, not with the city of Lufkin, okay. um, but with the... Uh, the Deep East Texas Council, Council, but they would have only been the, yeah, the, the applicant. There weren't any zoning or any other kind of problems in Lufkin, obviously. There were all kinds of problems in yeah. Lufkin. But you did a, you, you were the one who got the uh, approval through HUD? For the unit, yeah. I, to be honest with you, Mr. Taylor, this sounds to me more like no sweat equity. I mean, they needed the units. Uh, it was no sweat for you to get them, and uh, you got the equity. We served an awful lot of poor people in uh, Lufkin, Texas. I understand that, sir. But you know, an awful lot more poor people would have been served if developers hadn't had to pay out these fees, and we could have redone the program cost. When, for 86 units, your compensation may you go over 400000 and I realize there's a range of uncertainty here. Um, that's a lot of money that uh, could build us a lot more units. Let me just ask about uh, the other thing in Jacksonville. You said when you were being compensated both by the city and also by the developer on the SRO, one of the issues you said you were doing for the developer had to do with zoning issues? Was that one of the things you worked on for the developer? Now, that meant you had to get the city of Jacksonville to do, the, to do certain things with zoning? I assume the city of Jacksonville is in charge of zoning. Council. Yeah. Uh, the problem we have here is that uh, you were both being paid by the city of Jacksonville and then also being paid simultaneously by someone else to lobby the city of Jacksonville. And that's why to many of us that seems like an improper arrangement. You were getting one salary, one set of compensation from the city, but then you were also getting paid by someone else to influence that city government. And that's the sort of situation which we tend to feel uh, ought to be avoided and, and, and generally is. On uh, your history now, and I'm just wondering that you mentioned you were in the insurance business? Yes, sir. When did you uh, become chairman of the Florida Republican uh, State Committee or whatever the title is? December 74. And prior to that, had you done any lobbying, uh, consulting, representing people at HUD? No, sir. When did you begin the business of being a uh, Washington consultant? As I indicated, um, uh, 1981 or 1982 on an occasional uh, part-time right. basis. So f prior to that, you had been in the insurance business, I think you indicated? Yes. Had you done any work with housing? Had you been a housing developer? No, sir. Had you been in the housing construction field? No, sir. Did you do any tax advising for people in the housing field? How about could urban could planning? You, excuse me, could yeah. you talk into the mic, uh, Ms. Excuse Taylor? Me, I'm sorry, we can't hear your answers. Right. Uh, had you worked at all in urban planning? No. Had you done any representing clients before governments? No, sir. Uh, okay, so 
up until you had become chairman of the Florida Republican Party, you were an insurance man with no experience in being a consultant, being a lobbyist, or in the housing field. Or and any other field. Uh, other than insurance. Yes. Yes. And after you served as chairman of the Florida Republican Party from 1974 through when? 80. Through 80. Well, now, April of 80. April of 80. And so you then began your lobbying career in 1981 and 82. Yes, sir. At what age were you when you began, Mr. Taylor? Well, I was born in 1923, so. That would have made you 58 in, uh, in 1981. Uh, I guess. Yeah. Um, well, the reason that we are concerned that you might be here, you are a very successful, I would gather, insurance salesman, and you uh, do well in insurance. You have not had any experience up till the age of 58 in lobbying and housing and urban planning. And all of a sudden, you are worth significant amounts of money to people at the age of 58, which you'd never done before, um, having been chairman of the Florida Republican Party and having a Republican administration in office. And that is why it seems to many of us that what we have here is an example of political influence being the basis for this uh, sort of a career and why we are disturbed and to connect it to public policy. When developers pay sums that they pay to yourself, either in cash or in equity, in the immediate term, it doesn't come out of a pot that's available for the programs, but over any prolonged period, it reduces the amount of money that we have available for uh, the programs. Now, what led you in 81 to begin lobbying? As you, did. you said you started on an occasional basis in 81 and 82. What were your first jobs? I think what I said was that because of my lobbying activities back during the period of time that I was chairman, that this was the basis for my experience. I had substantial uh, experience, whether it was lobbying for uh, uh, approval of uh, appointee by the administration or whether it When was, was that? Uh, you, but you left the office is that during the Ford administration. The Ford administration. Um, so you worked under the doing some of that in the Ford administration. You said 74, 75, and I guess 76. Yes. Did you do much lobbying during the late 70s during the Carter administration? <laughs> I didn't do any. So you didn't do any lobbying, um, and you then started to do this for pay. You said you lobbied on appointments. I must say I think there is a difference between lobbying for appointments and lobbying for housing units. It seems to be wholly appropriate for you in your party role to lobby for appointments because appointments are supposed to reflect the philosophy, housing units or not. I think it is a very different situation intellectually and morally for the chairman of a party to say, I know this individual, he or she is qualified, and he or she shares our views because when you are making presidential appointments, a shared ideology and a shared viewpoint is a legitimate issue. When you're giving out units of housing, it is an irrelevancy. And so I thought your analogy there was, was an incorrect one. I don't think, sir. Would you permit me? Yes. I think that I was in the process of completing a statement, and I got to the word appointments, and that was not the end of my statement, and I didn't have an opportunity. No, I was referring back to an, origin, an earlier answer you gave to Mr. Lantos, but please continue. I was called on to do lots of things, whether it was arrange appointments, get people in to see people, uh, whether it was a White House visit, whether it was a, uh, a visit with HUD, or a visit with Farmers Home, or a visit with uh, whomever. And uh, the uh, only compensation that we got out of it was for the benefit of the party, and I was very thankful okay. if somebody saw uh, that um, what I had done for them was of value. But that's where I acquired my okay. experience and my knowledge said, of the but did people. You during that period in the mid-70s do anything like this? Did you get any units of housing for a, for a municipality? I mean, again, yes, sir. White House visits, uh, you, you did go to bat for municipalities to get housing units? Yes, sir. During that period? Not, you, not municipalities, but we used to help whenever we were called on, and I can't recall right off the top of my head, but uh, I certainly would help people who had an interest. Mm -hmm. I would write letters in their behalf constantly. I understand that. On uh, and it was based on the fact that you were the party chairman, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Well, that's the point. It is one thing, while you were party chairman, to be responding in many of these things wholly legitimately, uh, 
But when you were no longer party chairman, you were the natural committee, you're now doing it uh, in a somewhat different context. It Excuse seems to me. me. You're not, yes. Again, from the period of 1980 to 1984, I was not the national committee man, nor was I the state right. chairman. Once you became national committee man, did your lobbying business drop off? As a matter of fact, my lobbying business increased. As a result of your being national committee man? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that. Um, did you become smarter as a result of being national committee man? Were you more persuasive? Did you know more facts? Why did your lobbying business increase as a result of becoming national committee man? I, I'm very happy to say, sir, that I, I'm, I hope I became smarter, not as a result of becoming the national committee man, but as a result of uh, the years of experience right, and the that's in not intervening point, three oh, years. No, no, no. That's not what you, you said as a result of your becoming national committee man, or uh, let me be explicit. You said, consequent to your becoming, subsequent to your becoming national committee and your business increase. I, and I, I think you have acknowledged the point that you were. You asked me if I became smarter. You asked yes. me if I became smarter. And not, not at that moment, I don't think that was the reason. I think the reason was that you became national committee man and you were seen as having more influence. When you lobbied people like Debbie Dean or Maurice Barksdale, were you making the argument that these units were more necessary than other units elsewhere in the country? What were the kind of arguments you used? I'm sure glad that you asked that question. Because, you know, in not one single solitary project that I have worked on in a housing situation for any of these developers, and that is the real question, not what I did for Jacksonville. What, why is it the developers the real question and not Jacksonville? Well, because that seems to be the thrust of uh, where this hearing uh, is, is paying more attention than to me as a uh, consultant for the city of Jacksonville. It was in that context that I'm in it. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the feeling that, uh, oh, she was. Well, we, we were talking about the basis on which you made these representations. And you said that in, in every single housing project that you had lobbied for on behalf of a developer, I got him. Okay. Was a worthy one. In the case of Savannah, they'd never had one before. In the case of uh, Lufkin, Texas, um, my understanding is they had never had one before. The developer that I had uh, was working with has never defaulted on a on a claim. There's never been an insured deal. There's never been a co-insured deal. And, uh, well, and well, well, yes. were you lobbying in the co-insurance program? Absolutely not. Well, let me say, Mr. Hill, the fact that nobody offered you co-insurance in a program for which that is not a legal possibility doesn't seem to me terribly remarkable. I mean, I'm not surprised there was no co-insurance. Uh, these are not the co-insurance programs. We're talking about subsidized housing. But some of those things creep into it sometimes. I mean, there can be others. And I was just trying to point out that the people that I have worked with have gone into situations where, in, in, it's my understanding, in, in, Lufkin, in Lufkin, Texas, uh, there hadn't been a subsidized housing unit in, in right. that part of the state by well, anybody. Let me ask you this, Mr. Chairman. This is the problem I have. It seems pretty clear you had not until you were in your late 50s begun to do this professionally. It seems very clear from the facts that it was because you were first the chairman and then your business, you said, increased as a result of being the national committee man. And what you did was to go to people, and political influence was obviously a part of it, uh, and you get paid for that. Uh, does this seem to you a good way for us to run the system? Would we not be better off if these could be more on the merits and less on the basis of a developer hiring someone who is politically well connected or whatever administration? Absolutely and without a question. There's only one thing wrong, sir. This is Washington. Everybody that knows anything about Washington and how things go on inside the Beltway know the great difficulty it is because number one you can never depend on the law to stay the same from one period to another a la the iran contra but what what about mod rehab what changes in the law what changes in the law occurred in the mod rehab program during the period when you were uh, making your expertise in it available to people what the sro program for one but that's not the mod rehab program it's a separate program it's a new program uh, to talk about to a argue. no excuse me mr teller you're wrong. And I will tell you that for someone like yourself, who has done very well selling his political influence, to come up here and tell me that this is the way Washington is 
and to make the kind of implications you have about inside the Beltway, you've done very well commuting across the Beltway. And I think, frankly, that the HUD employees who have been full-time living inside the Beltway do not deserve to have the kind of questioning that you have engaged in. I think they have been as honorable and as reasonable and as thoughtful and as diligent as it can be. And I do not think that this is a case where those of you who have used the Beltway as a way to come back and forth and make money have a right to make those suggestions. And as far as changes in the law, no, the Mod Rehab Program, other than abolishing the fair share thing, I don't believe there were very many changes in the law. So that suggestion, that that's why they needed you to uh, come and lobby, I think is wrong. You may not have been in the room, sir. But I think earlier on, I gave a great deal of credit to the career employee of HUD. I, had, I have great respect uh, for some of those people and that I worked with very diligently and who were patient with me in helping see to it that the types of information that they needed for some of the things that we were trying to accomplish uh, were put on the table so that they can consider them. You take a mod, uh, 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 the demolition project that we worked on, three and a half years. Three and a half years. The project in Savannah, the mod rehab, three years. What years were these? In the case of the mod rehab? Yes. From 83 to 87. And the demolition project? <laughs> from 1982 until uh, March of this year. Thank you. I just would want to get on the record that we were talking about the Reagan administration, which announced that it was going to cut through red tape and uh, cut through all the bureaucracy, and she's telling us that it was so dysfunctional. But with the mod rehab situation, uh, you don't have in most of those cases that kind of complication. You do have a knack, sir. I didn't, I didn't say that th it was up here in Washington. I just said it was oh, a Where was all this red tape it, it happening? Had, in, you said in inside case, the Beltway. Wait a minute. You said inside the Beltway. Was it going on in, in Chevy Chase? <laughs> was, it in, was it in Old Town? And I, I mean, where, where inside the Beltway was it if it wasn't in Washington? Mr. Frank, I have a great deal of respect for you, sir, and I, I greatly admire your, um, Why your do I feel like you hold my wallet, Mr. Taylor, at this moment? <laughs> I, I greatly admire your use of the English language, and, but uh, I don't think that uh, taking uh, these things and... English language is Mr. Frank's native tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, well, that's, a, that's a good point, Mr. Chairman. Uh, was that a unanimous consent request, or was that just... <laughs> But uh, taking things from one conversation, moving over to another conversation, then trying to get them, put them together, uh, I don't think is, is being quite fair. And uh, I would respectfully request, sir, that, if, uh, you know, don't confuse me. I'm, I'm not confusing you, Mr. Taylor. Let <laughs> I'm me afraid say, you are. No, let me say, I'm taking what you said. You were the one who said that someone like you, who started a new career in, in your late 50s as a political lobbyist after having been the Republican chairman and, and had that career enhanced when you became the Republican National Committeeman. You made some references to Inside the Beltway and you then said it was necessary because of two instances you gave of incredible tangles in HUD. Now you said that that's why they had to hire you to come in here. And I was pointing out that this is a, a HUD ruled by an administration that said it was going to cut red tape. And I, I don't understand how I distorted anything you said whatsoever. Frankly, I think sometimes people say things that don't like the implications of it. You them. restated it very well. Well, that's what I said in the first place, and we agree on that, and that's the, that's the, the, the restatement, uh, yes, sir. That's exactly what I said in the first instance. I apologize if you uh, misunderstood me or if I was unclear. My point is that uh, you were hired, obviously, for political influence, and if we did not have to have that, if we had more on the merits, and I realize there'll always be some, uh, the programs would work uh, much better. I couldn't disagree with that in the slightest, and I'll never forget one time my mayor, Mayor Godbow was up here in Jacksonville and our senator said, Senator, uh, no, the senator said, Mayor, why do, why do you... Uh, Which senator was this? Hawkins. Says, uh, Senator, why do you uh, feel that you need a, a, a lobbyist, a Washington consultant, uh, uh, when you have me? I'd be happy. My office is or at your service. And our mayor said something like this. I wasn't there, but I, he told me about it later on. I'll paraphrase it. He said, well, Senator, I really do appreciate that, and I know that you are sincere.
But Florida is a large state, and your offices have lots of responsibilities, both in, in the state and in Washington. And you have a large number of cities that would be applying to you. And, and I can only say this. I have Mr. Taylor because when I want something, I want Mr. Taylor to pay particular attention to me and to move when I want it done. And that became the word with the mayor of Jacksonville as to why he wanted not only me, but my predecessor and my successor. I understand that, and that's the problem. He wanted you not because of any housing expertise, not because of any prior Washington expertise, but because as a former Republican chairman and later as a national committee man, you had a degree of influence with the high policymakers that other people didn't have. And that is an element of our system which is always present in this set of circumstances, seems to me quite clear to have gone far beyond what it should have been. And you were a very willing participant in that. That, I think, is the absolutely perfect relevance of the chairman's mentioning your use of the Republican National Committee stationery. And it is further confirmation that we had a program sadly out of date, because people ought to understand. When you receive 10 percent of the equity plus a small amount of cash in the Angelina project, when for 86 units your compensation is in the neighborhood of $400,000, assuming it works well, and that's why one invests. That's money that's taken away either from the taxpayers or from the program over any longer term. And it's just further confirmation of the uh, bad situation we're in. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Congressman Shays. Mr. Taylor. You started out as an insurance salesman. You were a chairman of the Republican Party. You were a national Republican committee member and still are, I think? Yes, sir. Yeah. I heard you were not pleased to be invited to, to this committee, and uh, it, it seemed to be confirmed by um, your bringing up a letter from this committee, which seemed to me to be extraordinarily irrelevant, but it just seemed to, uh, to, to confirm uh, your feeling that, you know, why am I even here? I found myself feeling the same way at first before you testified. I found myself saying, well, with all the people we can invite, why did we invite you? And I know now why we invited you. Tell me. Uh, you were not a relatively small player in this scandal at HUD. You were a major player in this scandal at HUD. And I just want to ask you, you've been asked before, how often did you use your party to win contracts and to make money. Did you only use your national Republican stationery twice? Are these the only two letters? Or if we look in the file, are we going to find more? I don't know how to answer that, Congressman. Uh, I, I let, me, let me just help you. Okay. The question is very simple. Did you, you, did you use stationery like this more than twice? Absolutely. Did you use it more than 100 times? I don't really know. The bottom line is you used it so much you don't even know. Isn't that correct? I have no <laughs> recollection. Okay. You said to us that you were in charge of a company, and it was a company of one. You talked in terms of the king and we and so on, but it basically was you. No, sir. It wasn't you? No, sir. I have other associates. The, the uh, I want to ask you, who are your associates in this business? I want you to give me the name of your business, and I want to know who your associates are. I have. Uh, organize my company on the basis of when I needed assistance in Washington, uh, I would call on a number of people depending on and would associate with them on a particular case. Uh, it, we, they were not a part of a formal Well, let's back up a second. Organization. And, and I want you to be very precise. Yes, sir. Okay. You have a company of one person, and that's you. Is that yes, not correct? That's correct. So isn't the answer to my question, I have a company, and the, and the name of my company is what? Bill Taylor. It's not the Republican National Committee. That's correct. What is the name of your company? Bill Taylor and Associates, Inc. Okay. Now, in Bill Taylor and Associates, Inc., how many people are part of this? Yourself? In the incorporated sense, two, my wife and myself. Now, that's the answer you could have given in the beginning, and we could get on to other things. There are two people, uh, yourself and your wife. Why, when you communicated with the government, when you used this, Dear Debbie, uh, why didn't you always use your 
the name of your company. Why would you ever, ever use the Republican National Committee when you're doing business with government? What is the date on that letter, sir? Well, you've got uh, which letter? Uh, the one you just referred to. Does I, it really I, even matter? Only in the sense of the word that at the point where I didn't know who Deborah Dean was, uh, it, it would have made a sense. After, uh, after I became acquainted with her, uh, she knew who I was. I did not use the National Committee stationery on she or anyone else. Okay, so until she knew who you were, you would use the National uh, Republican stationery. Then when they knew who you were, then you would use your own business stationery. Yes, sir. Do you realize what an outrageous statement that is that you just made? Do you have any comprehension of what you just said? Do you? What you're saying is, I had a private business like anybody else, but I didn't want to use the private business stationery. I wanted to make sure I capitalized on my position as a member of a party, and until they got the message, then, then I'd go to the old stationery, my own business stationery. And you don't have a problem with that? Maybe I should have, sir, but uh, I didn't. And I, I don't, don't uh, I wouldn't say that in the future that, uh, uh, that I wouldn't do it exactly the same way. I've written to the White House on my National Committee stationery. I've written to uh, you know, let, let, Congressman. I'm going to interrupt you a second, sir. And we're going to be here a long time, I think, because you've got a lot on the record here we've got to clarify. All right, sir. And so I'm not going to be in any rush, but I just want you to answer the questions. And I also want to make sure that you don't perjure yourself, sir, because this committee is going to get no satisfaction out of having someone perjure themselves. We're just really trying to know where the problem is, what we do to clean up the problem, and go on. Um, and I just say that to you because as, I'm, as you made your comments, you basically said, I asked, you know, how often did you use uh, Republican National Committee stationery? And you said a few times, uh, maybe 100, I can't say. Well, more than you could even remember. And there, I'm getting all these papers from the National Republican Committee dated all these different dates. When did you meet Deborah Gord Dean? I'm trying to reconstruct that. And I don't, um, I did not know Deborah Dean until she uh, was uh, long in the position of assistant to the secretary, uh, his executive Did assistant. you know her before 1986? And I just really uh, before, caution you, before 1986. Well, I have a letter here. To answer the question, sir. Did you know her before 1986? And you're under oath. I understand that, sir. Um, I'm unable to say I ha apparently had met her sometime during 1986. You said before 1986. And I don't know what time when she took office, but it was a period I would answer the question, I knew her after she became the executive assistant to the secretary. Isn't it true you knew her in 1984 and 1985? I have no recollection. My understanding is, is what I just stated, that I did not know Deborah Dean until, she, what, until after she was the executive assistant to um, the secretary. She became an executive assistant, I think, in 1984. So is your testimony that you knew her in 1984? June 1984. I met Deborah Dean after she became the executive assistant to the secretary, okay. Pierce. So is your testimony now that you knew her in 1984? Uh, apparently, I did. OK. So le letters to Dear Debbie. Now, your testimony before this committee is that once they knew who, that you were an important person in the Republican Party, you, you no longer use that. Uh, as stationary, you then used your professional stationary, which is Bill Teller and Associates, Corporate and Government Three. Um, that's your testimony, and it's under oath. And yet, I see letters here, April 14, 1987, uh, right here. It says, "Subject: Rental Rehab Housing Vouchers." Um, March 26, 1987. Here is a letter that you asked for from Savannah. Thank you. In, you know, 1987. November 86, um, dear Debbie, thank you so much for the time you spent with me looking into some of the problems we've had on the subject of 202 project. 
So you were using your stationery even after the new. It's almost irrelevant, except for, the fa except for the fact that you said that you didn't do that. I have erred. So the bottom line is, and let me say something to you, sir. I'm a Republican, you're a Republican, and I wish you were a Democrat, because I am embarrassed. I mean this with all my heart and soul, sir. I am embarrassed that people like yourself who others are supported. Others gave you that position. You were elected to that position. You represented your party. And instead of just representing your party, you cashed in on your party. And a lot of good people put you in that position. And you were very, very willing to use this stationery to win a lot of money and to earn a lot of money. Do you think it was wrong to use this stationery? Perhaps in retrospect, sir, it, it, uh, and some people would find that I should not, and I certainly can understand the distinction between the two. At the time I did it, obviously, uh, I saw nothing wrong with it. Let me ask the question differently. It, the fact is, and it's so clear, that you used the stationery because you knew that would open some doors for you. Isn't that correct? Probably. Why do you say probably? Because I don't sometimes in the... No, in I mean, the let me just say it this way. You had a choice of using your, your business stationery, and you had your choice of using your Republican National Committee stationery, which is not connected to your business at all. It's connected with your job as an official for the Republican Party. And you made a decision to use this. Why? Somet sometimes that was true and sometimes not true. I would say sometimes it would be a secretary's... Uh, feeling that it might have gotten out of the office on the basis of uh, uh, the secretary feeling that it would go out on, on uh, this particular type of stationery, and I didn't even make a choice on it. I'm not trying to shift the responsibility to my secretary. I assume the responsibility of everything I signed, and I recognize that. So, but uh, that's, that's just much as I can comment on that, sir. It seems to me that we've been a little imprecise in what we expect from you, sir. Uh, you made a casual statement. You might have had 100 projects that you were either involved with or you were a consultant. And another time, I heard 50. Um, if you had so much involvement with HUD, why would you be surprised that you're involved here today? Why? why I mean, it seems to me that uh, it's kind of obvious. I think, sir, if we go back and I, I, I'll answer it in the context in which I answered that question was my total experience in dealing with HUD as it applied to my total involvement, that is, with the city of Jacksonville and with these uh, two developers. Uh, to say how many projects I was involved with with HUD through the city of Jacksonville, it would um, uh, be no way to answer that. Well, let's take the city of Jacksonville out and how many projects were you involved with, with HUD? Four. So your testimony is... Uh, uh, the four that these... That the committee? I don't want you to answer too quickly, sir, because um, uh, we are going to go back over all these projects and it just seems to me that you better be very precise on it. Sure, I understand okay. that. So your testimony is that you had uh, uh, tens of projects w with the city of Jacksonville, uh, but, um, and on both sides of it. In other words, you were paid as a consultant, but you were also, uh, you were also paid uh, by the developer as well. Uh, and you're then saying you had four projects outside of the city of Savannah. In the Section 8 Mod Rehab? No, 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 no. I didn't just say Section 8 Mod Rehab. I'll talk UDAGs, I'll talk any project. Okay. Is your testimony that you only had four projects with HUD? No, no, not outside of Savannah. I mean, outside of Jacksonville. Let me say it again, very slowly. I'll say it slowly. You can take your time to answer it. At one time, you said you had hundreds of projects. Uh, uh, may have you know, term 50. I ask a question. Uh, I'd like you to be candid with us. Uh, and so we don't have to pry and then find out. I mean, the prying is when you say things like, you know, I, ha I had an investment in the project, and so we think you have an investment in a project, and then we find out, as Chairman Lantos asked you a question, you had $100. That's a joke. 
And that, that's an attempt to deceive the committee, it seems to me. What I want to know is, outside of Savannah, how many projects did, did you have with HUD, whether they were uh, UDAGs, uh, whether they were um, mod rehab, whatever? 202, you know, whatever Just they were. One moment. It shouldn't take you that long, though, because you didn't have many, right? That's correct. Okay. There was a 202. Uh, don't, uh, are you thinking of, I want to know where it was and, and so on. There was a 202 elderly in uh, Jacksonville. There was, um, there's one that's ongoing uh, that, um, the Jacksonville is, uh, how much money are we talking about? I really don't know that, sir. How much are you, are, are you being there paid? Were, there paid? were, are you being paid by the city on this? Or are you being paid by an outside developer? Or what this was by an outside developer. Okay, how much is the outside developer paying you and who is the outside developer? It was the Catholic the Diocese of St. Augustine. Okay. $20,000. Okay. What's another project, sir? Uh, there's one that is uh, that I'm associated with uh, with a law firm in uh, Texas. Uh, it's a workout, uh, purely a workout. Texas is a big state. Where in Texas? Cedar Hills, I think it is. It's, it's a project called Royal Arms Two. And, and pardon me? Royal Arms Two. And what kind of project is that? It's a it's a project that is in distress and is in the, right on the verge of being foreclosed, and uh, we uh, were retained to come in there and work with HUD in a in a workout situation, seeing if we could keep it from going into foreclosure by doing some um, matters that they would. Uh, find acceptable to it. I, I, are you speaking in tongues with me? What, what kind of project, what kind of assistance, financial assistance are you looking for? Is it, is it, is it a public housing project? Is it a, owned by a private developer? It's, it's, a, it's owned by a private developer. Okay. What's the de developer's name? Um, Royal Arms 2 is the name of the project. The, okay. the developer as, uh, that I'm dealing with, is a, and I don't know all of them, is a uh, Mike Badger, and his associate is uh, Bruce Gruel, G R E W E L L. That may be, but I don't know what the the full partnership name. What is the contact price that you're working with them? Uh, total is uh, sixty thousand dollars. So you're charging them sixty thousand. Between the two of us, yes, sir. I'm sorry, between, you're working with someone else, who the other person is? Uh, Mr. Carter Sanders, an attorney. Okay. Um, what other projects? Yes, happy to. Just one question, which the No, happy to ask, you. Which I think, what type of project was it? What government program yeah, was it? Thank you for following that. Was it a workout, you said it was a workout, a workout of what? That's really the part of the legal side of the thing no, that no, I'm... No, no, no. If you're getting any kind of, if you have any knowledge of, if you're doing any work other than pushing a button and getting someone to see somebody, you will know what type of project it is. That's not legal, whether it's 202, senior citizen housing, whether it's mod rehab, section eight. We're trying to keep it from going into foreclosure through the workout and getting them uh, to... Uh, I know it, but what is the governmental what, what, under what program did the government send money to this project originally? It was partially uh, uh, Section 8 Mod Rehab for half of the project, and half of it is, uh, is regular uh, uh, private uh, financed, unsubsidized. 100 units, 50 of them are subsidized, and 50 are not, and the thing is not funding itself, and so it's going down the hill, going down the tube. Yeah, I'm not familiar. Were these two separate projects or one project? Was one project as a whole? Yes, sir. And the government said they'll fund 50 if the developer will oh, no. private? 
no, privately no. building no, 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 no. I, I, no, I hope the ahead. gentleman no, doesn't mind. No, I'm delighted. Please pursue it. <laughs> the, the, the part that I know is that the, this is an existing project in the Dallas area. Uh, when it, the project was new, or when it was started, it had 50 units, or approximately, yeah, I think it was 50 units, uh, subsidized housing. Right. Mod and Rehab Section 8. That's my understanding. They had 50 units that were not subsidized at all. It was private financed in, in toto and had fair market rate rents, whatever they were for the entire project. The project got into trouble because, as I understand it, that uh, there were difficulty in mixing people who were being subsidized with people who were paying the fair market rent. There was one bank loan to the whole project? Is that what you're saying? Who's foreclosing on it? HUD. Well, they can only foreclose on the 50 units that are subsidized, right? This is not an 80-20 or a HODAG. There are other programs where the government funds the whole thing and only a certain number of the units are subsidized. Mr. Schimmer, you are, are into an area that I really don't know anything yeah. about, and uh, I could get you the answer yeah, for I, it. But that's what I'm afraid of, that we're into an area you don't know that much about. I mean, doesn't it strike you, and I'll just make this point and yield back my time, that if you're being hired for your expertise in housing, that you would know the rudiments of how the program worked? This reflects back, sir, to an earlier conversation that Mr. Shays and I had about Bill Taylor and Associates. It was a part of the answer that I tried to give at that time. And when I found myself uh, into situations that I had no expertise, uh, I very frequently would call in, in this particular case, an attorney. And he is in the case with me, and uh, he is, uh, I am paying him uh, 50% of whatever we get. We have been compensated. We've been advanced $12,000. And when we get a satisfactory workout, if we ever get a satisfactory workout, we will get the balance. Mr. Uh, Taylor, I would fee. suggest to you that knowing the type of program and how it works is not the domain of an attorney, but is the domain of a housing consultant. And if you were doing anything other than the rawest form of influence peddling, you would know how the program, the rudiments of the program works. That's, uh, that's just my, I mean, I, I'd be happy to let you respond. That's my last question. Mr. Schirmer, um, I can only say, I'll, I'll state for the record uh, exactly what I said before. Uh, I was brought in. Uh, it, we soon found out that there were, were matters that I did not have expertise in, the legal side. I brought in uh, uh, an associate, and uh, frankly, he is, to this point, doing practically all the work. What are you being paid for? Originally, I was being paid because the guy asked me to, uh, to work on the case uh, for him, and, to, um, and then I brought it in, and I'm, for the same fee, we are uh, sharing, uh, sharing this uh, fee. He's going to receive 50 percent, and the contract is with Bill Taylor and Associates. But you're not being paid for doing any substantive work other than finding someone else who knew how to do it. At this point, I have done very little. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Taylor, you hired someone who knew what he was doing, R. Carter Sanders. Saunders, I guess is the way I say his name. Sanders. R. Carter Sanders, Jr. Isn't it true he was a former HUD employee? Yes, sir. Okay. That's where I met him. Oh, you keep saying things. <laughs> Tell me how you met him. In, 19, um, in 1983, 1983, I think it was, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Field Operations. Mm -hmm. And uh, he showed up in Jacksonville. Uh, I had already alluded to the fact that the Housing Authority in Jacksonville was in very severe trouble. Uh, he came down there to, uh, at the direction of uh, HUD Central, to uh, investigate uh, what uh, was going on, what needed to be, 
what additional information needed to be provided uh, to HUD Central in order for us to start the work on um, some type of uh, relief of the situation. So is it your testimony that, that um, R. Carter S Sanders, Jr. Uh, helped you get some of the projects through you needed to get through when he was at HUD? Oh, no. That's not what I suggested at all. Well, that's what you said to me. You had some problems. Let me restate it then, sir, if, okay. I, if I did. He was in there in an investigatory role on behalf of the field operation to find out what was going on in the Jacksonville HUD operation that he could recommend to his people in, that he was responsible to in Washington uh, as to what kind of recommendations need to be considered in order to bring Jacksonville from being a distressed uh, housing authority. They had been ignored and... Um, you were on retainer for Jacksonville, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And we've already established that you made a significant amount of money in Jacksonville. He came down and basically saw things the way you saw things. Is that not correct? I don't think that I would characterize it that way at all. I'd never met the man before. He flew in to Jacksonville. He was in there for a No, no, you, of, you a told me, hours. sir, you told me you met him when he came down and you Precisely. developed a relationship with him. I didn't say that, sir. You didn't develop a relationship. You I don't, didn't. I when did, did you develop a relationship with this gentleman? After he left HUD okay. and formed his own private law practice. And how many different times have you worked with him? We've attempted to work together on several, but uh, this is the only one that we have ever had under contract. You know, I almost hope we don't have another witness coming in today. Uh, you say several. I'm going to come back to having you go back through these projects, but how many projects have you worked with, with Mr. Sanders? One. You said several, and now you've worked with one. No, you misunderstood me. I sure did. When I said we've had several opportunities, right? none of them ever came to fruition. Would you define what you mean by opportunity? Where somebody wanted to know um, uh, if there was any help. Uh, for instance, I'm thinking of uh, one situation. Uh, the guy ha had heard some place of a section of a Title X program, and um, we uh, advised him that, number one, uh, this was not a viable program. Number two, we advised him that his project uh, would not qualify for one, and that was, that we can, was where we it can ended. We save a lot of time here. Is this the only time that you've had any financial dealings with Mr. Sanders? Yes, sir. Okay. Only time. Okay. Do you have any in the works? The one that I mentioned that is ongoing. Okay. Now, let's go back. Uh, just to the 202 pro project in Jacksonville, uh, that you made $20,000. How many units are we talking about? Were, were there units? What was the number? What were we talking about? How much money was the total 20, project? I think there were 88 units. Okay. And you're talking, the second project was in Texas and Royal Arms, you said? Yes, sir. And you said that was 50 units, 100 units total, 50 units of federal involvement? I didn't say th that's the workout. There were no, um, uh, there were no, no mod rehab, that, that was not one that had uh, involvement of uh, mod rehab uh, units in it. Uh, if, of course, if in the workout, if, if in order to make it a, a feasible project, um, if we could have gotten some Section 8 mod rehab someplace along the line, uh, it would have made it more viable, but uh, that was not a condition. The workout was the problem. Let's get you back on the projects. What, what's the next project? Give me two. You know, and the important thing is that you remember them all because one or two witnesses have left out and then they've had to come back a second time. And I understand that. Okay. There's been so few of them that, let's see. Again, I've had some conversations with some people uh, over in Alabama about a UDAG but it never, did, it never did get off the ground, even to the point where we had a, a signed agreement. I had a visit with him. I've talked of that type of thing uh, a number of times. So you've had a number of times and you've considered going into a project, but it's never gotten to the point where you've written to, okay, how many, how many projects 
uh, have you been involved in where you've actually had to contact HUD officials outside of Jacksonville, uh, where you have been hired as a consultant outside your retainer fee? State that one more time, sir. Yeah. Let me state it this way. I am interested in any project that you've been involved in uh, that you have received financial uh, benefit whether it is in terms of a payment to you or into equity into a facility, separate from uh, where you've been under a con so-called contingency fee. I understand you've been under a contingency fee, but you've had certain projects, or even for Jacksonville, you've been paid on both sides. Been paid by the city as a contingency and you've made money as a consultant. I want to know any time you've made money as a consultant, how many projects? So far, you've given me two. Do you have any others? Two besides? You've given me two so far. You've given me the 202 in Jacksonville, and you've given me the, the Texas project. Well, then you have Chatham. Chatham, correct. And Savannah. Yeah. And there were two contracts there, both of them for 25000 and in the case of uh, Savannah, they also, because of this ridiculous uh, fee, uh, he, he came back and, and gave me an additional 5000 because it took uh, so much more time. So that's uh, Angelina in Texas, two in Savannah, me on the same project. Mm -hmm. And, and again, we're talking how many units in the both the, the ones in Savannah? How many 147 yeah. and 50. Okay. So basically you're saying you had 88 units in Jacksonville, you had uh, 197 ultimately in, in Savannah, and you had uh, whatever the arrangement is, as you call it, the working out in Texas. Any others? The The... The SRO, if that is to be considered as a part of, um, uh, oh, you're not asking the mod rehab, but uh, SRO as. Wait a, wait a second. I'm not asking what? What did you say? I'm asking any HUD project. That, any that, okay. I, I, I was, I was t confusing it with mod rehab when I said, when I started that, I had that running through my mind. The SRO program is a part of HUD, yeah. and that should be included in the okay. list. Okay, and, and that is? Where? Uh, sir? The SRO project is... When you say SRO, what are you referring uh, to? Single room occupancy, the McKinney Act. Um, right, but... <laughs> that was for 109 units. Yeah. For which I received $35,000. Slow down. Okay, you received how much? 35000 And that was where again? Jacksonville. Okay. And that's, that's where you were both sides. You were representing the city. They were paying you and you were getting money as and well. Representing the okay. developer, yes. So now we have five projects, is that correct? Any others? When, uh, what was the date of the Jackson project, this, the, the 109? <coughs> Forget the dates right now. Any other projects? It's in January of 88, I think. Yeah. Any other projects? Um, None except that I can recall, except for um, uh, the city of Jacksonville. Now, None for which I received any compensation. Okay. Other. So basically, you've received compensation for five projects. That, that's the best that of is, my recollection. That is your testimony. That's the base. Okay. The best of my recollection. And yesterday. then, when you talk about fifty projects or so, uh, this very sweeping kind of generality, you. Um, you are saying it's your testimony that they were in Jacksonville and you were you were paid on the contingency basis. No, sir. Contingency? No, sir. That not, was not for and by the city My of apology. Jacksonville. I did not mean contingency. You were on a retainer. Yes, sir. Okay. An annual retainer. An annual flat amount. Um, I'm going to, in a second, uh, um, defer some of my questions and let my colleagues wait a while, but then I'd like to come back. But I just want to ask, start on a list that I'm going to go through. Did you have any contact with Samuel Pierce? The only contact that I've had with Mr. Pierce was either by letter. Hold on. Using the stationery? I would assume so. 
Why would you assume so? Because I haven't seen the letter and I don't know it. I'm not, I'm not going to deny that I didn't. I'm okay. not saying that I did. In fact, right, on July 14, 1986, you wrote a letter to Mr. Pierce with your Re Republican National Committee stationery. So, what was the subject on, sir? Uh, this one was Virat uh, Villas, and I am pleased to uh, call to your attention an application that is being submitted for a 202 project in Austin, Florida. In where, sir? August uh, August St. Augustine? Yes, yeah, St. Augustine. Is that a, a project that you told me about already? That should have been included in the, in the Archbishop, the, the, in the Diocese of St. Augustine. I, I, I did overlook that. That was never funded, and I, I, I received a retainer, and that was as far as it went. What was the retainer that you received? $5,000. Okay. So you thought it was important to write the Secretary of State and Republican National Committee stationary, let them know about a particular project. Um, I think I wrote the Secretary of HUD. Yeah. Secretary of HUD. I'm sorry, what did I say? Sorry. Um, Thank you. L did you have any contact with Lance Wilson? Never. Do you know who he is? I knew who he was. Okay. I, but you never wrote to him. You've written to... I've never shaken his hand to my knowledge. De Deborah Gordine, you've, uh, we've established the fact that uh, you knew her. When did you meet her again? Sometime after she became uh, executive assistant in 84. to the okay. secretary. Tom Casey, who uh, uh, took her place, have you had any contact with him? No, sir. Okay. Philip Wynn? I knew Phil Wynn as the state chairman uh, of Colorado. Uh, I never had any experience uh, with him, no, sir. You never wrote to him at HUD? I'm not going to say that I didn't write to him at HUD, but I, I did not ever... Uh, have any experience where I sat down with him and we had a discussion about any program or project? No, sir. Just going to ask you a few people and then I'll give to my colleague and come back. Uh, Maurice Barksdale? I have met Mr. Barksdale. We have, uh, I have written to him. On this stationery as well? Probably. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, continue. Uh, what kind of contact have you had with him? As a matter of fact, I have very little contact with him. It was uh, people in his office, generally, that uh, I dealt with. Who in his office? They changed quite a bit, and I don't recall if uh, Shirley, um, I mean, um, a, a Miss Weist, W-E-I-S-T, uh, a Marjorie Arst, A-R-S-T, um, but again, it comes back to the, the statement that I made earlier. In my role as a consultant to the city of Jacksonville, I had numerous contacts with all these individuals in many of these offices. And uh, to identify uh, on which occasion that I talk about this or talk about that, uh, it would be impossible because I don't have any notes uh, that would reflect that. But you could say safely, I think, that um, I talked to numbers and numbers of people, not only through the rotating, rotation of the... Of no, the I, I think it's fairly clear you're talking to a lot of people. Let me just ask you about two more people here. Hunter Cushing? Had no experience with Hunter Cushing at all. Okay. Now, um, you named uh, a person Weist. It's Abby Weist. Abby a Weist, that's right. A-B-B-I-E-W-E-I-S-T. Yes. Would you explain to me, uh, the IG contacted a number of, of public housing authorities, and they wanted, uh, the project that they were talking about was the Chatham Apartments. And the question was, was your agency approached by the developer, consultant, or any other party prior to the awarding, award of units for this project? And the person's name is Abby Weist. Why would Abby's name be there? Did you contact her? I saw that in the paper. That's where I happened to have... Well, uh, you brought up her name. I know it, and that's yeah. why I did, because uh, uh, I, I must have talked to her at some point along the line, and I seem to recall Abby Weist 
as I do this lady by the name of Marjorie Arst. Uh, but I really don't know why uh, she was quoted in one newspaper as saying that uh, she had called to the city uh, HUD director in uh, Savannah and said that he should apply or that he had the units coming or something like that. And that he, I guess that's what it was, that he should apply. And that, uh, and, and why that occurred is more than I know anything about. I, I don't, what do you mean it's more than you know anything about? I why understand. she would have, what her role was that would have suggested that. Uh, are you having, are you, is your testimony that she had no conversations with you about this project? I'm not suggesting that at all because well, I don't have any rec but I don't have any recollection of it. I'm assuming it's your testimony that you never discussed with Abby Weist anything to do with the Chatham apartment project. I'm not going to say that because it's it's entirely possible that I did, but I don't have any recollection of it. Who was your contact at HUD in, in regards to that project? If it wasn't Abby Weist. Marjorie Arst. Mm -hmm. um, she was, um, and I've forgotten what her title was, but she was one of the deputy assistants or uh, something in multifamily housing uh, that, because I really didn't deal with, uh, you know, the, 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 I dealt with the, uh, with the staffers. I dealt with the, uh, with the professional staff and with uh, some of the appointees. I very infrequently uh, would I meet with the assistant secretaries and uh, certainly the secretary. Would you be able to tell us why um, you had 50, we're talking about 50 units and uh, um, I, I will finish up with this area of questioning. It's a letter to, um, from the Housing Authority of Savannah, and it's to Mr. Tom Demery, and it's to the attention of Abby Wiest, I guess is the way I should say her name. Dear Mr. Demery, the Housing Authority of Savannah requests 50 units of Section 8 moderate rehabilitation. A favorable response to our request will considerably assist the Housing Authority's efforts to improve housing for the low-income people of Savannah. That's your project, is it not? I worked on it. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's not just someone saying, I mean, it's just uh, we have the, we have public housing authority making sure that she gets a copy of it. And it's your testimony that you had no conversations with her that you can recall. I did not say that, sir. That, I, that you didn't let me finish, that you could recall. I beg your pardon. Yes, sir. Okay. That's my Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will have some more questions later. Thank you, Congressman Chase. Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I'm going to have relatively few uh, questions because I think that the colleagues who preceded me, yourself and Mr. Shays especially, have done such a tremendous job of focusing in that uh, little needs to be added from me. But uh, let me ask you, um, uh, Mr. Taylor, the, um, I, we have a letter here dated February 13, 1987, which is addressed to uh, Ms. Deborah Dean, and it's a Dear Debbie letter. And the second paragraph has a provision that, that uh, I'd need some clarification from you. It says, in following up on, other, on another suggestion that you gave us concerning the vouchers, I'm enclosing copies of the letter that was sent to Tom Demery by the Jacksonville Department of HUD. We hope that you can move this along for us, perhaps with either a phone call or a recommendation to Tom Demery. We would certainly appreciate your cooperation, and we want to thank you for everything. Let me know if there's anything that you need from me. Now, without going into great detail about the underlying situation, because that's certainly not really what I want to focus on, uh, why would you have a copy of a letter that was sent to Tom Demery by the Jacksonville Department of HUD to begin with. Now, that, I assume that what you're talking about is the area or regional office of HUD located in Jacksonville, Florida. Is that correct? The regional office, no, sir. The regional office is located in Atlanta. Well, there's an, a HUD office in Jacksonville. There's a, there is a, there's a state office in Jacksonville. 
Excuse me? There is a state federal HUD office. In federal HUD office. Yes, it's sir. a federal. It's not, it was not a city office so that you wouldn't have gotten it as part of your, your work on behalf of Jacksonville. So the question is, why and how would you be getting the copy of a letter sent to Tom Demery, uh, who was one of the officials, I assume that he was the assistant secretary at that time of HUD, by the head of the uh, uh, Jacksonville Department of HUD? I can only assume, sir, back in the second, par as in the second line, in following up on another suggestion that you no, gave sir. us concerning no, the vouchers, I'm in the enclosing... First in the first paragraph, sir. Yes. I have two apologies to make to you. One, for not having written to you sooner to thank you for the time that you allowed Dick Bowers and me to visit you recently in the HUD. Dick Bowers is the manager for City HUD and was the, uh, is the director for City HUD uh, that is responsible for all these programs and the person to whom I directly report. Now, when you say city HUD, what, what do you mean? Who is, who are Unfortunately, you? I understand what your quandary is. And a lot no, of no, 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 please it. tell me what you mean city by HUD city HUD. is the division of the city of Jacksonville that deals with housing. Okay, so that, that's a city agency. It is not part of the federal department. Well, we always, yes, sir, that's correct. That's unfortunately and it leads to some confusion from time to time. Okay, so this is the city office. Yes, of sir. HUD. And Mr. Bowers is the director of that. The city office. Yes, sir. So I'm still asking you, how would you have a copy of a letter sent by the Jacksonville Department of HUD to Tom Demery? It would have come to me, I presume, through Mr. Bowers. Why would Mr. Bowers have access to the federal Department of HUD correspondence? I can only assume that uh, as a working relationship, they work very, very closely together and uh, providing each other information that he was copied on the thing and uh, he gave it to me. That's the only recollection that I would, I have no recollection of what it is, but that's, that's a no, he did it frequently, let me put it that way. He did, he did what frequently? He, he gave you copies of? of of correspondence between federal officials? Yes, sir. Because I was his, okay. I was his agent. You were what? I was, his, I was Dick Bowers. I was the city uh, consultant with whom Mr. Bowers worked constantly, daily. Yes, but I, what I still haven't established is why even the city uh, official for housing in Jacksonville would have access to correspondence between federal officials of HUD. Can you help me with that? May I read the second line in the second paragraph? Yep. I am enclosing copies of the letter that was sent to Tom Demery by the Jacksonville Department of HUD. Yes. Now, the Jacksonville Department of HUD is the department that Mr. Bowers heads up. Now, that, that, that's what thoroughly confuses me because you had just gotten through in the earliest part of our dialogue in telling me that the Jacksonville Department of HUD reference there refers to the federal office of HUD located in Jacksonville. I must have misunderstood the question, but uh, that's not what I intended. In reading this, it's very clear to me that it was a letter originated by Mr. Bowers for the, on behalf of the city uh, okay, now, of HUD. You, you've just gone through telling Mr. Shays how, what, what, what rare occasions it was that you dealt with or met with the Assistant Secretary or with, with Ms. Uh, Dean, that you did all of your work through the professionals at HUD, right? I you, said, remember, you remember telling that to, to Mr. Shays? Yes, sir. I did most of my, I did a lot of my work with the professional staff. Yes, sir. You were telling him most of it. You told him that you hardly ever did you meet with the, it was rare for you to meet with, with those other folks or to deal with those other folks. Now, here you are saying, we hope that you can move this along for us. This is to Deborah Dean, perhaps with either a phone call or a recommendation to Tom Demery. Yes, sir. Well, now, if in fact you were dealing with the professional, why would you need the intercession of Ms. Dean 
to make a telephone call or a recommendation to Tom Dunley. For information. Excuse me? For information. Information, hell. It says, we hope that you can move this along for us, perhaps with either a phone call or recommendation to Tom Demery. Now, that's not request for information. That's request for action, for expedited action. Isn't that so? I would certainly like to hope so, yes, sir. You have, you have the strangest use of language, Mr. Taylor, of any person that I, I've, I've hardly ever, I can recall anybody else who, who, whose use of the language is so flexible. Nothing seems to mean what you said it meant two seconds before. I'm sorry, sir. Well, you were telling us a moment ago that this is for the purpose of getting information. Yeah. And I challenged you on that and said this is really for expedited action. You say, I certainly hope so. How do you square that? I think the only thing I could comment, sir, I, I, I stand by the letter. Uh, I sent her a copy of, of some information that was coming up through channels. And uh, it uh, was coming through uh, the local office for federal HUD. It was coming through Atlanta. And it was going to wind up uh, in Washington eventually. And I sent her a copy of the letter in order that she would uh, be aware of it and that uh, uh, hopefully, she could, uh, by expressing some interest in the thing, not permit it to be uh, fallen through the cracks someplace. Because very, very often, uh, I would ask people to pay, you know, just to check up on something for me without asking them for any particular favor. You know, just the, can you tell me anything about it? I wanted her certainly to pay attention to this. You weren't asking her to check on it for you. You were telling her what to do. Well, that's, in, that's incumbent in the letter, yes, sir. You bet I would hope that she would do it, yes. But asking and receiving is a lot of difference. Well, what happened after that letter? I really don't know what this letter refers to. Well, you are having some, some issue with vouchers, rental vouchers. Isn't that correct, dealing with Jacksonville? That's what appeared to be the case, yes, sir. But we'd had that going on with the city of Jacksonville almost constantly, where we were seeking more vouchers, applying for more. Well, isn't there a situation where Jackson, where the where federal HUD was trying to change the rules and the regs regarding vouchers, was trying to close out certain voucher programs? I'm not familiar with what you're speaking of, sir. Well, probably the answer to that is yes. They were constantly changing something dealing with vouchers and the allotment. Here's a letter dated April 14, 1987, over your signature to Ms. Deborah Dean, subject rental rehab housing vouchers. Dear Debbie, it has come to my attention that there are some possible changes in the rental rehab housing vouchers that would have a negative effect on the city of Jacksonville's rental rehab program, which to date has been very successful if they were put in force. Now, does that refresh your recollection yes, at all? Sir. Are the two letters connected? the February 13, 1987 letter and the April 14, 1987 letter. They would, seem to deal with the same subject. I would tend to agree with you, and uh, I certainly wouldn't argue with the fact that they may well be dealing on the same subject because it was an ongoing thing. Uh, let me just to fill another gap. Uh, you're familiar with the fact that the request for housing units under moderate rehab is supposed to emanate from the housing authority of a particular locality or state. Is that correct? You're familiar with that requirement? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, in regard to the Savannah project, do you recall how you got involved with that particular uh, development? My recollection is that Mr. Willis, uh, uh, Willis was a was a developer, developer associate of yours. A developer, 
not yeah. an associate of mine. Right, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Willis, a developer in Jacksonville, who was originally from Savannah, uh, had some property, uh, had some units, uh, various types of uh, projects in uh, Savannah. Now, I don't know whether they were subsidized or not, but uh, he had an interest in developing uh, this old hospital and this nursing home up there. And uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, he went to the uh, housing people and asked them if they had any interest in this. And uh, at, at their point, uh, that point, they, they indicated that they'd never had any success. And uh, so then he came to me uh, subsequently and knowing what I'd been able to do in Jacksonville, uh, asked me if there was any way that I'd be willing to uh, assist him and uh, leading the way to find out how we could get some units to, to Savannah. And uh, we subsequently agreed. Well, do you, do you recall visiting in the company of Linwood Willis and his partner, Mr. Richard Collins, the executive director of the Savannah Housing Authority? I have on occasion, I think one occasion done that, yes, sir. And was that the occasion on which M Mr. Willis and you and Mr. Willis's partner told Mr. Collins that they had a couple of hundred units of mod rehab and wanted Collins to apply for it? I don't know how I could have told them a couple of hundred units. Um, uh, what did you tell them? I am not going to be able to to say I have no recollection of on that particular occasion. I, I, I do have one, uh, I have a recollection of visiting with Mr. Collins where uh, it was discussed about the uh, need for going ahead with the application. Uh, whether it was um, at that particular point, sir, I, I'm not I'm not able to really to answer. If you have information to the contrary, then well, we have testimony from Mr. Collins, who says that, in fact, you and Mr. Willis and a partner of Mr. Willis went to him and told him that you had a couple of hundred units of mod rehab and wanted Collins to apply for it. Now, would you dispute that? Uh, I would, on that condition, yes, I would dispute that. OK. Um, my recollection is different than that. Listen, it's your testimony. Uh, let me ask you, uh, if you're still the uh, Republican National Committeeman from Florida. I am. And after the situation that occurred relating to the conflict of interest charge, in which you were fined $5,000 on a UDAG. I think we have cleared that up, sir. No, there no, we no haven't fine. cleared that up. There any, was no fine, up. sir. Pardon? There was no fine. There was no fine? Precisely, sir. Isn't it a fact that you were charged $5,000 for court costs? $5,000 for court costs, yes, sir. And isn't it a fact that the disposition was that the judge trying the matter withheld adjudication of guilt, but said that the factual basis to supporting, support a finding guilty was there, but was not entered. Isn't that the way that it was disposed of? No, sir. No, it's not my recollection. It's not, it's, it's not uh, what's in the record in Jacksonville, no, sir. Because that's the state attorney's recollection. You dispute that. I would only, I would stand, sir, on the on the record as it was filed with the court. And was there any question raised by the Republican uh, state organization as to your continued representation as the Republican National Committeeman after that matter was terminated? No, sir. Oh, there may have been some individuals that had some feelings on it, but not an official position from the party. 
You are, and you are still the Republican National Committeeman in good standing, is that correct? Yes, sir. And do you still uh, represent any locality or municipality in the state of Florida? At this time, I do not. Uh, when did you... We have a, uh, there is a report in a Jacksonville paper uh, dated February 3rd of 1989, uh, which says that a leading Republican figure from Florida, Jean Austin, said from her Washington office yesterday that Taylor's conviction will not affect his standing in the Republican Party. Ms. Austin, who until a week ago was Republican State Chairman for Florida and, and now is co-chairman of the Republican National Committee, said, quote, as I understand it, it was like a small conflict of interest thing, and I don't see it affecting anything. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into the full report, uh, except to tell you that the headline of that paper says, ex-lobbyist fined $5,000 in interest conflict. You uh, read the, sir, Yes. may I? Yes. There is a retraction in there. I was as disturbed as uh, humanly possible to be at the handling of the thing by the press. and. Uh, that's the six or seven lines that you're looking at there. Because, because of incorrect information from the and state attorney's it office. It came from the same source that that other statement that you read came from, the state's attorney's office. And it just suggests to me, sir, that it's just a little bit unfair uh, to be reading something like that into the record that has been disposed of, the adjudication has been withheld, the case has been sealed, and if you're a lawyer, I'm sure that you understand that. And I, 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 I find that to be just uh... also as a part of the plea agreement. Well, let me read the whole thing. Corrections. Because of incorrect information in the state attorney's office, a story on page A1, February 3, misidentified $5,000 that Republican National Committeeman Bill Taylor paid for investigation and prosecution costs after pleading no contest to a misdemeanor charge. Did you, in fact, plead no contest to the misdemeanor charge? A, a, mister, a minor misdemeanor and, and one was dropped, yes, sir. Did you, in fact, plead no contest to a misdemeanor charge? I said yes, sir. Thank you. Also, as part of the plea agreement, Taylor agreed only not to seek employment with the city in connection with his past contract as a lobbyist. He, can still, he still can seek city employment on city con or city contracts in other areas. The when did you begin to represent uh, Jacksonville, Florida as a lobbyist? Yeah, it was in, either in 1982 or 1983. And how many other municipalities, if any, did you represent? At one time, I had a contract with the Tampa Housing Authority, which is not the same as Jacksonville in that it's a separate entity. At the same time that you were representing Jacksonville? Yes, sir. And what were you receiving from Tampa, Florida, Housing Authority? I had a contract for uh, $60,000. $60,000. For and one at, year. Pardon? For one year. For one year. And during that time, you were receiving uh, between seventy-five and you tell me, what were you receiving from Jacksonville during that year? It's hard for me to answer that question precisely. Probably in the neighborhood of $60,000, $72,000, someplace up there. Someplace up there. Uh, did you at that, were you representing any other municipalities or any subdivisions of any municipalities uh, during the time that you were representing Jacksonville? I had one contract with the Housing Authority of Ocala. Uh, I think the amount was $5,000 for a specific uh, thing, and uh, that was the total. Any others? Any other locale? Now, how about uh, other people other than municipalities? You represented some developers. We have just gone through that during the course of this hearing. Uh, you represented Mr. Willis on three of these occasions in the Chatham Apartments in Savannah, in Jacksonville, 
uh, and in Lufkin, Texas. Is yes, that sir. correct? Yes, sir. Now, did you have other clients besides Mr. Willis? None that I, uh, none that I haven't covered. In, in the one that I said that's ongoing today, the Royal Arms deal in um, Cedar Hills, Texas, is one that is still in the process and has been in the process now for some nearly two years. Yes, but are you telling me that that during the course of the last eight years, 1981 through 1989, you represented no other developers besides uh, Mr. Willis and Mr. Harris and the matter that you referred to with Mr. Shays in uh, Texas? Uh, the one that Mr. Shays asked about uh, dealing with the Diocese of St. Augustine. Right. That's it? That's the, the extent of your representation of developers? Yes, sir. Now, did you represent any clients before other agencies of government besides HUD? Oh, yes, sir. Whom did you represent before other agencies of government? One was, the, I guess, the, the, the Department of Interior. Uh, the Department Who did you represent before the Department of Interior? The city of Jacksonville and the, uh, and the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. Right, and I'm asking you if... Wait, the, wait excuse me, excuse me. Yes. I, I, let me restate that. I meant to say that the Transportation Department for the Jacksonville Transportation Authority in the city of Jacksonville... Did you receive a, a separate retainer from that Transportation Department? Yes, sir. And what was your retainer from that? My recollection was that uh, they could only give me a contract for $9,000 because of some requirements dealing with uh, putting it out for an RFP. And I think they paid me $9,000. For what period of time? Well, they dispersed it to me over a matter of, uh, of three months is my recollection. Uh, I was also doing some work for the city of Jacksonville uh, on the same thing, and it was all being coordinated by, is my understanding, it was being, there were three entities actually that were paying me at, at that. It was $9,000 in total for your appearance for, before the Department of Interior for the for transportation, transportation matter. Yes, okay. Any other agencies of government that you represented clients before? The Department of Interior, the Department of Commerce. So whom did you represent before the Department of Commerce? Uh, the city of Jacksonville. Anybody else, any separate entities than the department, than the city of Jacksonville? Not that, I'm, not that I can recall, no, sir. Would you check your records and submit the Surely. information to us? Any other uh, agencies of government besides Interior and Commerce? Um, we had an immigration problem, uh, immigration case that uh, I worked. Uh, I had a client for, uh, for that. What kind of client did you have before immigration? It was a, a bonding matter that had to do with um, the uh, immigrants that were coming across the Texas state line where they had a performance bond that they had to um, uh, provide. And uh, my client... Um, was it an insurance company, a bonding company? Yes, sir. And what was your retainer from that? Uh, 60000 over a one-year period. And you're, you're not an immigration specialist, are you? No, sir. You're not an, an attorney? No, sir. What was the nature of your representation before the Immigration Naturalization Service? Again, it was one of these situations that turned out to be, uh, uh, I had I affiliated with, uh, with another law firm, with a law firm up here, and um, I was the one that selected the law firm. I was the one that was the one that selected the law firm. I was the one that uh, did uh, the collection of the information uh, and was the sort of the liaison, if you will, uh, between the employer and the and the law firm. And did you pay the law firm? No, sir. The law firm was paid by the bonding companies. Uh, right? Yes, sir. Okay, what, what other agencies before, besides INS and, and Commerce and Interior did you represent clients before? Uh, I, in, did you say transportation? No, I, 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 I said Interior and Commerce and INS. And transportation? And transportation? Yes, sir. And... Uh, the Department of Defense, I had a contract one time for uh, a very small one-shot deal at the Department of Defense. 
what what was your retainer on that matter? Five thousand. And how about transportation? Practically everything I did at transportation had to do with um, uh, the. Um, Jacksonville, with the city of Jacksonville would, dealing would with Would you, UMTA. for the record, so that I don't have to just go through this and tax your memory at this point, submit to the chairman, with, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, a total list of all of your clients whom you represented uh, before various agencies of the federal government and what, do, what the retainers were to, at what period of time? To the best of my ability, I will, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, well, and, well, I receive... Uh, I'll make a note of this, but will, and just in order to make sure, will I receive a transcript of this hearing, and will or will, you, will I hear from the staff on some of these matters specifically, or that they want to, to know or that you want to know the answer to? Yes, Mr. Taylor, you will. So I don't need to concern. Well, it's helpful if you make your own notes, but yeah. we will advise you. Yes. Uh, and I guess the 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 uh, the final question I would ask you is. Is your association with uh, with Mr. Willis? How did, how did you meet him in the first instance? How did he find you? Well, how did you find him? Well, Mr. Willis is uh, is a Democrat. He was very close to the city. Uh, um, the former Democrat. Well, the Demo yeah, the former Democrat mayor of Jacksonville. Um, we knew each other um, socially. Um, I think his wife and my wife uh, played uh, tennis together and this type of thing. Uh -huh. It was um, in that vein. And when, when for the first time did he approach you for a business proposition? I think it was in um, late 83. And was that the Chatham Apartments? Is that the first uh, discussion that you had with him on business? Was it yes, sir. And the others flowed from that original involvement, is that yes, right? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Schumer. Before I get to uh, Mr. Taylor, I just, the committee had handed out uh, this morning another letter from Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly, and I, I don't think the contents are a secret, but one thing that does bother me, when I had originally asked Mr. Manafort how many projects they were involved in, they said three. They sent a second letter which brought it to nine. I believe these figures are correct. A third letter which brought it to 11, and now a fourth letter that brought it to 15, <coughs> which brings a number of questions to mind uh, in general with all of this, and that is, first, how reliable can their testimony be that it's only 15, since each time we've asked them to plumb their memories and records and they only have that? And second, what kind of, uh, what kind of legal implications there are when this happens and how we can make sure that we're getting all the information. So I just wanted to bring that into the record, Mr. Chairman. Now, for Mr. Taylor, you know, Mr. Taylor, one of the things that I've been puzzling through is your testimony is, is the things you remember and the things you don't. And one thing becomes very clear throughout your testimony. You have a remarkable memory for every payment you've received how often they were, how much it was, when it was, over what period of time. On the other hand, there are large gaps in your memory as to who you met with and who, which came first and what the programs were that you were working on. And it led me to thinking, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on this before uh, specific questions, that you really come from, I mean, I think a lot of the conflict in the testimony, sometimes when the chairman and other members have asked you questions, you've sort of passed like ships in the night. And basically, I think it's your view, and you tell me if this is right or wrong, that there's nothing wrong with making personal gain, personal dollars from politics. Is that your view? I guess you would have to say that from the time that I uh, made a, a decision to make myself available to assist people in Washington, I guess you would have to say that the answer to your question is yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, this is sort of an observation on my part. I think our country is divided in different sections where in some places this is acceptable in the way of doing business and in other places, and certainly here in Washington over the last few years, it has not become 
an acceptable way of doing business. And lots of people, and you're not the only one for sure, and this committee is not the only one to explore it or sort of caught in that vortex. I, for one, am glad the standard has changed uh, and that one shouldn't make private dollars out of personal politics. But I think in reference to Mr. Shays' his frustration, why use this letterhead and why use that letterhead, I think one of the answers is that you saw the two as part and parcel to the same thing. And you said it yourself earlier. You said, well, I had done a lot for people for free. It was about time for me to collect. And uh, I would just tell you that I think the ethical standards in politics in this country, in every part of the country, are changing, are rising. And it is no longer acceptable to say, uh, I'm going to make personal dollars from politics. And we see that changing in the legislative branch, in the congressional branch, in the judicial branch, and everywhere else. I now have some specific questions. And I appreciate your candor. I don't think, frankly, you're trying to dissemble with the committee. I just think we have these different views. And I appreciate your candor on that answer. Go ahead. You wanted to say something. You, you said something there, and I, I, I had to make a note about it. It said uh, that I, as the party chairman, uh, did an awful lot for free, and now is the time. Well, you, I'm taking, not verbatim, to. but I'm taking your testimony. You I, had I, mentioned that before. I'm, I'm, I'm Go ahead. trying about time for me to collect. I, I don't think that what I said was that it was time for me to collect. What I said was that it was time for me to put to use uh, some of the experience and the expertise that I had acquired when I was doing it for free. And uh, I find myself joining a, a long line of people uh, who have worked in Washington at various levels uh, that have uh, learned something about the process up here and, uh, and, and find people that need help. Excuse me, will the gentleman yield? I'd be happy to yield. That would be easier to accept if you weren't still, in a, in a sense, an office holder cashing in on your present uh, responsibilities. It seems to me if you said to this committee, I learned a lot and I got out, we'd have problems with the revolving door kind of circumstance. But, but in this instance, you not only were a national committee man, but you used national committee stationery. And if, if you can't see that point, um, and, and you feel comfortable saying that to this committee and having it be a public record, it just tells me how sick the system has gotten. Mr. Shays, uh, with respect, sir, I was not the National Committee man. I was the former state chairman when uh, this started. And uh, I, uh, wait, wait, let me just clarify this. This, the, this is your stationery, correct? It says Surely. National Public National Committee. What, what was your job? What was the date? We're talking about, we're talking about 85, 86, 87. You're cashing in. You were saying to us, you're cashing in on your experience, and you're really doing more than that. You're cashing in on your position. What I was trying to say, sir, that when I started into the business of representation in, wa in Washington, I was not the state chairman. I was elected by the state party after I was in the business. And when they elected me, uh, they, they knew exactly what they were doing. And uh, I ran on the basis of, that it would give me an opportunity to come to Washington to do things more for the party at the same well, let time. Me, let me just say My something. My predecessor also was a former congressman uh, from Florida as but, national committee man. Let me say to you that, that uh, um, I strongly dispute with you that anyone in the, the national committee would concur that they knew exactly what you were doing. And I would strongly suggest that there's no way that anyone there would approve of you using their stationery with your name on it when you're doing private business. And, um, you know, it's bad enough that you're doing it, but it even gets worse when you start to suggest that they knew what you were doing and they concurred with it because they, I can't believe that they knew you were doing that. Is that what I said, sir? You said they knew exactly what I was doing. I said the state committee people uh, knew my business when they elected me in 1984. They knew your business. Did anybody that you know of uh, in, the, in either in the state party or in the national party, were they aware that you were using uh, Republican National Committee stationery 
in your private business? I would, I would hesitate to comment on that because I, I don't know that they do. Do you think anyone would, do you think that they, whether they knew it or not, do you think that they would feel it was appropriate? You seem to have a problem, but do you think they would think it was appropriate? They might. They might find it inappropriate. Well, I'll tell you, the Republicans I know wouldn't think it's appropriate. Thank you for yielding. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, and again, that's why we're passing here, because you feel uh, that it's okay to use office, previous, present, to make private gain, and uh, that's wrong. I didn't invent it. No, you didn't invent it, and that, but that is, does not excuse it. Lobbying is probably about the second oldest profession no. in we're the country. We're not just talking about lobbying, though reference Mr. Uh, Representative Shea's suggestion. Let me uh, go to a couple of things here that I'd like to bring out. You obviously knew Deborah Dean quite well because all the letters, or many of them, say Debbie. How'd you first meet her? How did, of all the people in HUD, did you happen to decide that she was the person you ought to contact? It's the only letter we have where you're writing somebody on a personal, on a first name, even nickname basis. How did that happen? I think it came about as a result of what I had alluded to earlier, that um, there was a committee of three that was uh, formed for the purpose of making some of these decisions. And the member But I don't see any letters, dear Tom or dear. I'm sure they're there. All on first name basis. I'm sure. Did you submit some of those to the record, for the record, when you get a chance? Sure, I'd be happy I'd like to try to and find them. them. Sure, but I. I Are you I, saying you knew Demery as well as you knew Dean? As well as I knew Dean. Okay. How'd you get to know Dean? I uh, called on her. Well, how'd you get in the front door? Lots of people called on her. Not many people got in. I'll have to agree with that. Um, first time. As a matter of fact, my recollection of the thing is I never met with her when she was the executive assistant uh, uh, to the chairman, I mean, secretary. To, the, to, to, to the secretary. It's not yet a business. Um, I beg your pardon? I said when you called the head of HUD chairman instead of secretary, I said it's not yet a business. The, I think I only met with her once, perhaps twice, in her office, uh, all during the time, all, all the contact that I had with her either was through her staff, or through the mail, or occasionally uh, in talking to her. How did you come to call her Debbie? I guess I'm just a friendly guy. All the other letters that we have from you are not. You didn't write, dear Sam. It's dear I Mr. Secretary. I'd, I'd never met the man until he came to Jacksonville in 84 during the campaign. And I didn't call him so Sam. You really didn't know, De did you ever go out to dinner with Deborah Dean? Not during the period of time that she was at HUD, no, sir. Have you, I didn't ask that. Did you, did you ever go out to dinner with her? I went out to dinner with her after, no, I went to lunch with her after uh, she was no longer the executive assistant uh, to Mr. Pierce. When was that? Approximate. Not holding you to a specific date. 87, 88. Mm -hmm. And why would, why'd you do that? It goes back to this letter that I wrote to her, and it may have occurred about the same time that that letter, uh, where I was saying that I supported her. Um, for assistant secretary. Uh, for assistant secretary for CPD. Um, I thought that, um, uh, I just want to talk to her. I thought maybe she had, uh, she, she just needed some moral support. She was being worked over pretty good, and um, uh, I felt like. Um, right. Okay. Did you ever talk to any other people within the Republican Party to try and gain some of these contracts? Within the Republican Party? Mm -hmm. No, sir. Not to my record. Not at all. Did you ever ask anyone else to call up Miss Dean? or any other HUD official and give you a recommendation or help push it through or do whatever? I don't have any recollection of, of doing that, no, sir. Would you think about it for a little bit and 
let us know if you want to stand by the answer that you know <laughs> uh, that there aren't any. There are there were times that uh, some people may have talked to, talked among themselves um, about uh, a, a request that I made, and I dare say, I dare say that uh, someplace in in the line of my work with uh, Jacksonville and or some other projects that uh, conversationally I could have said something that would have resulted in well if you see Debbie you know ask her you know if she can give this thing a push or she's paying attention to it. The biggest problem that we you have... You never made an explicit phone call to someone else saying, could you call Dean, could you call Demery, could you call so-and-so and help move my project along? I don't have any recollection of that. Is it no, possible that you did? You wouldn't have ruled it out on an ethical basis. That's, that's pretty clear. No. <laughs> um, is it possible that you did? This is possible. Anything is possible. I mean, if we asked some of these other people, did they ever get a call and somebody said, well, that you asked, uh, that good old um, Bill Taylor asked me to call up to find out how his project is doing. That's entirely possible. That is it? possible. Oh, yeah. And it would be possible that it would be other figures who were party figures in the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. No, no, it wouldn't have been any party It wouldn't figure. have been another chairman, another chairperson or anything like that. Okay. Um, how about any gifts to Debbie Dean? No, sir. None. So the only extra uh, non-official uh, uh, contact you had with her was that one lunch afterwards when you were trying to get her to be assistant secretary. See, it's my recollection, I may be wrong and someone could correct me, that she was still executive assistant when she had been uh, nominated for chairman. That is correct. So, um, so you're telling me that you had lunch with her to help push her for uh, assistant secretary, but that was after she was executive assistant. But I don't think there was any gap there. Um, my understanding is uh, there was a gap. My understanding is there was a gap because she was the acting assistant uh, that may be. secretary for CPD and was on a consultant basis. Okay. And, uh, that may well be. That may well be. We'll check the, uh, but anyway, that's your recollection of that. Again, can you give me a concise answer to how you first came to call on Deborah Dean? Did anyone tell you she'd be the right person to call? Again, uh, there was this committee. Deborah Dean was. That's not, I understand. The answer to that. the question is, I was told to, to work through the process the, the, and the way to do it was to work with this committee. Deborah Dean was, my understanding, one of the representatives. Who told you that? On, good gracious. Um, I guess I heard it from so many sources, it's very difficult to pin it down. But uh, and why do even, you think, okay. even in, um, in Atlanta, uh, mm -hmm. where, and in Jacksonville Federal HUD. Uh, that was known, hmm? to go see it, that committee. No. It was known that those decisions were made in HUD Central. HUD and Central and that committee, HUD Central has 10, 12,000 employees. That committee is three people. The correct. question I'm asking, and I don't think you're giving me a straight answer on it. I'm trying. I, w I wish you'd try a little harder, is how did you manage to pick out Deborah Dean? One of the witnesses we had here, uh, the nominee for ambassador, said he just picked out the book and landed at Debbie Dean. You don't expect, you didn't do it that way. <laughs> no, sir. Okay. I, no. I didn't do it that way. It right, was the HUD directory. He then corrected me a as, little bit self-righteously. It was not a book, phone book. It was the HUD directory. As, as things are expressed in Washington, it was sort of like on the street that uh, uh, Deborah Dean was one of the important people. How'd to, you get in the door? How do you think you got in the door when by your own statement and many others? Took a others, lot of persistence. Well, how'd you do it? Let's just hear. I called. I wrote. I uh, made every attempt through her assistant uh, to get to see her. And when you called her, did you say, this is the Bill gentleman. Taylor, I'm the... Uh, Would the gentleman yield? I'd when, be happy. Her just assistant. let me ask this yeah. question, okay. and then I'd be happy to yield. Did you, did you say, uh, I'm the state chairman of the, I mean, uh, rather, I am the committee member of the Republican National Committee? Probably did. Probably did. Okay. You think that might have helped? I would like to think it did. I wouldn't like to think it did, but I think you're right. 
gentleman from... Uh, I'm telling you the truth. I know you are, and I appreciate it. I do. You know, you're asking me to tell you how things are. You know what? You know, it's, it's, it's like uh, I started to say a while ago uh, when, uh, when I was hired by the Democrat mayor of Jacksonville. They didn't hire me because I was a Democrat. They didn't hire me because uh, I had worked in the Carter administration. And they didn't hire you because you were an expert on housing either, did they? Uh, as a matter of fact, they didn't. But I learned an awful lot as a result of working with them, and there's where a great deal of my expertise came from. Good old on-the-job training. Good old on-the-job training, just like people get elected to Congress. Right. <laughs> yeah. We, we get our salary and not much else, okay? I hear you. Mr. Chase, did you, did you, yeah. Okay, let me go. Uh, let me go on further. Next question I have is: On one project, you made four hundred thousand. Or you have equity worth four hundred thousand dollars because you got ten percent of the interest. On I got all ten percent of whatever's there. Yes. Whatever's sir. there. On all the other projects, you seem to have gotten a salary. Did you, do you have equity interest in any other project because of your work there? No, sir. How did it come about that you got an equity interest in this one and not in the other ones? <coughs> because I think the four, even though you, you managed to make uh, 160, 140,000 from Jacksonville in one year, I guess it is, by going out of two pots, you said you got 60,000 from the Transportation Department and I think it is 75 to 82,000 from you're really, you're really sort of tearing that thing up. You're, 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 you're just... I don't know what tearing it up means. Am I incorrect? You're absolutely incorrect. So please correct the record. Now, wh what would you like... How would you like to dissect it so that... We I would like to know, in response to Mr. Weiss's question, you said that you were getting your salary as... Uh, and I don't have the official terms here, as Jacksonville's representative. Yes, sir. That was... For 1986, 72,000. For 87, 72,000. Well, for 88, 82,000. Right? Then you also said, and this was not the main line of my questioning, but let's get it out, that you also made, and I believe the figure was 60,000, by representing a branch of the Jacksonville, another branch of the Jacksonville government. No, sir. That is not correct. That was Tampa. That was oh, that was Tampa. The Transportation Department was Tampa. No, sir. No, sir. City HUD in Tampa. The Tampa Housing Authority. And that's where you got 60000 Yes, sir. You made 9000 from the Transportation Department in Jacksonville. In 1982 or 83. So while you were working in Jacksonville as their representative, you, for the 72, the 72, and the 82, no entity of Jacksonville paid you any other money. Is that correct? Ask the question one more time. 1986, you made $72,000 to represent the city of Jacksonville. 1987, you made $72,000. In 1988, you made $82,000. That was your salary from the city of Jacksonville to be there. For those three years, yes. For sir. those three years. Did any other entity of the Jacksonville city government pay you additional money? In those three years, yes. no, sir. Only in 1982? Yes, sir. Thank you. And it's my apology on the... Well, I'd be happy to yield. I just want to say it's my apology on mixing up the Tampa money and the other. It's 60 I and 80. I can understand that. Yes, I would call, ask you something, and I thought you answered that you had received those salaries only from Tampa and only from um, Jacksonville. Were there any other city salaries or HUD salaries or, or subordinate units of government salaries you received at the same time? I think I indicated that 5000 came for a one-time job from uh, the Ocala Housing Authority. I, I missed that, but that was the only other income from a metropolitan subdivision or departmental department of government, such as HUD or transportation. Yes, sir. Those two, but they were received at the same time and approximately the same time period. Yes, sir. Thank you. So my statement is that you made 140 from not just Jacksonville, but Jacksonville and Tampa. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it wasn't. It was. It is uh, still the 140 stands. But my question is, how did the 10% equity investment come about? Because you made so much more money, or you stand to make so much more money from that one than you do in all these others. Well, I, I, I can only say, I guess it came about as a result of two things. Uh, one, uh, the developer uh, advanced the idea 
And uh, I guess that was because that uh, he either didn't have any confidence in what was going to happen, and that was all the cash that he wanted to uh, commit to. Uh, and he had always been an interest of mine to uh, have something that I could uh, rely on in, in later years, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, some type of income in my retirement, but. Uh, that looks like it's... Um, and that's the only one of all of them for which you've lobbied HUD for? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the gentleman yield the second. Happy to you. I'm just, I'm a little confused because you belittled the equity that you would have in this project, and now you're saying it was your hope. It was the hope for, for your, you know, retirement years and so on. And it seems to me that this was a very important element in your remuneration. Well, I... I I'm, it seems the more you the talk, question, the deeper you get into a hole here. I think the, the previous question and my answer to that was I, I had no re reservations as we agreed to it later on to uh, taking the 10 percent. I was trying to explain why, uh, and we just negotiated it out. I was asking for, I was not really interested in, in a piece of the action, as it were, uh, in the beginning. Your, your testimony in the beginning, true, in the beginning, but your testimony was that this is something you wanted. You wanted to have ownership. Later want, on. Exactly. And it was a very important element in your remuneration. It, it, it came, it, we hope that one day it will be. I have other investments uh, that I bought for the same reason, and I don't know well, if it'll ever come about or not. I just, I just am trying to explain to you sometimes how you say one thing and you, you minimize it, and then you proceed to say that this was kind of a very important element. Well, I'd and I'm listening to your testimony. I'm not falling asleep here. You keep us awake very easily. But I, it's very clear to me that probably one of the best benefits in this whole thing is a 10 percent interest in a project that you say is worth at least $4 million. And I just make that point to you because it's coming through loud and clear to me. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, let me continue here. On all these other projects, did you get paid whether you succeeded or not, or were some of them done on a contingency basis? Some of them were done on a contingency basis. You tell us which ones. In other words, you had to be successful to get paid the fee that was agreed upon ahead of time. Is that yes, right? Yes, sir. Which ones were they? To my recollection, uh, there was a a performance uh, in all of them. All of them were based on whether you succeeded or not, no matter how many f hours or how few hours were put in. That's correct. You think that's a good way to do business? Is that how consultants ought to work? If you go and work for the size fees that I work for, you're absolutely correct. It's not a good way for a consultant to work. Uh, I don't um, uh, think that um, uh, there's um, anything to suggest that there's um, anything inappropriate about it, but um, because I, I have, I do a lot of things on a yeah, I don't think it lends itself to a decision being made on the merits, frankly. Especially when you have this atmosphere, as we do here, of who you knew rather than what you knew. I'd like to go now to your, your relationship with Mr. Harris. All right, sir. Mr. Harris has testified in regards to the Liberty Center for the Homeless Project that he thought your fees were outrageous. That's in quote to this committee. Since Taylor was working for the city, he should have done it anyway. Harris said his business partner told him, Taylor's holding us up, but I don't know how else to do it. Now, when that question preliminarily came up, you said that it was Harris who approached you. That's correct. Now, of course he approached you. You represented the city of Jacksonville for whom he was working. Did he offer a fee or did you request one? And remember, we have his testimony. Well, I'm not concerned about his Good. testimony, sir. Well, you uh, tell I'm us. Making, I'm making a sworn statement, and uh, th that's, uh, that's something else, what right. you have there, and that's hearsay also. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is, 
when Mr. Harris and I started talking about this thing, he had so many problems, he didn't know if the thing was going to even fly or not. I didn't ask that question. And did you ask him for a fee, or did he offer it? In all probability, it was a matter that he said, under what condition would you assist me on this? And I said, under what condition would you like to work? And he, and I probably said, for a fee, yes. Now, don't you think that it was highly unethical and improper, in retrospect, for you to be representing the city of Jacksonville? And here, the developer, who's this very same project you're supposed to be pushing, wearing your 80, I guess then it was the $82,000 Jacksonville hat, that you should now ask the developer for extra, for more money? Was that ethical? Certainly not unethical, in my opinion, because the interests weren't the same. You mean it's the same project, and you were representing the city if the interests weren't the same, on some instances you were representing the city versus the developer, and on the other, the developer versus the city, they did not have common interest? Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you're, if you're a lawyer or not. I am. Um, but if you uh, had a case to come to your attention where there were, let's say, two passengers in an automobile and they were in, in, a, in an accident, and both of them were bringing an action uh, I guess one of them could go out and get one lawyer, and the other one could go out and get another lawyer. Oh, yeah, that didn't happen here. Uh, what they got is they got, in this particular case, he came to the city's consultant and said, I have oh. some interest in this thing. Let me give you the analogy I since would, you I brought have, it up, Mr. Taylor. I'm going to interrupt you because I think you ought to answer the question. If two people are in the same accident, and there's only one amount of money to recover so they have a conflict, and if one lawyer represented both of them, that would be a grounds for disbarment. Okay? Now, you just told us that the city and the developer did not have the same interest, and you represented both of them. They That's did. even worse than if they had the same interest and you were just catbirding one on the other. Thank you, uh, in the context in which I was saying, my responsibility to the city was to get as many units to the city as I could, and it was discharged at that point. I, the, city, the city was awarded the units. When Mr. Harris was subsequently selected by the city, HUD, to be the recipient of the things, he started experiencing difficulties with federal HUD that had nothing to do with uh, the city. Well, give us an example. Well, as I indicated earlier, uh, one of the specific things had to do with um, Labor uh, Standards Act, where uh, under uh, Section 8 Mod Rehab, I think it is, that um, the specifications are that if you go, uh, have a building above uh, a certain level, certain height, you have to use uh, a certain rate if it's under um, certain labor. Certain wage rate? Yes, sir. Cer and then below that, uh, another wage rate prevails. That was one of the one of the questions that had to be resolved. And what did the city say? They didn't care. The city didn't have any say so in it. The city. Uh, this was between the developer and. Uh, well, why is that? Why wouldn't the city have a say so? Because this was a federal regulation. Yeah. The labor. Well, didn't labor the city have right? a position on it? Did you check? All I know is I responded to Mr. Harris and... Uh, but you were also being paid by the city at that point in time. That's the whole point but here. The city, I didn't say the city didn't have an interest in it, but I said I was paid by Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris could have done... I guess he could have gone to the city. Um, instead, he came to me. Well, his view of it is quite different than yours. And let me say one other thing and ask if you dispute this. Evidently, in the court case to which you pleaded no contest, the judge said that the facts would have supported conviction of a misdemeanor. I believe the misdemeanor being conflict of interest. Is that true? I'm not familiar with what you're reading, sir. Well, that's my information, that the that, judge said that. By the I don't, way, I don't, I don't know that, a, that that's a fact, and I've already covered that subject. Uh, oh, you didn't cover this question. I, Do you know that to be false? I don't know it to be a fact. Do you know it to be false? I have reason to believe that it is not factual, yes, sir. You have reason to believe the judge did not say 
What that are you the reading from, sir? It was, it's, it's, it was told to me from the court case that the judge said this in the... It was reported in the newspaper. No, it's not from the newspaper. This is the words of the judge. And it's in the order? Mm -hmm. It's in the order? I don't know if it's in the order or not. That's not the issue here. I, sub I, I would repeat, sir, I, I, without knowing the source of the information, I won't say anything more than I have reason to doubt the accuracy of the statement. Okay. And you know what the judge said pretty well, don't you? Were you I there when he made a statement? As a matter of fact, I was not, but I have the copy of the written order. Well, I, but it might not have been in the order, as I mentioned to you. Okay. Next question I have is, do you know other people who are state uh, committee people, whether they be Republican or Democrat, who are also Washington consultants, as you have described your profession? No. You don't Not know of any others? Not off the top of my head, no, sir. You haven't run across any or anything like no, that? No, sir. Okay. You think they ought to be, given what has happened and what's been reviewed uh, in the past? Certainly months? wouldn't want to wish on anybody else what's happened to me, you know. All right. Okay. I just have a few more. You mentioned this workout for whatever program it is, which we still haven't found out, in the Dallas area. Who in HUD uh, are you involved with in this one? That information I'll have to provide you with because it's the it's Mr. Sanders as the attorney that... Uh, I wonder if my colleague will yield. Happy. I want to uh, have you expand on your last observation, Ms. Taylor. You don't wish anybody to have happened to them what's happening to you? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, make the mistakes, you know... Make expand the, on that, please. I guess what I'm saying is to have made the mistakes that I apparently, in the eyes of, of uh, this committee, have made and the fact that I am sitting here uh, under the uh, eye of uh, the public, and uh, I guess that it just means that um, uh, in some areas, my judgment has uh, not been uh, up to up to someone's standard, and uh, uh, I won't. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to have anybody subjected to this. No. Well, I would like to deal with that concept of being subjected to this. Do you feel that you have been unfairly treated, that you have not been allowed to answer questions fully? Mr. Chairman, far from that. I just want to specify exactly, because I have a lot of empathy for all witnesses. It's never pleasant to be a witness under any set of circumstances. And I think that was in the context in which I said what I did. Yes, but it is, is it your testimony that you feel you have been given a fair hearing? Oh, in my meeting here this morning? Yes. Absolutely. I, and I have great respect for this committee. I have great respect for what you're attempting. I uh, attempted to accomplish here. I hope that as a result of the hearings here, of course, I don't know what another 30, 40, 50 witnesses uh, that might be uh, following me is going to do in order to help try and change anything relative to housing policy, but uh, it, it, it certainly occurs to me that the work that this committee has done today has shown some areas where some people uh, working, like myself, working within what you perceive the system to be, the only way that, that it can be uh, dealt with. Uh, I think that if we had had a better oversight on this thing from the top, if perhaps the Inspector General's reports had been read by uh, the Congress or by the Secretary or by someone at the White House, I think that if uh, there had been some closer restraints on some uh, people uh, that were making the decisions, um, perhaps we wouldn't have been here. But I can tell you this, that insofar as m my position is concerned, the projects that I have worked on have been meritorious projects. They have been projects that went into situations that were in need, great need. 
uh, I worked on them from the point of view that I merely tried to keep my projects on the table because HUD has a, and I shouldn't say HUD, I, that, that was, uh, I shouldn't say that. It's very difficult to keep things on the table in Washington in one of these agencies. And it takes, it's a very easy matter for someone to say, well, here's a, here's a project that uh, we just say no. And saying no gets uh, a good mark on the report card. Saying yes sometimes requires some explanations. And there are lots of people up here that aren't particularly interested in paying enough attention to, to say yes. And I think that uh, in the case of, uh, for instance, uh, that demolition project that I talked on, uh, on the case of the performance funding. Mr. Tibor, we don't want to digress any farther, and I want to return the time to my colleague from New York. I just want the record to indicate what your answer is to your uh, treatment by this committee. Absolutely. Uh, no question. This committee has treated me extremely fairly. Uh, I have uh, enjoyed some parts of it. We've laughed together. That's right. Uh, yeah, I've been keep laughed. going. Keep going. I've been I've been laughed at. Uh, we've had little you know little things, but very frankly, uh, I don't have uh, any bad feelings about uh, my appearance here. That's and that's very mutual, Ms. Taylor. I yield back to my I, colleague. I, just the point again, Mr. Taylor, and I I, I don't want to. Well. The point is not to get people to say yes or to say no, but them to make the decision on the merits, not because somebody has a high position that has nothing to do with whether it's a meritorious decision. And you understand that during the time you were pushing projects through HUD, for every one that there was money for, there were sometimes even scores that might have been meritorious but were turned down. And what we want to see at HUD is, in these days of scarce resources, the dollars spent on the best projects, not on a project that might be passable, but that because somebody came in and had a certain position that had nothing to do with the project, that project was approved. And that's what we're finding here at HUD. And that is why we're upset about you're using your Republican National Committee stationary in position with such uh, um, frankness, I guess. I don't. I, I mean, I don't mean frankness. I mean with such uh, a, pl a plum. It's not even much better. But you know what I'm saying. The word is abandon. You don't show any abandon. <laughs> abandon, right? I mean, you're proud. You go in and say, "I'm from the Republican National Committee, and I'm proud of that." And no, I'm help me get this. Pro help me say yes to this project. That's wrong. No, I, I, I'm the federal government. I'm here to help you. Yeah. Okay, well, you played that role, too, <laughs> didn't you, Mr. Taylor? And that brings me to uh, my last question, which is, when you were chair of the RNC, when you were... Wait a minute, sir. Pardon? When I was chair, chair of, of the state Republican committee, I'm sorry, and a c national committee man, but uh, did the Republican Party take positions on housing that you were involved in actively in debating them and discussing them? Not to my recollection. Well, they did. It's in their platform. That was in the platform the committee. The RNC. The, that was in the platform committee at the convention. Oh, and the RNC doesn't, I don't know how you guys work it. Uh, we they don't approve any the of Democrat, this. How about we the state? The way the Democrats do. How about the state? Are you, proud of your, uh, are you proud of your party's general record in the housing area? Do you support the cutbacks from, th you know, the dramatic cutbacks in housing that have occurred in the last eight years? I think that overall the policy of President Reagan and his administration relative to trying to cut back and get within the Graham Rudman uh, limits, uh, yes. Because, you know, it's reminiscent of when we had Secretary Watt here, who used to decry any federal subsidy and then was quick to line up at the trough when his opportunity to line his own pocket legally we hope and we think at this point, uh, uh, was done. Um, you don't find any contradiction in the position 
that housing ought to be dramatically cut back and then going ahead and lobbying for certain projects for the homeless, knowing as you had to know in your, you know, even with your on-the-job training, shall we say, that there were very few projects to go around for all the need. Do you see any contradiction in that? I will answer your question, I hope, in this fashion. Whichever way you choose. When uh, I was employed by the city of Jacksonville, as I indicated, uh, it was in the face of certainly a, a, a decreasing of, of monies across the board. And uh, the decision by the powers to be uh, felt that having someone like myself up here uh, would enable us to at least have an opportunity to argue uh, our point of view and the merits of the projects that we had going. Uh, we find that to be, excuse me, Mr. Chairman, I find that to be uh, a, a very commendable uh, thing, working for the city of Jacksonville. I didn't work, well, I worked for, I was paid by the city, but I was working for the citizens of Jacksonville, the poor people, uh, as well as, uh, as, as the, uh, the mayor. And uh, I find uh, that, the, well, like I indicated, we, had, we, we have legislators in Florida that they go to Tallahassee and they come back and say, we brought home the bacon. You know, we, we got this many millions of dollars for this, that, and the other. Uh, very frankly, when I gave my report to the mayor at the end of the year, which I did every year, uh, I gave him an up-to-date of bringing home the bacon. Don't you think it might have been a little more consistent if you had argued wearing your public hat that there ought to be more of these kinds of things to go around? Certainly. Wouldn't it help the poor <laughs> citizens of Jacksonville if we someone could. like yourself in a position of some power had argued that we ought to be having, we ought to be, there ought to be more funding for these kinds of programs? Well, th that was the Congress' fault, uh, responsibility, and the Congress did exactly that. The Congress voted time and time again to increase the HUD allocation. Did you ever lobby any of the members of the Florida mm -hmm. delegation to not do that? Sir, not to do, not to not reduce. To cut the money? No, sir, I never did. I have no further questions. Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Taylor, the, the public record is fairly clear. It, uh, the former administration may not have been a fan of a number of housing projects, but Congress ultimately concurred. And uh, if the um, housing uh, has been a failure of the administration, it is uh, a teamwork of a Congress that uh, agreed to it. Uh, we just voted out a bill last uh, week uh, for housing, and I know my distinguished colleague wanted it increased, and uh, it, we didn't see it increase. So I am saying to you that um, this is a failure of the administration and the Congress. Uh, and be that as it may, I just want to go through some of the... Would the, uh, would the gentleman yield? I don't mean to pick contention with that point. I just had one thing that sure. I left out to sure. clarify in the record, and that is you, you had asked where I had gotten the... Uh, the statement that the judge in your case said the facts would have supported a conviction of a misdemeanor. Yes, sir. That was conveyed to the staff of the committee, of the subcommittee, from someone in the state's, attor state's attorney's office this morning who had punched it out on a, uh, a, a, I don't know, a Lexus screen or some kind of computer screen that keeps records of all these cases. So it is public record, and we can check on that. If and it's you can public, inform yourself. If it's public record, uh, then that is something for me to take up with uh, the state's attorney's office because uh, it's the court. The case has been sealed. Yeah, I think again, that's I don't want to get into the legal. Problem. I don't want to get into the legal niceties. But again, from my understanding, I hope the case right. is is in the public domain. I hope you're right. I'm sorry, and I think no, that's right. Um, I want to go through uh, uh, the remainder of the list of people that, that you may have contacted at HUD, and the reason I'm doing this is uh, I simply want to know uh, who was required to open what door for you uh, in your position, uh, clearly as you, as you acknowledge someone without the expertise but who was hoping to influence HUD. 
Um, I asked you, Philip, when, and you said you had no contact. You said you had written Samuel Pierce, and you didn't know Lance Wilson, you didn't know Deborah Gordine, you didn't know Tom Casey. Philip, when you said you really had no contact with at HUD, did you have any contact with Philip Abrams, who was FHA commissioner at HUD? Uh, very little. I think that um, mostly the contact that I have with him was through his um, executive assistant. Who was that? Her name was Mary Burke. Um, had you spoken on the phone with uh, Philip Wynn while he was under secretary? Excuse me, Philip Abrams while he was under secretary? Were you? I'm not going to tell you that I didn't, but I don't have any recollection that I did, and uh, because uh, I don't know, he um, he he was not available to me. Shirley Weisman. I have had uh, several conversations with Shirley Weisman. Yes, sir, in her office. So two, perhaps three times. Okay. Janet Hale? I've known Janet Hale for, at arm's length, for 20 years when she was uh, an assistant to one of our uh, legislators from Florida. And when she was in Tallahassee, I think she was there during the same period of time that I was the state chairman. Then she came to Washington and I touched base with her, but I never had any experience with her at HUD because uh, uh, I visited with her, I think, one time socially just to say hello, but uh, I had no official requests of her, no, no interest that in, I ask her to express on my behalf or any project. Silvio Di Bartolomez? About the same thing. Well, I shouldn't say it. that's not accurate. Uh, Silvio, uh, I knew him uh, as an executive assistant, I think, at one time to uh, Phil Abram, uh, yeah, Phil Abrams. I, I knew him. I uh, had one conversation with him uh, pertaining uh, to some HUD matters, uh, some uh, projects. Uh, when he was the general deputy assistant uh, to uh, the sec assistant secretary, um, I uh, talked strictly on the merits of the thing. So I don't. And I don't think that anything uh, came as a result of it. Tom Demery. Uh, I've had, um, I've forgotten now exactly when Demery came in. Follow, I guess it was following Barksdale, or was it Al Moran? I, I can't recall exactly when he came in. But uh, I think I met uh, Tom first in about 19... 87 is my recollection. Uh, when you were working on your project for Savannah and you wrote Deborah Gordine and you said, Here, Dear Debbie, here is the letter that you asked for from Savannah. Thank you, dated March 26. And then Debbie had her meeting on April 7, 1987, and she gives a list of projects. And on her wish list, uh, really it shouldn't be called a wish, li wish list. By the way, this committee that you talk about meeting uh, it was common knowledge on the street there was a committee that met. The only problem was the members of the committee didn't know it. They didn't know there was an, a, a, a committee such I've as heard that. that. Um, well, we heard it directly from the people. Um, but Savannah is her, is her 50. She wants that. And um, uh, Well, now, sir. Yeah. Let, let's Can go we, back and refresh our memory on this. And this is true that I did discuss that additional 50 units with Deborah Dean. If you right. recall, in my earlier testimony, it was because uh, we had been told that uh, by reapplying in another go-round that uh, in the pipeline process, uh, it would, uh, would be considered. And refresh me as to who told you that. Uh, Deborah Dean, as a matter of fact. Right. <laughs> um, Is that amusing? It is very amusing. Uh, it, it, only if you've been sitting up here. Uh, and and um, don't start crying. Well, it's um, I'm laughing through my tears. Sir. I see. Okay. Uh, now, with um, with this list, uh, Tom Demery now went over this list with her. Uh, did you have any contact with Tom Demery about Savannah? I would have to say that uh, I probably at one point or another did make some indication of my interest in the Savannah Project to Tom Demery. And uh, 
I, my recollection would uh, suggest that uh, he said it was under consideration, yes, sir. Okay. See, because really you did what had to be done. There, were, there was a battle between Deborah Gordine, as best we can tell, and Tom Demery, and you touched bases with both sides, and you were obviously right on target when you did that. I had asked you about Hunter Cushing, and you said you had no contact with Hunter Cushing, uh, but he was in charge of almost every 202 project that went, went, uh, went out of HUD, so I'm just amazed that you didn't have any contact, and I just want to make sure that you uh, uh, want to rethink that one through. I don't have any problem with that. Uh, I don't know when Hunter Cushing uh, went into his position, but uh, I have no recollection whatsoever. So 202 is basically you dealt through A.B. Weist. Weist. Abby Weist, rather. If, if you go back again, sir, and, and the dates uh, of this thing, I think, are, are significant. The 202 uh, that I was um, involved in came early on, and it may be... Yes, sir. It may be that Hunter Cushing wasn't there in that position at all. I have no recollection of talking to Hunter Cushing uh, about this, no, sir. See, from our knowledge, Mr. Demery does remember talking with you, and the indication he made to the committee was that you requested 75 and not 50. Do you ever remember requesting from Mr. Demery that you wanted 75 units? As a matter of fact, the, uh, the city of Savannah applied for 75. Do you remember requesting 75 from Mr. Demery? I was certainly supported the application for Savannah, yes, sir. Do you ever remember having a conversation with Mr. Demery where you asked for 75 units? I'm sure that I did, because that was what Savannah was asking for. Um, did you, uh, you're reco recorded as, uh, recorded uh, is probably not the best word, but uh, in your, um, in an article in the Hartford Current, which has been following these hearings, particularly as it relates to uh, Black Manafort and Stone, Manafort and Stone uh, the last two paragraphs of, of an article uh, that appeared there, uh, entitled House Panel Summons Consultant, uh, referring to you, it said, um, he also acknowledged, certainly my politics has assisted me all my adult life and in all my business ventures, end of quote, but he said he did not match the political stature of Manafort. I never was in that big league, he said, I would have liked to have been. Um, what contacts did you have with uh, Black, Manafort, and Stone or any of their people? I've had contacts with uh, Charlie Black uh, since uh, back in his earliest young Republican days when I was there, when Congressman Lukens was uh, running for uh, national chairman of the young Republicans. I've I've known Paul Manafort uh, in one capacity or another, going back to probably the 76 campaign. But for you've had four. a long time relationship. Have you ever um, uh, utilized their services to help you with any HUD projects? Not to utilize their services, no. I've never done any business uh, <coughs> with Black, Manafort, Stone, Kelly, and or any of the other. Or any of their people? Not to do business, no, sir. Okay. Well, I don't know what you mean to do business. In other words, you We've never had a joint business case together. You've, ne you've, never, we you've never paid them anything? Never. Okay. Well, now, let me, let me retract that. Are you limiting this to um, uh, HUD? Oh, I'm happy you asked that. Um, HUD first and uh, non-HUD second. So I want to get first. it on the record because uh, I did have one contract with uh, Black Manafort, Stone, and... Kelly, I think it was. Uh, it was a venture uh, dealing with a matter. They wanted me to collaborate with them in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, something that was pending before the Department of Transportation. And uh, there was a Jacksonville uh, entity down there. And uh, that was the sum total of it. I did one small job for which I was paid $5,000. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll just conclude. Um by uh, uh, saying to you, Mr. Taylor, that, that um, the fact that, you, um, that these hearings have given you pause is a, is a healthy sign. We have, um, we have found um, very little criminality. We found a lot of sleazy operations. We found a lot of things that we think are pretty smelly. We find a lot of things that um, 
uh, certainly cause us pause, including using Republican National Committee uh, uh, on your letterhead to do private business. Um, if, if in fact this has caused you uh, some concern, I think it's a healthy thing for you and the country. Because I couldn't help but think as you were testifying, well, everybody knows this is the way we do business in Washington. And um, one of the objectives of this committee is, uh, it may seem ambitious, uh, but is to change the way we do business in Washington. Good luck. You know what? It is a good luck, but uh, if we don't, uh, I see our country going down the tubes because I look at housing as the example and I see that the people who should have been helped aren't getting helped, but that people were making a lot of money off of it. And, and one of the sad things about your testimony is you said, you know, I served and did all these things uh, without remuneration. And I thought, you know, that's a good thing. That's the way the system's supposed to work. And then, then it seemed to me uh, as you matured, you said, I'm going to cash in on it. And that's a sad thing. And I hope that if there are some people who got to the first part of their life, they look at you on TV and say, I don't want to do the second part. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I just would like to add a footnote to what my colleague says. It goes to the very core of where we are as a society. It seems in recent years the people who haven't produced anything have made the most money whether it's multi-billion dollar leverage buyouts or sleazy political influence peddling, that's where the money has gone. While vast numbers of young families are, can't, buy, can't buy their first home and, uh, and the homeless are in the streets. So this is a very serious matter which, which we treat with the utmost uh, earnestness. This is not a peripheral item. James Watt's huge fees and your huge fees make some of us upchuck. That's what happens. When, when the real housing needs are not met and people like you and what are cashing into the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars because you have no knowledge of any kind, all you have is political influence peddling and you could be a lot less smug about it than you have been throughout much of this morning, Mr. Lukens. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to end from my, my viewpoint with a question that's always fascinating me. Of all the witnesses, I've asked it twice before, and I've got kind of an answer, but how does one infiltrate or work from the honest standpoint of just going in and find out what goes on in HUD or any other agency? You ended up with Deborah Gordine, but I'm still questioning my mind how you arrived at that key spot. Now, I understand you say you heard about it, it was on the street, and I can more or less accept that when you start working the corridors of any agency, I'm sure the word gets out, oh, you want to see so-and-so because he runs this or she runs this or he's really in charge, or when the secretary's gone, you don't want to see uh, that person, you want to see the assistant secretary. How did, you, how did you infiltrate HUD? Where did you start? You obviously, even though you're a national committee man from Florida, that, I don't think that really sold much to the average person in HUD. I wasn't national committee well, man. Whatever, Put a Republican big shot, or Democrat big shot in, in Democrat years, you walk into HUD, you walk into Transportation Interior, SBA. How do you work the system? We say that we're supposed to set up a system that works for the benefit of all the people, and then I'm always fascinated by how far, far short we fall. But tell me, as one individual, we'll, we'll just try to wrapping it up, how do you start and work up, and how do you kind of end up with a person like Deborah Gordine at the heart of it all? I can't say that it doesn't come as a result of anything that short-lived. It comes as a result of 35 years of experience that I've been involved in the political process, as I indicated earlier, stemming back to my young Republican days. I put a lot of time in, uh, paying but, my dues. Forgive me, but let's start with entering HUD. <laughs> entering HUD. You come HUD. up here to, to sell a legitimate package with a legitimate salary of public interest, and public dollars, and public time to HUD to, to further the cause of Jacksonville housing. Where do you start? Where did you start? In this, obviously all wasn't successful, but how do you work up to the center? In this particular case, I can take the example of the first trip that we made to Washington with the mayor of Jacksonville. And um, I had um, had a, uh, a contact w uh, through uh, the undersecretary, who at that time was Don Hubdy. Here, here we go again with and you're asking me how I got there. 
Yes, but I mean, there's a contact in the secretary's office. You knew someone, essentially, in the, in the undersecretary's office. Yes, sir. Okay. And that person started you on the track. That, I'm just trying to get an idea of how a person starts cold. You, you start just by saying, you know, you go to wherever you can, who is in charge of what and who, who do I, who should I talk to, who knows about this? Let me make it very quick and simple then. Was the first trip successful? Uh, yes or no? We'll yes. Okay. So it didn't take you long to penetrate. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. You made reference, Ms. Taylor, from time to time about your writing to the White House. Have you written to the White House or talked to anybody in the White House concerning any HUD-related project? Mr. Chairman, I have to go back and look at my record, but uh, it, would not, uh, it not, would not have been unusual if, um, if I did. Um, but I, I don't know the answer to that uh, specifically at if, this point. If you had been in touch with anyone at the White House in connection with the HUD-related project, who would that person have been? I would, I guess it would have been within the time frame of um, uh, when it occurred, when the need occurred. And so, you know, it would, that time would vary, the person would vary. Uh, whom did you feel comfortable with in terms of writing to concerning one of your HUD projects within the White House? If you assume that it was a HUD project, uh, yes, I, I, I don't know who, the answer to that right off the top of my head, but uh, it would have um, probably been somebody in the, uh, in the political shop or the intergovernmental affairs shop. To the best of your knowledge during this eight-year period that we are looking into, did you write to the White House in connection with the HUD-related project? Or did you call anyone there? Or did you have a meeting with anyone there? In all probability, I have contacted by telephone, and I think I can recall this, that who uh, is, there, there's always someone designated uh, in all the agencies that has a liaison with the White House and uh, I have, from time to time, uh, called the White House uh, asking for the appropriate person in the various agency, uh, who is it over there that uh, can help to put me. Uh, as a matter of fact, come to think about it, I think that's exactly how I became acquainted with Silvio de, uh, de, Bar de Bartolomez, that he was, at the time, the uh, White House contact person at HUD and I was sent over there, and I, I, I think I'm correct on that. Uh, I may be doing the man an injustice, but uh, I believe that's how I met Silvio. There was a person like that in every, sh in every place that throughout the government uh, you contacted. Would it have been your practice to try both approaches, to try HUD directly? in the person of Deborah Dean or somebody else and at the same time get in touch with someone at the White House? That would not have been a normal process, no, no sir. Would you have gone to the White House contact only if you didn't seem to be doing well at HUD? As a matter of fact, uh, that wasn't the way it worked at all. Uh, Please explain normally, how it worked. Normally, uh, if I had an assignment uh, in an agency where I did not have any, any information uh, about who was who and what was what, uh, I would go to two sources, either to the Republican National Committee to the liaison, or I would go to Intergovernmental Affairs at the White House and say, who is the person that we uh, have over there that can assist me in uh, providing me with the information that I need in order to uh, get the particular assignment accomplished? Was it information you were seeking, Mr. Taylor? Yes, sir. You were not seeking assistance? I've never, I've never asked the White House, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm really glad you asked this, I've never asked the White House to assist me uh, in any, anything, uh, you know, Why to did influence them mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Why did you have no compunction in asking political appointees in HUD, but apparently you had compunctions in asking political appointees in the White House?
I don't know that I really know the answer to that. Uh, what do you think is the answer? I, I guess I just didn't feel like th there was a step that, that was necessary. Because you could get your job done just by contacting HUD? J well, just by contacting whichever agency that I was moving toward, yes, sir. Is there anything else you would like to share with the subcommittee, Ms. Taylor? No, sir, I can't think of, there were some things a while ago that I had, but uh, th I think that right now they, I can't recall what they are and they would be rather... Ms. Taylor, we will provide you with the transcript of this hearing. Subcommittee staff will be in touch with you. We want to thank you very much for your patience and your, your cordiality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the next witness <coughs> is uh, Ms. Linda Murphy, an attorney here in Washington. Ms. Murphy, you come up to the witness table. Raise your right hand. You swear to solemnly tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Please be seated. Ms. Murphy, for the record, if you are accompanied by counsel, you may identify counsel. Yes, I am accompanied. And please speak right into that mic. I'm accompanied by Mr. Brand. He's representing me as counsel in these hearings. We are pleased to have Mr. Brand. Um, if you have any opening statement, uh, it will be entered in the record in its entirety. You may proceed in any way you choose. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I'm Linda Murphy. I'm currently a partner in the law firm of Barrett, Montgomery & Murphy here in Washington, D.C., where I specialize in real estate and real estate finance law. The firm is Red Book Bond Council. I'm a graduate of the University of California, Bolt Hall, and Harvard Law School. Prior to re-entering private practice in 1982, I was attorney advisor, special assistant to the Assistant Secretary for Housing from 1979 to May of 1980. In May 1980, I became director of the Office of State Agencies and Bond Finance Programs, where I served till 1982. I was also the tax policy advisor for the Assistant Secretary for Housing. Now and since leaving government, the majority of my practice involves transactional real estate law, functioning as closing counsel, bond counsel, underwriters counsel, and FHA counsel. My practice is also an administrative and regulatory law practice. Both areas of law require an extensive analysis, knowledge, and interpretation of the law, including the Internal Revenue Code and regulations, handbooks, and policies governing the real estate issues and tax aspects of matters in which I am involved. I'm anxious to cooperate with the committee in this investigation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. And let me indicate for the record that you are appearing on a voluntary basis, and we appreciate your presence. Could you first Tell the subcommittee in as much detail as you feel is relevant to our investigation what specific responsibilities you had at HUD, with whom you worked at HUD, and why you left HUD. I joined HUD on January 15, 1979. I was the attorney's advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Housing and a special assistant. My major are, uh, areas of responsibility where I worked for the assistant secretary was urban policy and uh, tax matters. Um, in 1980, May of 1980, I became the office director of the state agencies and bond finance programs at HUD. This, pro this area had responsibility for all the bond programs that were administered by the department, including the regulations governing the, the state agencies throughout the country that participated in the HUD programs, as well as the implementation of various bond uh, programs that would help finance low-income housing in this country. Uh, I, in that capacity, I also served as a tax policy advisor to the Assistant Secretary for Housing, which position I continued till 1982. In 1982, I was offered a position uh, in a law firm in Washington, D.C., which I accepted. Uh, I stayed with that firm and was a partner in that firm in 1985. I formed the current firm with my partners.
You worked with two private law firms from 1982 to the present. One firm from 1982 until 1985, the other law firm since 1985. That is correct. How much of your practice in the first law firm entailed HUD-related activity? I think I can sum my practice up very simply, and it had to do basically with the tax code and the changes that were made in the tax code. Upon leaving government, I was primarily involved in financing uh, with tax-exempt bonds low-income housing projects. In, that, uh, I, in those capacities and doing that work, I basically was underwriters counsel, FHA counsel, and bond counsel. That continued uh, to be the primary focus, and I have to say in some cases 80, 90 percent of my focus, through uh, December 1985. Thereafter, because of tax law changes, the volume cap that was imposed and the limited amount of uh, volume cap that could be allocated to rental housing projects, there was not the, uh, the, 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 um, there was not the volume of business in that area. Thereafter, uh, we did the occasional bond deal, two, three, four a year. Uh, my practice basically was concentrated on other method methods of financing low and moderate income housing. Uh, since that time, my major representation is involved in tax exempt bonds, when and if we uh, are involved, now normally 501c3 bonds, uh, representing lenders, uh, representing uh, developers, uh, working with the FHA, representing developers, trying to structure programs uh, and developments using the various overlays of HUD programs. We are, I am particularly specialized in that area. Uh, Ms. Murphy, while at HUD, could you designate the individuals to whom you reported? Yes, as attorney advisor and special assistant, I reported to the assistant secretary, Lawrence B. Simons. Uh, when I became the director of the Office of State Agencies and Bond Finance Programs, that was under the, um, uh, what the title? It was uh, the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing. And that person, there was a variety of persons that served in that. Do you recall the names? Yes. Yeah, there was a Marilyn Malconian, but I think she left before I came in. There was an Alexander Pyres. There was a Michael Karam. And there was someone else, and I simply can't recall. Is there anybody else you worked for at HUD? Well, I also, in the capacity as tax policy advisor, in the tax policy committees, I was often called upon by the undersecretary um, to advise him on tax policy matters. Who was that? Uh, Donald Hubdy. Now, when you left HUD, and you became associated with two law firms consecutively, did any HUD employee work for you, any former HUD employee work for you? Uh, yes. Um, about a year after I started my practice, I hired a woman named Monica Sussman to work with me at both law firms. Did Deborah Dean ever work for you? Deborah Dean did not work for me in the period of time we're talking about. In 1988, and I believe it was May 23rd, 1988, Deborah um, uh, worked for me under a consulting contract. Could you just specify that M Ms. Dean worked for you dur during? Her, her company worked for me, Dean and Associates, under a consulting contract. Well, let me be sure I understand this precisely. Ms. Deborah Dean had a company which, to the best of your knowledge at the time, had how many principals? I believe, uh, I can't be sure. I did the best of my knowledge, I think, she herself. I think um, John Mitchell was also a principal. I do not know that for a fact. The, fir the former attorney general? Yes. I'm get I, that is a real guess. Yes. But your work was mainly with Ms. Deborah Dean? Yes. When did this consulting arrangement commence? It started in May of 1988. May of 1988. That is correct. How did this consulting arrangement come about? Debbie had left government, I believe, in July 1987. 
Um, she was under her one-year ban from HUD. Um, I had talked to her several times, asking her questions regarding certain issues in which I was interested, broad issues. Uh, and she gave me responsive and good advice um, through various discussions and negotiations. What kinds of advice uh, could you give us some examples? It strikes me that you having gone to, uh, and I don't think anybody will dispute this, two of the finest schools in the country, uh, having uh, attained um, uh, an outstanding education, a law degree at Harvard, working within HUD, what kind of consulting from Ms. Dean were you in need of? Well, now this was the summer of 1988. Yes. I, I normally work 10 to 12 hour days. During this period, I was expecting my second child, and I was greatly slowed down and wasn't getting around as much as I should be. Debbie had, she was actively. My younger daughter is a lawyer, and she has four children, so I understand <laughs> the workload involved. Uh, Debbie was, was still very much hands-on, was reading the trade press, was very much involved in things that were involving. For example, and, and I would ask her, how, what was, have you all seen anything there, a waiver of this particular regulation? Um, what's the feeling for workouts in this particular area? Is this person against it or for it? When do you hear this memo's coming out? Uh, things where I could get quick and short answers, too, that didn't take my time at this time when I was trying to slow down quite a bit. How long have you known Ms. Dean? I met Debbie in 1979. In 1979, in what context? I was introduced to her by my husband, who was at that time I was dating, and um, his roommate, who was dating Deborah. And during the course of this decade, 79, 89, how would you characterize your relationship with Ms. Dean? We were friends. You have, you continue to be? We are friends. You are friends, very good. How frequently did you see her during this period? Well, it basically depended on frequently she saw her, her boyfriend, um, to be candid. Um, we saw her quite a bit, I believe in the period of 80, no, 80 didn't see her very much through 81, 82, when she was at Energy. Uh, there were some times when we see a lot of each other, and I would estimate we would have dinner or go out uh, once a month. Right. Um, Did you uh, approach her with respect to any of the projects that any of your clients had? while you were in private practice as an attorney and she was at HUD? Yes. Could you explain those contacts? It was in the context. Could you pull the mic a little closer? In reviewing my records and um, determining the time frames in which I had brought issues up to the secretary's office, um, it wasn't until after we were finished uh, the uh, plethora of bond financings that were happening in the end of 1985. Um, it was sometime in 1986 um, that I brought one issue to her that was an issue uh, involving, um, I believe it was 882-408. It was a special rent adjustment. Uh, it was a, we had worked with the general counsel's office, the assistant general counsel for assisted housing and getting an opinion what items qualified in those categories as special rent adjustments. There was no assistant secretary in place. Um, the, off, the area office was going back and forth between HUD Central and no one was moving. Um, the client had been working with the area office, HUD Central, in this case, I believe there was a state agency involved, and just was going back and forth. Um, I met with Deborah and asked her if she could give some help, if she could help the staff look at this, look at this uh, opinion we had from their own general counsel and help us see if our categories of items fit within the categories that the general counsel said were permissible. Uh, my other distinct memory of meeting with Deborah was in the summer of 1985. Um, I attended a meeting in the secretary's <coughs> conference room Deborah was in attendance. Uh, Silvio de Bartolomeus was in, in attendance. 
um, the general counsel, I think it was Michael Dorsey was in attendance, Hunter Cushing was in attendance, and I'm sorry I don't remember the other names. Um, Whom were you representing at that at meeting? Since it's a matter of public record, at that time I was representing DRG. In fact, I, I wasn't put on retainer to DRG till, uh, till September 1985. But after um, the work had been done on the May 9th memo had come out, um, there was a feeling, there was a lot of bitter tension in feelings. And I'm a great believer of, let's put everybody in room, tell us what's wrong with you, what you feel was unjust. And I don't know for, what For the record. DRG is the company which has, as I recall, a $538 million portfolio currently under default, and it's been barred from conducting any business with HUD and is under investigation by the Attorney General and the FBI. Is that correct? That is my understanding. When did DRG initially employ you, Ms. Murphy? September 1985. September 1985. That is correct. For what purpose? Um, I was rather their general counsel giving them advice on a lot of issues. I was their closing attorney on some of their project loans. Were you involved with the Colonial House project? I was not involved as a closing attorney. I know of the project. Was anybody in your firm involved with the Colonial House project? Not in the original financing. I believe that was some time prior to my representation of DRG. Did you have any involvement during your work for DRG with Colonial House? Yes, I did. Could you describe that? Um, Colonial House was a defaulted project. And, and forgive me for interrupting you, but I think this is relevant. Was your involvement contemporaneous with Secretary Carla Hill's involvement? Did it precede it? Did it follow it? it? I started, I was put on retainer in September 1985. Mrs. Hills has testified that she worked through the summer of 85. You were not involved with the Colonial House, with DRG, at any time while Secretary Hills was involved? No, I, my firm, the prior firm into which I was um, yes. employed, that firm was engaged, one of the partners was engaged by one of the people who was involved in this pre-commitment process. He was frustrated and hired uh, my partner to go in there to see if they could sit down and, and get um, DRG and the staff to work out so he could finance his project. Uh, in that capacity, I was asked to assist him. Go ahead. Um, I believe we were discussing the Colonial House project. Yes. Okay. That project had defaulted, and I'm sorry I'm not clear on the dates, but it was defaulted. It was a tremendous drain on the company. Um, I made, I... Um, what, what do you mean it was a tremendous drain on the company? Well, one of the problems with the co-insurance program, and in this, this particular development in particular, is when the mortgage or defaults, the lender must continue paying out on the yes. Jenny Mays. And while they're trying to get a hold of this project, you could go one or two years continually paying out on the Jenny Mays, far exceeding what your actual loss will be when you finally settle your claim. Uh, when uh, Secretary Hills appeared before the subcommittee, uh, we discussed uh, DRG at some length and uh, we discussed a, what has become known as the notorious nine-page letter from Sam Pierce to the president of DRG. Have you ever seen that letter? Yes, I have. I characterize that letter as a classic case of non sequitur, something that doesn't follow. In this nine-page letter, Mr. Pierce outlines a list of inappropriate acts by DRG. And then in the final paragraph, he nevertheless lifts the restriction on DRG of pre-clearing commitments. 
Have you seen this letter at any time? Yes, I have. When did you see that letter? The first time I saw it was in, when it was in a draft form, uh, probably the day of its issuance. In May of 1985? Yes. How would you characterize the letter, Ms. Murphy? It was, as Mrs. Hill said, a severe bill of particulars. Well, it was a very severe bill of particulars with the concluding paragraph being 180 degrees different from the severe bill of particulars. Would you agree with that? Yes. How do you explain that the secretary, on a matter of such tremendous import, would issue a document which gives chapter and verse on the committee's breach on, on the company's breaches of HUD rules and regulations and procedures and laws, and then in the last paragraph turns around and lifts the restriction. I can give my explanation. Well, that's all I'm asking you. It's not your letter. You are lucky not to have written this letter. I um, hope you didn't write this letter. Did no, you? No, I did not write this letter. Um, when you're looking at these comments, that you, you have to take a look at them in the context of what was the client's response to it. And I believe, and I don't have a copy of it, but there was a response to this letter. And one thing I do remember in the response to the letter was there was an accusation that HUD did not approve their personnel. And the response was to submit all the approval of the personnel that um, supposedly wasn't approved. So I, I do know that over the months that DRG was tussling with the staff, mostly that I wasn't involved in, but that there were, there were some give and takes. In my understanding, at the end of this pre-commitment process, there were, out of the majority of the loans were approved as written. They were slipshod, they were shoddy, they had problems perhaps, as noted in the letter, but they were approved based on the fact that they were approved Without noticeable changes in the mortgage amounts, I would say the secretary decided, my explanation would, clean these acts up. But um, since we've approved X, Y, Z, and I'm not sure of my numbers, Mr. Lantos, I'm sorry. Um, I did not expect to get into this line of questioning. Um, since we approved X, Y, and Z, well, just fix these other things and you'll be fine. In retrospect, Secretary Hill's admitted that uh, Secretary Pierce's decision was the wrong decision. Would you agree with that judgment? If you say the loss to the federal government could have been stopped based on... Much earlier. Much earlier. And with a far yes. smaller amount of tax yes. dollars being lost right. to the American taxpayer. What I don't know, Mr. Lantos, and what I haven't done the analysis, at that time, I, it's been admitted from the record, there are two co-insurers under this pre-commitment review. Two big ones. I don't know what the letter to the other co-insurer said. Um, but what I do, don't know is how many projects were pre this pre-commitment review and how many were after. I, I think I, I can't make that judgment. Congressman Shays. Thank you. Uh, when you asked the question of the witness, uh, if she had uh, drafted the May 10th letter, uh, I, I would like to know for the record if you know if uh, you are aware if anyone had any part in the drafting of this letter that you are aware of. This uh, is the letter to the head of DRG. I saw the letter in draft form. I'm sorry I don't have it with me. Um, and it was written by, uh, uh, in the multifamily staff in the co-insurance division. When I saw it, I said, this, this doesn't make sense here or there. That was communicated through Deborah, because I gave my comments to Deborah, to Silvio, who said, no, the letter's going to stand as it is. And that's how it went out. To my knowledge, there's no noticeable that? change. Well, I just have one question. At this time, you were no longer a member of the HUD staff. Is that correct? That's correct. So you saw a letter, a very important letter, involving hundreds of millions of dollars in subsequent losses to the American taxpayer. 
signed by, to be signed by the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development before it became final? No, I believe it was final when I saw it. Well, you saw it in draft form. The, the, it was not yet signed by the Secretary, is that correct? I think it had gone through all its concurrences. I did see it before it was issued. I don't, you, I now, it was, it was not issued at the time I saw it. At the time you saw it, it was an internal HUD document. Yes, it was. Who gave it to you? Um, the person who brought it into the office where I was sitting was uh, Nancy Murray. I'm sorry? Was he a special assistant to Silvio de Bartolomeos. What is your judgment as a distinguished attorney of a draft document of major import which eventually signed by the secretary of the relevant department being shown to an attorney of the company whose livelihood depended on this decision as we were made to understand. First of all, my livelihood did not Not your livelihood. I said the company's life, DRG's livelihood. Um, first of all, I think having been in government, having worked in government, there's a lot of things that the people, when they write things in government, in artfully state, that have to go back and clarify and clarify. Um, so it is, it is common that portions of letters would be read uh, when I was there and afterwards, where there would be a give and take about the language. So I didn't find um, seeing something prior to it being signed is particularly momentous. I wasn't inputting on it. I wasn't drafting it. Uh, I would have written it differently. I would have made it clearer. Ms. Murphy, I am not blaming you for seeing it. I am asking you a different question. I am asking you as an attorney what your judgment is of the following set of facts. DRG is a company which is a major player, one of two major players in a large government loan program. Is that correct? That is correct. It enters this program, it enters this program in 1983 when the program commences. Is that correct? That's correct. And in 1984 or 85, 84, it is put on a very severe probation. It is no longer allowed, it is no longer allowed to make commitments on loans without getting the prior approval of the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Is that correct? That is correct. One of the people they hire is former Secretary of HUD, Carla Hills, who told me in our private meeting, and I believe he may have said it at the public hearing, it certainly is consistent with the testimony, that DRG felt they, they became simply non-competitive, having been put on pre-clearance notification. Would you agree with that judgment? I was not privileged to having attorney-client privilege. I mean, I was not talking to them as their attorney I'm at I'm not that asking time. you that. I'm asking your general judgment about this set of facts. I was not their attorney either. I fully understood, though, what Secretary Hills told me. I think Secretary Hills is absolutely correct. If one company can approve loans without having to obtain prior approval by HUD, while the other company must obtain prior approval, then the company that must obtain prior HUD approval, which may take days, weeks, months, is at a distinct disadvantage. Isn't that accurate? That is accurate. I mean, that would be analogous to going to an automobile dealership and dealing with salesman A, who can make a deal like that, you offer him a price and he says yes or no, but salesman B has to go back to the sales manager and get his approval. The second salesman is at a disadvantage. And in the case of DRG, this disadvantage is not the disadvantage of the client having to wait a half an hour longer, but it may mean that the deal collapses because the 
client will not wait two weeks or four weeks or three months. Is that correct? Yes, they were at a disadvantage given this process. Was that a serious disadvantage? I can't be the judge of that because my understanding at the well, time... Well, Miss, Mrs. Hills had no reluctance, well, and if you have reluctance, I, I honor that. I won't press well, you. The reason I'm saying that is I also knew that York was also involved, and I don't know how many players there were out at the time in the program, so I don't know who was competing at that time. Mr. Chairman? Well, uh, surely. <laughs> I just, uh, it will be a lot easier for me to follow this line of questioning, which is extraordinarily important if we can just, uh, in, it's, uh, if I can at least be satisfied as to, to a response to a question that we were both pursuing here. I asked you if you, the, the, the chairman asked if you wrote this letter and you said no. You then said you saw a draft of a letter. This, this letter by the secretary dated May 10th. You have told the committee you did not work for DRG until September of 85, and this was May 10th of 1985 that this letter was written. That's correct. Now, you told me someone in multifamily, you told the committee someone in multifamily wrote the letter. Who in multifamily wrote the letter? I believe the author, it had several clearances on it. I believe the author started with Ken Boren. Um, you'd have to pull the HUD internal memo to see the clearance sheets. By the time I saw it, it had been cleared all the way up through. Okay, all the way up through to Deborah Gordine? I don't know whether it was for Deborah. I didn't, I didn't study the clearance block. Oh, I had looked at the letter. I knew it was uh, in final. I thought it was, in some cases, inartfully written. And the letter went out as was. Now, you did not work for HUD at the time, correct? I did not work for HUD. Why would they show you this letter? Mr. Shays, when you work with a department, as when you're working on legislation, there's a common give and take. If there's something no, totally... No, I'm missing something. No, you, you, you're assuming I know something that I don't know, and I'm, I apologize. You were not working for HUD at the time, correct? No, I was not. Were you working for DRG at the time? I was working. My law firm was employed by one of the people who was in pre-commitment review. Who was that? I'm sorry, I don't know the client. It was my partner who was the primary person on it. So you're saying you had no connection with DRG up to that time? No, I did not. Okay. And you saw a letter that affected DRG significantly. Yes, I did. Uh, now, please explain to me. Is this all right if I... <laughs> well, I, 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 merely, I, I merely want to commend my distinguished colleague because, uh, because he is asking exactly the question I was going to ask you, and I will right. let him pursue no, his I, line I'm of gonna, reasoning because he's doing it so superbly. No, you will need to explain <laughs> to both Congressman Shays and to me and to the rest of the members of, of this subcommittee and you have a tremendous advantage over us, Ms. Murphy, because you are an outstanding uh, attorney, and uh, we are not. But, but, but we have some sort of peasant common sense that, that sort of is riled by this. You are not working for HUD That's on May 10, correct? May 10, 85. That is correct. You are not working for this big, big underwriter which is on, on probation. I am almost tempted to say on the dean's list. Uh, they have been bad boys. They have misbehaved. They have misbehaved. They have done a lot of things which are wrong. And they're, they're put in this tremendously non-competitive situation. Now here you are, and you will have to define your entry into that review process. Now I will, I will enjoy my colleague pursuing this. You're neither with HUD nor with DRG, but this all-important letter that lifts this burden from DRG in draft form is given to you. I yield to my colleague. I'm Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to wait. I've got my questions answered to this point. I just couldn't follow one part. Explain this. Explain how I would see a letter that was about to go out? Well, it's not an unreasonable question, Ms. Murphy. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, al not, al al allow me, let me give you another example from, from, from another field. Suppose the Department of Defense is about to suspend or lift the suspension of a major defense contractor. You work neither for the Department of Defense nor for, the great, nor for the defense contractor. But somehow, somebody gives you 
this all-important draft letter to review, which you say was not that artfully written. Wouldn't you ask a question of how you came to be given this draft? I, I mean, they didn't show it to, to um, any of my colleagues on this panel. They didn't show it to thousands of other attorneys in this town. Why did they show it to you? I'm not so sure it was shown to me in that context. Um, let me go back a step. This letter wasn't crafted from whole cloth without the input of uh, the many months that the client was Forget going the letter. How did you get to read the draft? before Sam Pierce signed it and made it a public document. What was your entree okay. to the draft? I believe I saw previous drafts while it was being written because I worked, I was there, I asked to see it, I asked what was going on. There was nothing to be changed. I wasn't trying to influence the draft. I was trying to see the draft. Mr. Chairman, Why? Would you, would you, Mr. Chairman, would you yield? I'll be happy to yield to my friend. What the chairman is asking you, what Mr. Shays is asking you is, what were you doing at HUD? What were you doing there? You were, who were you representing? What capacity were you there? My law firm was representing the d one of the developers who was in the pre-commitment process. This letter, uh, if it released uh, this client or if it put him in a different process, would have let their, um, their case, their loan, um, be processed outside of the HUD pre-commitment review process. So that through the representation by your firm of that partner of DRGs, you, you were involved in the process. Is that what you're telling the subcommittee? That's, that's correct. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, I, I, I think there is something that we probably, I've been reminded that I'm not quite being clear on one issue, so let me say. I think that's the understatement I, of the afternoon. I was not representing, I, my law partner, was representing um, this uh, mortgage or that was in the pre-commitment review, I was not. But not DRG? Not DRG. This letter related to DRG? That's correct. This letter related to Sam Pierce lifting the pre-commitment obligation under which DRG was laboring with great competitive disadvantage. That's correct. Mr. Chairman? Please. There was another company that was under pre-commitment review, and that was York. Was it York that your law firm was representing? No, um, Mr. Shays, my law firm was representing, one of the partners in my law firm was representing a, d a client that was stuck in this pre-commitment review process. Who was process. that client? I'm sorry, Mr. Shays, I do not know. It was not my But client. why were you there then if you don't even know who your partner was because representing? Because I was assisting, I, I was assisting my partner who was representing this so client. So let me ask you this, though. Were you assisting your par uh, partner in getting some advanced information about maybe a competitor no. of DRG? No. Okay. Why were you at HUD? Why were you given this letter? I was at HUD trying to find out the timing of the release of this letter. We all knew this letter. Release of what letter? The letter, the May 9th letter. But why would you care? You're not representing DRG. Because we had a client who, once this letter came out, could proceed to loan closing. Proceed to what? To close his loan. Okay, this his is some project was under review. His project was being taken care of by DRG? His he was project, a client of DRG? His project, when DRG does a loan, they have clients, mortgage or entities, that come in and apply for the loan. Under the pre-commit re review process that DRG and York were, they couldn't say, we'll commit to this loan until HUD underwrote it as well. And that apparently, from the testimony I've heard, was months. So the client, who had substantial time invested in this, I assume, invested, wanted to close his loan as soon as possible. And until DRG was out of the pre-commitment review, he could not close his loan. So you were, you, your office was representing a client who was doing work with DRG, and, and obviously they had a vested interest in what happened to DRG. Is that not correct? They had a vested interest in getting their loan closed. They had a vested interest in making sure that DRG could move forward. Is that not correct? I don't think they would care. If their loan was approved in the pre-commitment review, I don't think they would have cared what happened to DRG. So was this letter casually handed to you, or did you request it? This letter was rather casually handed to me because it was on its way out the door. Okay. And this was a letter that you knew had been written because Deborah Gordine did, let me ask. No. This letter I knew had been written 
from discussions with the staff, from the ongoing negotiations that everybody was having with the staff? Well, Mr. Chairman, I can just say to you, you know, maybe it's just, again, like the previous uh, person who testified said, this is the way we do business in Washington. But it strikes me that you were a HUD official. You had a client, and they had no, they had no knowledge of who your client was. They don't, didn't know if you maybe even were representing uh, someone competing with the RG, and yet you're given advance notice of a letter. And you don't seem to be surprised by it. Uh, I'm surprised that you're not surprised. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I want to pursue this some uh, a, a bit further. It is your testimony, Ms. Murphy, that one of your associates in the private law firm where you worked had a client who was doing business with DRG. Is that correct? It had a loan application into DRG. That is correct. Had a loan application into DRG. And you state correctly that the client of your law partner was interested in having the restrictions on DRG lifted. Is that correct? No, I didn't state that. I said the client. Well, I am stating that. Would that be true? Would it have been to the advantage of your client to have the pre-clearance restriction lifted? Would yes. it have helped his business? If it enabled him to, the cl to close his loan, yes, it would. Well, isn't not, is it not reasonable to assume that if DRG does not need to go for pre-clearance, then it can close without pre-clearance, and that would help your client? That is correct. That is correct. So your client had a direct interest in having this letter come out the way it did, namely lifting the pre-clearance obligation. Is that true? My partner's client did, yes, that is true. It, your law firm's client. My law firm's client did, yes. Your law firm's client had that interest. Yes. Okay. But you were not the particular lawyer who dealt with this client, but one of your associates did. Is that one correct? One of my partners, that is correct. But it was you who was shown the letter. Probably because I'm so familiar with HUD, I do so much work in there. I knew the drafter of the letter. I knew the basic context. Um, I, this, this negotiations over what the status of DRG in York, York would be have been going on for quite some time. Yes, so I, I did have, I knew it was coming out. Everybody knew. We were just waiting for it. And was the letter shown to you as a finished product, a fait accompli, or was it shown to you for your comments or observations? Did anybody, wh who gave you that letter? I, or tested, the I testified before that Nancy Murray, who was an assistant secretary, I'm sorry, will you repeat the name? Nancy Murray. Nancy Murray. Who was, assistant, was a special assistant to Silvio de, Bar de Bartolomeus. Yes. Was the one who I got the letter from. All I didn't right. get the letter. I happened to see the letter, yes. Well, the letter it's, was a, an, uh, it's a nine page letter. I mean, you see a picture, you don't read, you don't see a nine page letter. You either read a nine-page letter or you don't read it. Did you read it or did you not read it? The truth of the matter, I'd probably say I perused it. I did not you read it. You perused it. Peruse is a, is a fancy word for reading it fast. Yes. OK. So you read the nine pages fast. That is correct. And it was your judgment at the time, or it is your judgment now retrospectively, that it was not artfully written. Am I quoting you correctly? That's correct. That's a legal term. That means the turn of the phrases could have been better. But it doesn't relate to the substance. That's correct. So let's deal with the substance. When you peruse the nine-page letter, by the way, how long did it take you to peruse nine pages? Um, I have no idea. Well, give me a clue. 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. When, when you read this letter or perused it, the nine pages, what was your reaction to the substance of the letter? Um, I thought it was a, is a pretty tough bill of particulars. 
I agree with you. It was a pretty tough bill of particulars. And when you reach the last paragraph, were you as stunned as I was when I perused the nine pages? No. It made good sense to you to have this very stiff bill of particulars, nine pages, pointing out all of the horrible things you did. You know, an analogy I would use would be to, to have a, a, a child have a curfew of, I don't know, 9 p.m. And you write that child a nine-page letter saying, now, you know, on Monday, you were supposed to be here at 9 p.m. You came in at 11. On Tuesday, you didn't come home at all. On Wednesday, on Wednesday, you came in at midnight. And it goes on and on and on and on. And then at, at, the, at the end of the nine pages, you say, but you will no longer need to check in because I have such great confidence in you that you will be in, in, in at curfew time. Why didn't it stun you when it stunned everybody else I talked to? I think it's because I, I was involved in the give and take or was knowledgeable about the give and take between the HUD staff. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Please. You said you were involved in the give or take. Would you please explain that? Well, I would hear from my partner what they said about this. I would hear uh, from DRG how they, re I would hear from my partner how they were responding to HUD. Um, I had conversations uh, with one of the chief professional people from DRG who was working this process. And their statements to me who were, was that? it was a man named John Ogilvie. Okay. Uh, their statements were to me, yes, uh, they're wrong on this, but we haven't convinced them. We've got to get this. Uh, but the understanding I had, not being intimately involved in it, was they did approve uh, a large majority of the deals at the same mortgage amount that went into HUD. Therefore, HUD and the lender at that time were in agreement. So yes, you can say, fix this up. But in the process, you had the majority of the projects that went in came out exactly as they went in. And that is my understanding. And that's why I could see, and I think in the process, it was a learning process for both sides in that event. Well, the bottom line, though, was you were involved in this process. And uh, it didn't just begin when you came in to HUD and said, there's this letter, I want to take a look at it. No, no, and I didn't state that. I said my law firm was engaged. I was, my partners and I would consult. Had your law firm seen a, a draft of this letter before, uh, an earlier draft of this letter? I don't know that. I mean, is it possible that I they know, saw an earlier draft I of this letter? I don't think so. I know I didn't, and I don't think so. They may have. I can't answer for my law partners. When you finished perusing the nine pages, did you communicate with anybody at HUD what you thought of the letter? I communicated back to Nancy Murray um, some comments. They, none of them very substantive. Nothing changed. Um, the letter went out. I mean, the letter was done by the time I saw it. I have no idea who Miss Murray is, but uh, maybe you can help me with this. Did Miss Murray show you this draft, which presumably should have gone to the secretary of HUD before you saw it? Uh, did she? show it to you on her own authority, or did someone authorize her or instruct her or ask her to show it to you? Debbie, Deborah Gordine asked her to show it to me. Deborah Gordine asked Miss Murray to show you a draft of a most important document which was not yet signed by the secretary of HUD, Mr. Sam Pierce, for purposes of obtaining your input, advice, suggestions for modifications? No. Well, for what purpose? I was interested in it. We had a client. Well, lots of people are interested in public documents before they are issued. You have to be a little bit more forthcoming. Well, I'm trying to be as forthcoming, Mr. Lantris, as I can. The co this letter was not, didn't bloom upstairs. Uh, without ha having tremendous amount of input from both sides. Up through conversations with my partner. Um, 
I also knew that uh, uh, several of the, uh, the, the majority of the projects had come in and gone out the same. And I believe there was a letter into HUD afterwards. Um, I was more out of curiosity than anything else. But I, I want to step back for a second, if you'll permit me. Um, you mean it was intellectual curiosity that motivated you to want no. to see this letter, which was of such great importance to your law firm? No, Mr. Landers, it wasn't of such great importance to my law firm. This is one of the issues that we were working on in the department at the time. Um, and it wasn't intellectual curiosity. I'm this sorry, I don't understand when you said You were not working at the department at the time. I understand that, but Well, I think you just said that we were working. Well, I'm sorry. We were working as attorneys at the department. We were working with our clients at the department. Um, I think, um, I don't know what Secretary Hill said, but when you're working, letters don't come up through the many layers of bureaucracy without going through lots of hands and lots of discussions. My understanding, and I wasn't intimately involved, is there were lots of discussions coming out. There was no secret in that. Uh, mine was there to verify. I saw it come out. It wasn't that I was there specifically. Were to do there that. other attorneys not working for HUD whose comment for modification was invited prior to Secretary Pierce's signature, to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, I do not know. So, to the best of your knowledge, you are the only non HUD attorney who was shown this draft and who was given the privilege of commenting on it. Is that correct? Um, I think I, well, let's go back. I said I saw the, this in final form. Uh, it may, I might have Well, it the wasn't word. yet final form. It, it hadn't been signed by the secretary. That's correct. Okay. So it's not in fine, it's a right. draft right. until the secretary right. affixes his signature to it. Are we in accord on that? Are we in accord on that? until the secretary affixes his signature. It is not an official document. Is that I correct? I will agree that it is not an official document until it is signed by the secretary in this instance. Now, why do you think you were asked to comment on this very important document before it became final, um. and not any one of hundreds of other equally competent housing attorneys working in this city? I was not asked to comment on, on you it. You were given an opportunity to comment because Ms. Nancy Murray gave you the draft. I was given an opportunity to read it or peruse it as a To word. peruse it. That's correct. Well, what other housing attorneys were given the opportunity to peruse it? I do not know if there are any others or whoever else was working at HUD at the time. To the best of your knowledge, you were the only non-HUD attorney who was given an opportunity to study a document which had great bearing on the future business of a major company called DRG and of your client. Is that correct? I had the opportunity to review the final draft, yes, and I don't know if any other attorney did. That's a fair statement. And you are, your testimony is, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were given this opportunity because Ms. Dean allowed or directed Ms. Ms. Murray to show it to you? I, Mr. Chairman, I don't mean to, um, I don't have a memory of that. I don't, um, and I'm not sure why. Well, let me help you. Would Ms. Murray have done it on her own authority? What is your judgment, if you don't know? I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether if I had asked Nancy, can I take a look at that, um, whether she would have given it to me or not. I just don't know. Well, we will ask Ms. Murray, <clears throat> but I'm asking you now what your hunch is. <clears throat> and if you don't know, I understand you don't know, but you have a judgment. Was Ms. Murray taking this kind of responsibility upon herself, or do you think she was directed to do so by Ms. Dean? Nancy Murray knew me. She knew I was an expert in my field. I don't know whether she would. I'd sort of take a guess. Yes, I guess she might have. You'll have to ask Ms. Murray. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Mr. 
Did you discuss this document at any time with Ms. Dean? I do not have a recollection of discussing it with Deborah. She may have been in the room at the time I made the comments to Nancy. I don't remember. What specific comments do you recall you made with respect to the document? I do not recall. They, they weren't substantive. They were just the phrasing. It wasn't, the, the letter was, it was done. It was, as I understood, it was going to be from the negotiations at the staff level. Um, I don't remember. Mr. Chairman? Would, would you just please clarify, uh, Deborah Gordine instructed Nancy Murray to, to give you a copy of the letter. Wh when would Deborah Gordine have known you wanted to see the letter? Where were you talking about this letter? And, and you obviously had a conversation with Deborah Gordine about this letter because she instructed Nancy Murray to give you a copy of this letter. Mm -hmm. Where was that discussion? Um. I don't know. Debbie did know because I told her I was interested in this particular um, pre-commitment review process. I did tell Deborah that. There would be no reason for her let to, to let me see the letter if she didn't know that. Obviously, you talked to her about it, and you all of a sudden, you're, you, know, you just kind of can't remember this part of a very important part of this whole story here. Well, you, you had a conversation with Deborah Gordine about this letter. I'd like to know about that conversation, so with the rest of the committee. I, Mr. Shays, I think I've testified that I didn't remember. I, I, I you didn't can't, remember, what, I you don't can't remember asking her for the letter? No, I don't. You don't remember asking no, her. But I how do not. you remember that Deborah Gordine then said you should have the letter? How could you testify? I, did not, I didn't testify you should have the letter. What did Deborah Gordine do? She made sure you had the letter. I don't understand the circumstances well, in which I said the But that's your testimony. My testimony is I don't remember how I got the letter. I do remember Nancy gave it to me. I do remember it was with Deborah's consent. I don't remember how it was done. I don't remember having it in my hands more than 15 minutes. Uh, it 15 wasn't minutes. By the way, 15 minutes is a long time. Uh, well, I just have to comment. It's not. It, were you in a, in a separate room? Where was this letter <coughs> given to you? I was sitting in the secretary's offices. Whose secretary's office? Secretary Samuel Pearson. Not his office, but in his office complex. Okay. So Deborah Gordine was there? Yes, she was. So she was there when you were given the letter? Yes. Okay. So the letter was given in front of Deborah Gordine. While you were there, Deborah Gordine watched you look at this letter. I don't know whether Deborah watched me, whether she remained there. I simply don't have the react. Why the were you up there then, up at the secretary's office? I was seeing Deborah on matters, and I'm not. It might have been on this matter. So did she I, call up Nancy Murray and say, "Please bring up the letter"? Not to my knowledge. Uh, did Nancy just happen to traipse up there? The letter was on its way out, Mr. Shays. Letter. Who had the letter? Did Deborah Gordine have it on her desk, and did she give you the letter? I don't remember. Wait, you don't remember if Deborah I, Gordine... No, no, I do remember this. I do remember that Nancy brought it in. I don't know whether she put well, it on important. Deborah's desk. You were meeting with Deborah Gordine. You told us that Deborah Gordine said you should have the letter, and now no. you're telling us that Nancy Murray brought up the letter into the office. And you're telling us you don't remember why, how this happened? Mr. Shays, what I testified to is I saw a draft of the letter. The draft of the letter was brought up by um, Nancy Murray. And it's your I said, I, don't testi I did not testify that Debbie, uh, Debbie knew it, Debbie was reading it. I simply don't remember. But I do know what I was interested in seeing, that, that there was a letter going out. That was all I wanted to know. Okay, how did you know that this letter came, when Nancy came up, did she say, um, I have the letter, Debbie, that you wanted to see? What, did do Debbie not. hand you the letter or did Nancy hand you the letter? Mr. Shays, I no, do not I, Let me just tell you why it's, it's important for you to remember, because we're going to ask these people to speak, and, and uh, maybe Deborah Gordine, and maybe you know something that I don't know. Uh, maybe she will or won't testify, but uh, we're certainly going to ask Nancy Murray to come, and I just hope that you are very clear on whether or not Deborah Dean asked her to come up to show you this letter. Mr. Shays, I've testified I am not clear how my discussions with it. I know, Deb, I know Nancy brought it up, and I know I saw it. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, just this last point. So you got the letter, and you read the letter in Deborah Gordine's office. Is this correct? That is correct, in the okay. secretary's office there, okay. the office and, suite. And, in the office suite. Did Deborah Gordine stay there while you were doing it? Do you have any discussion with her about the letter? I do not remember. Boy, that's amazing. <laughs> Characterize for me, um, if you if you would, Miss Murphy, uh, what the consequence of the issuance of this letter was for DRG. The consequences of DRG was allowed to continue underwriting without pre-commitment review. 
And what was the consequence for your client, I, for I, your law firm's client? I believe his deal closed within the next week or so. His deal closed within the next week or so. I now want to ask you about another letter. We are sending down a copy. This is a letter dated November 24, 1986. Uh, it's on the stationery of the office of the secretary, but this one is signed by Deborah Gordine. It's an eight-page letter. It is a highly technical letter. Uh, I would require legal assistance to fully comprehend all of its provisions. I obtained legal assistance to fully comprehend all of its provisions. Yeah. It's a very detailed letter. And I would characterize it, and I'd like to ask you to comment on my characterization, as a letter which allows Colonial House to work out a very serious financial situation. It is what the trade, I suspect, calls a workout letter of great complexity. Have you ever seen this letter? Yes, I have. When did you first see this letter? Um, I do not know. Um, I do well, know. the letter is dated November 24, 1986. Did you see this letter in draft form also? Um, I may have because I was with several of the attorneys that negotiated this with the HUD attorneys. Uh, did you have anything to do with the preparation of this letter? I was involved in negotiating these terms with HUD. So it would probably be fair to say that just as you offered comments on the other letter, you, you could have offered comments on this letter? Yes, that's fair to say. Is it reasonable to state that Ms. Dean, who to the best of my knowledge is not an attorney, could not have written this letter herself? That's correct. So Ms. Dean presumably dis received considerable legal advice in preparing this letter? I would assume so. And that advice had to come from attorneys within HUD or outside of HUD with highly specific knowledge of these complex issues. That's correct. You were an attorney who did have that kind of knowledge, is that correct? That is correct. And you could have helped in the preparation of this letter? Uh, I believe I and the other attorneys working on behalf of DRG in the workout did help in the preparation of the letter. This was a hot, hotly negotiated, very tough letter that was negotiated be the, between the uh, general counsel for finance. I believe Jenny May was involved, myself, and two or three other attorneys representing the client. Is it reasonable to assume that uh, your friendship with Ms. Dean allowed you to be an active partner in developing these extremely important public documents while functioning as a private attorney? No, I don't think that's a fair character. Well, why don't you modify it until um, it becomes fair? My, this, I remember sitting in a room in HUD with Thomas Demery, uh, Elliot Horowitz, I don't know whether somebody that Jenny May was there, uh, somebody from another law firm, Colton and Boykin, Alan Wynn, myself, several people from DRG, and I think several technical staff. Uh, I believe we made a presentation to um, HUD on how Colonial House could be, could be cured or helped to cure. Um, we made our presentation. They came back. There was a series of back and forth, back and forth, trying to do this so it was correct. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, Deborah was not involved in this at all. This was all done at Thomas Demery's level. All right, let me ask a question with respect to this letter. Why was the letter signed by Miss Dean, who clearly had no authority or responsibility, unless specifically delegated that responsibility by the secretary? This was a matter, this was a letter of great importance. It was the proposed workout for Colonial House Apartments, 
probably the single most disastrous underwriting project, um, costing the taxpayer vast amounts of money. Um, and the letter is signed by the executive assistant to the secretary, who has no legal background whatsoever, who obviously has very little substantive background. I mean, if I were to read out this letter, uh, it would be a, a nightmare of complexity with all the technical provisions, um, references to sections of the law in almost every paragraph. Uh, do you find it unusual that it is uh, uh, Miss Dean, who had no program responsibility whatsoever, no program responsibility whatsoever, who signs this letter? I don't know the delegation in the departments, but I'm surprised in looking at this letter. I would have thought it was signed by Mr. Demery, who was the chief negotiator on the terms of these letters. And uh, Mr. I would have expected either Mr. Demery to sign it or Secretary Pierce to sign it. Now, one of the suggestions I may have to solve who wrote this and how it came about Please. is to get the internal HUD correspondence, and they'll have the list of who wrote it, how many times it was redrafted on it. And that is available within the department. You find it intriguing, though, do you not, that what I've come to call the proposed workout for Colonial House Apartments, an extremely complex transaction with enormous financial and legal ramifications is signed by the executive assistant to the secretary and not the individual who has program responsibility for this, Mr. Demery, or the secretary himself. And this becomes even more peculiar and more bizarre and more puzzling because the original letter is signed by Secretary Pierce putting them on pre-clearance. What is your comment, uh, if I may, Ms. Murphy? Um, is your question, do I find it um, curious that Deborah de Gordine signed this letter versus yes. Thomas Demery? Yes. Um, I would have to assume, Mr. Lantos, that the reason Deborah signed it is Mr. Demery bucked it upstairs and the secretary was unavailable. That's all I can, because I know our negotiations were always with Mr. Demery. He was quite, he knew the project. He, his attorneys worked very diligently with us to pound out this very complex transaction. And I have to assume for some reason he insisted it went upstairs. Your surmise is that Mr. Demery, the program official, found it so important and so complex that he did not wish to take responsibility for signing it? No, I didn't say that. Well, I, you asked me why Deborah would be signing it and yes. not the Assistant Secretary for Housing, and I surmised the reason was is that Mr. Demery bucked it upstairs. Will you repeat that surmise? Why do you think it was bucked upstairs? I have no idea. Well, you had a surmise a minute ago. Well, I, I really don't have an idea. I mean, I could guess that he felt it should go to the Secretary. I don't know what Mr. But Demery if I were to surmise that it is so complex and so important that Mr. Demery chose not to take responsibility for signing it, would you agree with that? I don't know why Mr. Demery did not sign it. I don't it. either. I am merely surmising, and I'm asking you whether what I'm hypothesizing makes any sense. Neither you know nor I know what Mr. Demery had in mind. So let's stipulate that. Therefore, we need to hypothesize as to why he, as the responsible program officer, didn't sign it. All right. And I tell you what my hypothesis is. My hypothesis is that it was a very complex, very important, very serious decision, and he chose not to put his name to it. He bucked it upstairs. I can agree with your, your I can agree with that. You can agree with that. That's correct. Now, having this very complex and difficult and uh, legally, legally complex document that only individuals with intimate knowledge of laws and regulations could understand, why is this letter signed by Deborah Gordine? 
who clearly had none of this knowledge. And why not the secretary? Does that puzzle you? Yes, it does. Would you care to hypothesize why she signed I, it? I would hypothesize that the secretary was not there. Well, the secretary was not there maybe that afternoon, but he was probably there the following afternoon. This involved a multi, multi-million dollar potential loss to the American taxpayer. I mean, the letter could have waited a week, couldn't it have? Certainly, this was not... I mean, maybe the secretary was on one of his Soviet trips. and We could have waited until he returned, and then he could have signed it and reviewed it as an attorney. Well, let me move on to something else. Uh, Mr. Chairman, before we Please. move on. Is that all right? Please. On the letter of November 24th, uh, I want to know if you wrote any parts of that letter. Mr. Shays, what I stated to Mr. Lantos was this was a, a combined effort of the HUD attorneys and the attorneys representing okay, DRG. I'm going to ask the question again because I heard that. I want to know if you wrote any parts of this letter. I, in our submissions, meaning my clients to the department, I probably did edit some of their submissions to the department. So you, if those submissions were picked up and put in this letter, yes, then I did. No, you ask like if, like you don't know if they were put in. Were any parts of your submission put in this letter? The submission from my client was not my submission. It was a combination of attorneys. I'm going to start over again. It. Did you write any part of this letter? I cannot answer it in, your, in that simple statement. Did you so write any paragraphs of this letter? I wrote paragraphs and letters that went in from my client yeah. to the department. And so some of these paragraphs in this letter would may be or may not. Well, do you know or don't you no, know? I don't know. Why wouldn't you know? Because I don't have the letter I writ wrote into the department or the, the, my client wrote in, would and you, I would, don't have the Would you draft. give us a copy of that letter that you drafted? Oh, there is a letter that you submitted. I'd like to see a copy of that letter. I, I want to correct the record because I'm being very precise here. I did not say I submitted a letter. Mr. Shays, I said my client submitted a proposal. Did you I, help your client? In representing my did, client, did, probably had a good part of input into my client's proposal. We're getting into semantics here. Whether it was your client or whether it was you, you were representing your client for the sake of it. You're in. The, you're you're doing the job for your client. I don't care if your client did it or you did it. You submitted it. Were any parts of the letter? Uh, this letter. Were any parts of it parts of that you had submitted? Okay, I, Mr. Shays, I will state this. You know, I, I, I haven't lost my patience. I don't think, uh, in about 12 hearings, but it seems to me that we're getting into a little game. The answers are very simple. All you have to say to me is, we have a letter. My client has a letter or has a position in helping my client with his position. Whether it was my client who did the words or whether I did, we submitted something and I want to know if any of those uh, submissions, and that's very curious that that process even exists that way, are in this letter. I would have to go to the, my client's submission and look at it next to this. Okay, are you aware that, uh, that would I, would you, without being able to pick out the paragraphs, are there parts here that you feel no, fairly I, comfortable with? No. Or would you feel fairly comfortable in saying that basically none is in this letter? No, I, I just can't answer you without looking at what, what my client submitted at the time. Well, you know what I think we should do? I think what we should do is get you back when you can answer it. And I really hope that happens, Mr. Chairman, because I think you are not, I think you're being very evasive. And Mr. I haven't said that to anyone else. Mr. Shays, what I will do, what I can do, is go back through my files and pick up what we submitted as a proposal here. I'm not trying to be evasive. I'm trying to answer you correctly. That will be fine. That uh, will be fine. Mr. Chairman? Please. Um, it, but it would save us time, too, so we don't have to get you back for you to be as candid as you can. Uh, in a, a letter to, um, uh, from DRG, uh, dated uh, to Miss Deborah Gordine, August 4th, DRG stationary, did you have any uh, involvement in this letter? I'd have to see it, Mr. Shanks. Okay. I'm happy to give it to her. Could you just state the date again on that letter, please? That is a letter dated August 4th, 1986. Right. I, it would be hard for me to imagine your client doing something to Deborah Gordine without consulting you, but is that the way things work? No, I, that is not the way. Um, August 4th, I don't think I was even in town at this time. Um, I don't recognize this letter into Debbie. 
Um, I'd have to go check my files. This looks to me like this is probably a letter I really don't think, uh, I may have done some of the part on the issuance of sale of bonds, but there were two attorneys working on this, myself and Alan Wynn, and frankly, I, I simply don't recognize this letter as, as my work product, um, or whether I can't tell from it whether I even commented on it. And, no. would my, and you had a second question, would my client do something without my knowledge? Yes, they would, and they often do. Okay. Um, I'd like that back, uh, and I'll pursue not some questions today, but I have a feeling you'll be back here. Um, Deborah Gordine wrote a letter. If Mr. Sherman, if it's Please. right, so we don't. Deborah Gordine signed a letter she had no business signing at all of November 24th. She had no standing. She had no right to sign the letter. That's uh, a letter which uh, you may or may not have had a part in writing, along with some others. Uh, because this letter was so inappropriate, and because she had no standing, Tom Demery had to write another letter to DRG dated on December 11th, uh, uh, giving the workout agreement. Can you explain why you had this letter? Why was this letter necessary? Why was this workout agreement necessary? May I see it? Yeah. Do you not know about this? Uh, I'm happy it, to show it to you, yes, but, I, I, but I, know, I just want to know for the record if you're aware of I don't know what it is. You haven't adequately described it for okay. me to make a judgment. It's regarding Colonial House Apartments, Houston, Texas, the project, and it's assigned uh, uh, it's a letter to the president of DRG, and it's from Tom Demery, and it has the, um, the workout agreement. I'm delighted to give this to you, but I want to know as your attorney whether you got this. It ha it's all, it's the workout agreement. Okay. Are um, you aware of this letter? Yes, I am. Okay. Why was this letter necessary? Because this document put through the terms of the workout, now you need to embody it in agreement and language. That's standard in a workout scenario. You do work out the terms, you're going to have a 10% interest rate, and you're going to recast a second position mortgage, and then you enter an agreement embodying those terms you worked it out. That was prepared, I am 100% sure, by the general counsel to the FHA. Now, isn't, it, isn't it also being sent to DRG because this letter basically had no standing whatsoever, and they needed to make sure that DRG had a, a letter that had some substance to it? No, Mr. Mr. Shays, that letter embodied this agreement. That was the uh, codification, so to speak, of the agreement. Mm -hmm. That would be a normal procedure in any workout. You would go work out your terms, and then the HUD attorneys would prepare the documents embodying <coughs> those terms. So you're basically saying there's no difference in substance between these two letters? Is that your testimony before us? I haven't seen the second letter. You have shown it to me. Let me. I'm happy to show it to you, but see, the thing is we're playing a game again because this is the most significant document. You represent DRG, and it's the most significant document, and it's very convenient for you to say I haven't seen the letter, but basically this is a very important document that defies logic that you haven't seen it. No, I didn't. I said I would like to see it so I can be sure. I can't see what's okay. on it. I mean, you're not surprised to see that letter. No, this would be a normal procedure. It was a normal procedure. It was the very guts of what DRG needed to do, correct? It, it was, I assume, without reading it through, this is the embod embodiment of this. Now, I don't remember, and I wait, may Wait not a second, please. I need to just ask you, are you saying you have not read that letter? You have not read the workout agreement? I'm saying I read this letter and the workout agreement, but to the so best... So you have read the letter, the workout agreement? Yes. And so you would not need to even read it now to know if when you got this letter in this last document I gave you, whether it was consistent with the document that Deborah Gordine um, gave us. Not to switch hats, but I wasn't the attorney primarily responsible for the, embody the, the documentation that was being produced at this time. Was, that was, that was okay. a firm called Colton and Boinkin. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, I consulted, but I wasn't the chief... Uh, attorney that was responsible wait, wait, for this letter. I just need to understand the earlier letter, uh, the letter of November 4th, the one that Deborah Gord, the, the November 24th, the letter one, that Deborah Gordine signed. You had a role in, in working out with others, uh, so you were working on that, correct? You were involved in the Deborah Gordine letter to whatever extent remains to be determined, and someday we're going to find out. 
So you were involved in that. You were involved in negotiations of this letter. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. Okay. Are you now saying that the follow-up to this, the piece that Tom Demery sent, the workout agreement, you had nothing to do with? I'm saying at the time document production came, my review would have been to see if it was consistent with this letter. And that's what I'm asking you. Well, the point is... Was it consistent? I'm assuming it was if it was entered into. I don't know whether uh, we went back with comments on this document. Do you have a signed copy of this document? Okay. I, I just don't know. I think we had comments. Well, so you can tell me. And went back to HUD. No, See, it's, it's not like it's a little. I'm not handing you a little document and trying to test your memory. This, Mr. Is, Shays, this is the ball game right here. Mr. Shays, this is signed by DRG, so I correct. So obviously this was the document that embodied this agreement. The August letter. The, the DRG had sent. No, 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 it embodies the November 24th, 1986 mm -hmm. letter. And you said you had nothing to do with that letter that DRG sent. Is that correct? I said, I've said it several times. I know, but you know. I worked with my client on their submission. I and another law firm worked. The submission went in, in that letter you showed me. The submission went in to HUD. There were negotiations back and forth. Then this letter came out. And from my understanding, I'm surprised to see that it was Debbie's level. The only understanding now that I've seen the ingoing letter is the only reason I have a better surmise, Mr. Chairman, is that the letter was addressed into Debbie, so it came back out from Deborah. That was common practice. That is the, that would explain well, why. Well, no, the but it doesn't explain why it was sent to Deborah in the first place, unless they had someone like you who had a close relationship with Deborah Gordine, and that was the person to write. That's my summation. She's the one who actually gave you a letter to look at in her office. That's my summation. So, I mean, you know, clearly we have to get Deborah Gordine to answer some of these questions. But uh, I've got a lot of problems with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I have many more questions, but I'm happy to yield to my friend from Ohio. So I might I um, feel a little squeezed out here. I was kind of waiting for my turn, but with so many yielding, uh, many of the questions I had in front of my mind are gone. I, however, have a couple of questions on the basic same topic, but I'd like to try to understand it from the layman's standpoint. Three things. First of all, the letter to which my colleague referred time and time again was a letter that basically laid out the elements of an agreement. Is that correct? Um, are we discussing... Um, the the sorry, Deborah Mr. Gordine Lucas, letter? Are we discussing the letter in from um, my client into the Deborah The one signed Gordine? by Deborah Gordine is the, that was brought down. This letter. Yeah. This was the agreement that was no, worked out with Mr. Demery and Mr. Demery's attorneys and myself and no, other mm -hmm. attorneys. I'm trying to understand, is this usual procedure that you would first get together a bevy of lawyers and interested parties, including HUD, uh, usually at HUD, and work out the elements of an agreement? Is that usual procedure? That is usual. That is not unusual? That is not unusual. At times, I think I'm having an out-of-the-body uh, political experience here. I'm not sure. Now, what is extraordinary, apparently, is that the whole operation came about under uh, Ms. Dean rather than directly to the secretary because of the importance, the vast importance of this. Is that unusual from your experience at HUD and from your experience as a lawyer working with HUD matters? Um, that a special assistant or executive assistant to the secretary would have this much responsibility to do these things as opposed to taking it directly up to a Mr. Demery or Mr. Pierce? Um, this, I don't know why this letter went in back into De Deborah. Um, in my experience, the few times that I've gone up to the secretarial level, uh, it would be unusual for an, uh, an executive assistant to sign a letter. So I, it, this is unusual. That's what this, I'm getting at. And again, I can only surmise it's because the letter went into her and Mr. Demery wanted to let it go out from her. I do I'm, not know why. I'm happy to have your guesstimates and your surmises and your thoughts. I just That's really all I want to state. I'd like to get a general yes or general no as to whether or not this is an accepted procedure as we used to say in the military, SOP, Standard Operating Procedure. What bothers me about this whole series of hearings, most of all, is that there is apparently a total lack of SOP, or Standard Operating Procedures, in HUD, especially since the death or demise of fair share, and especially in MHR. Now, back to the letter writing phenomenon that we've encountered here. You're, you first encountered heat and I think legitimately from this committee, regarding your ability to read a letter or peruse it, if you like. And to me, 15 minutes, I must tell you, um, 
uh, I think is, even though it's a very technical letter, since you deal in that kind of thing every day, I, I would think that you more nearly read it in all, in all honesty than, you know, peruse it. 15 minutes a long time to have a letter or 10 minutes to grasp the body of it. But I'm trying to understand why you're in that position or anyone else would be in that position of being able to read that kind of official blockbuster, because to me that was a blockbuster letter. Now let me try to make it easy for you and be very fair to you. In the writing of that kind of letter, would that take 60 days or six months? Would it take a long time for all these people you mentioned time and time again to get together and finally have a final draft or nearly final draft ready for the Secretary's approval or signature? A letter of that length, in my experience, would take an awful long time to be put together. Could you frame it for me in time? I would say it would take, a, I would say, weeks. I'd have to look at the, um, you know, if you get the HUD internal documents, they'll show you the original time it was done and by the time it went out and signed. I understand that. I'm not trying to be unkind. And in fact, I'm trying to bend over backwards to be as fair as I can because, I think, you, you know, you, you've been pushed quite a bit today. And, probably with great justification. On the other hand, I'm trying to really understand a little bit of the process. I don't see why any attorney for any interested party would be able to see a letter of this great import. And it is, you know, an unusual letter. This is an un extraordinary circumstance. Uh, unless you had been so involved with HUD procedures when you were there, and you maintain an active liaison or interest in an activity with HUD officials on other various HUD matters as a HUD lawyer, particularly tax policy and F, uh, FHA attorney, et cetera. Had this happened to you before, had they given you other letters to read as a matter of courtesy or because of their respect for your uh, talent and experience, which is substantial, had this occurred?